shall they go? Tixie picks it up. There is Nox sent back their way, but only on to Matic. version 2.7 will be available soon. Let's take a look at all the new content. The long-awaited Dragon Ball Super collaboration is officially here. We'll be bringing you two new game modes for this collaboration. Dragon Ball Super themed mode and Battle Royale Dragon Ball Super. Dragon Ball Super themed mode will be available in Erangel, Livic, and Sandhawk. In this mode, we've incorporated Dragon Ball elements into the classic Battle Royale gameplay. All players will embark on a journey to find the Dragon Balls to summon Shenron. Collect the Dragon Balls scattered throughout the map. The team that gathers all seven will be able to summon Shenron at the Shenron Altar and make a wish to obtain powerful buffs. Maybe if you're super lucky, you'll get three wishes at once. During the journey of collecting the Dragon Balls, players will obtain a type of energy called Ki during the game. Players can use Ki to unleash famous Dragon Ball moves. Players can obtain the Kamehameha by picking it up. It equips to the pistol slot. After charging, it will release a continuous high damage beam. Fuku Jutsu is another skill that can be picked up during a match. Players can use this skill to fly freely in the air and make quick tactical maneuvers. The Senzu Bean is a new recovery item that is incredibly effective. The Dragon Radar can display the location of Dragon Balls that haven't already been claimed by other players. It can help you collect the Dragon Balls more quickly. The Air Car can carry up to three players. It's easy to put away and has better performance than regular vehicles. Tenkaichi Budokai, Kame House, Korin Tower, Dragon Ball Village. These are some famous landmarks that will appear in the game. Call your friends and explore with them now. The collaboration this time even has a hidden challenge named Dragon Ball Trial. Win consecutively in the themed mode for a chance to take on the challenge. After accepting the missions, the team has to follow the instructions and gather seven Dragon Balls. During the process, your team's location will be exposed to other players. All players will be drawn into battle for the Dragon Balls. To win the game, the trial team must successfully secure the Dragon Balls, defend the altar, and then summon Shenron. Are you ready for the challenge? In this standalone mode, named Battle Royale Dragon Ball Super, players can roleplay as iconic Dragon Ball characters, use powerful, unique moves in a brand new anime-style map, and become the ultimate victor! There are five Dragon Ball characters in this mode. They are Son Goku, Vegeta, Ultimate Gohan, Piccolo, and Frieza. Select your favorite fighter, master their skills to suppress your enemies, and achieve victory in intense battles. In the new version, the new Ace-32 firearm will be made available on all maps. It uses 7.62mm ammo and has six attachment slots. What are you waiting for? Go try it out now. Furthermore, this update also includes a firearm attribute tag display. Newer players can go to their backpack to look at the tags of a firearm they've picked up to quickly grasp its characteristics. The new Cycle 5 Season 13 begins on July 18th. Be sure to stay tuned for the new season rewards. That's a wrap for the main new content of the upcoming version. For more information, be sure to follow our official PUBG Mobile community. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. See you next time. What's up, gamers? Welcome to the PUBG Regional Clash, PUBG Mobile Regional Clash. It's Europe versus Africa. My name is Sam, also known as Tech. Well, it's been a while since I've jumped into the PUBG Mobile, uh, but I'm back, I'm here, and I'm ready to get educated by our two experts, Maxman and Crowns are joining me. Of course, we had to get one European expert, one African expert to come in and tell us what is up because this is going to be a heated battle. Max, hyped to be here. Are you excited to see Europe take the, the trophy? I mean, hey, trying to take the trophy. I'm definitely going to be hyping them up. But it's good to have you back, Sam, here for the good old regional clash of Africa versus Europe. And of course, I'm going to be the European specialist, the best region over here. And Crowns is here too, I guess. Yeah, Crowns is here. <laughs> <laughs> here for Africa, pushing Africa all the way. And I tell you, Max, the African teams are really here to take it home. I love how I came in here already trying to start beef by saying, are you excited to see Europe take it home? I wanted Max to come in and be like, of course I am, and Crowns to get angry. <laughs> but you're both so nice. You were so polite about it. Max man kind of threw it aside. Crowns, you're not like that, right? You know Africa's taking it home. 
Yeah, I know we've actually got what it takes. I mean, I looked at the team structure of the African teams. There's been a lot of changes in the rosters, and I'm pretty excited to see. And I'm, I'm pretty confident, actually, to say that they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the European team. Wait, we took your best team, actually. Uh, okay, Crowns, but okay, you're, you're, your winning team of Spring is now an EU <laughs> team. So I'm going to say your chances of winning are pretty, are pretty slim. They're that big. It's so small. So uh, well, not going to happen. <laughs> Only a couple of players from there, you know, but ultimately I, I'm gonna beat my chest and say, you know, it's not gonna affect us a little too much Okay, yeah, copium I, <laughs> Yeah, I, I like the way you're just you're just pretending that that's gonna be okay I mean, but this is what is kind of exciting crowns with all those roster changes Do we actually know what to expect? I mean this first day is gonna be an opportunity for us to just see a bunch of chaos and get a feel for some of these new lineups, right? Yeah, it actually does throw the analysis part off a little bit, given that, you know, what we saw in the spring is most likely what we're, what we're, what we're not going to see actually um, going into this, um, into this um, PMRC. I tell you what, if you've just joined us and you have no idea what's going on, we'll explain. We've got this cool video to do it. After a countless number of victories, the time has come. Two regions will finally meet in 2023 PUBG Mobile Regional Clash Europe versus Africa. The finest eight squads have shown that they will crush anything that stands in their way at home. And now it is time to determine what region has the bulk of gunpowder remaining. These titans will have four intense days to show their immense experience on the battleground. During each game day, teams will play six matches on four different maps to score as many points as possible. The teams will earn a share of the $20,000 prize pool based on their achievements in the tournament's overall standings. In comparison, the regional leaderboard will demonstrate the region's drive to win and claim superiority over the opposition. The race for points is about to begin. Pack your shoes and get ready for the clash. So much to talk about, so many teams that we have to discuss. We have to talk about that schedule as well and the maps that are coming in. But Crowns, uh, I'm going to toss you straight into it and, and ask mm -hmm. you, which is kind of a difficult one. I know you're the Africa experts, but if you had to guess what Max Man's going to say when I ask him the question, which European team is he keeping an eye out on? Who do you think he's going to say? <laughs> I feel like he's going to come for me and, you know, go for, uh, for, uh, for Titan Gaming. Right, I know that's one thing that he might just do. I would say he's gonna come for me for by saying Titan Gaming. No, Max. I'm, I mean, okay, there we go. He's not doing that, Max. Which is the European team that you're keeping your eye on? Oh, there's so many I want to pick right now. I don't like being on the spot, Sam. But if I really had to pick one, I would go with Gladiators, possibly. Of course, the team with the most international experience uh, and has been looking good recently. The main issue with this team is that they tend to have a little bit of a slow start. But when it comes to eliminations, more specifically, and you can see see it here on the point system, one elimination equal to one point. That is how they can really stand out the most in this event. But other teams like Major Pride, Mad Bulls are looking amazing. Nexus Gaming in the previous championship were looking absolutely top tier. There's been some pretty big roster changes though. Uh, I think the main SBG with the lack now of two of their main players, Akashi, the old IGL and Robs that went over to Titan. How is that going to pan out for them in this tournament? We don't really know. And now Titan, well crowns, as we said, a lot of the players, well a few of the players from previous Triple Esports that won Africa in spring have now gone over to Europe with new additions of Robs more specifically. And I'm really hyped to see how that is going to affect the entire lobby. Crowns, yeah. obviously when we jump onto the side of Africa, which is the team that you've got your eye on? Yeah, I'm, uh, people, people already know me to be the uh, Black Hand fanboy, but also I'm going to be keeping my eye for um, some of the other teams that we've got, especially Falcon White. Um, this is a team that we know they bring a whole lot of experience to the African scene, given how much um, they make it to some of the global events. So I'm really looking forward to seeing Falcon White and also the World of Ballers just out there. Oh, that yeah. is also another team I'm actually keeping my eye out for. <laughs> you know, I look at other teams too, like Rookie Sports, who actually had a cracker performance in yep. the PMPL um, Spring Split. And now with the addition of, you know, some extra players players on the roster i would really like to see what they've got to play actually for falcons white more specifically do not give six an mg3 okay <laughs> if you want to have a chance of winning any kind of game just don't give this man an mg3 or he's going to 1v3 clutch you to get that chicken dinner so you definitely have a lot of fragging potential on all of these squads but we know crowns that tend to be a little bit more passive so i want to see if that's going to be enough to go up against these eu teams mm -hmm. that are renowned to be aggressive or are we going to see a change of style to try and adapt 
to this PMRC lobby. Yeah, and that is something that I've always been keeping my, my mind on, right? Ever since I saw the PMRC, that this is actually going to be a battle for adaptation between all of these teams. Because, I mean, you have to get your playstyle ready for pretty much every single map on every single day. We've got the, the schedule up for you. And, of course, this is the surprise. Crowns, three wrangles. This is the change-up. Teams are going to have to get used to this. And a start on Sandhawk, that very aggressive map. How is this going to play out? Yeah, this is actually going to play out well because it kind of gives the African teams, especially, it doesn't give them that chance to relax and try to play a calm start of the day. So we're starting things all over in Sandhawk and we're going all banger into the game. And I keep saying it with this, you can only mess up one error and go. Did you say we could... Great word. But yeah, I mean, three Arangles going to be on board, but how is no one talking about Vikendi slowly but surely being brought back into the competitive pool of maps for PUBG Mobile Esport? I love it. It has not been played a lot recently, a little bit in NA, I believe, and other regions. So intrigued to see how teams are going to be adapting to this one. But Crowns, I think we were in agreement when we were talking about this during the rehearsal. We have three Arangles and only one Miramar. And now Miramar is just a side map, it seems. Arangle is truly going to be your bread and butter. Yeah, I tell you, everyone has to make it in Arangel. You cannot mess your Arangel up, especially given the fact that you're going up an against an entirely different region. You know, you're going to get into the first game, you might see a little bit of surprises, but getting into the second Arangel of the day, you have to make sure it counts. Our predictions as talents are going to be coming up on the screen right now. And the truth is, it is the start of four days of competition. So I'm not going to hold us to these ones. I did it because I felt a little bit bad. I feel bad when players get poached. So I felt like I needed to, to show my support. <laughs> I know everyone else has their, their own opinions on this, but I think we'll, we'll dive into our predictions after map number one and chat about it more. What I want to talk about is the four days of competition, Max, man, because this is going to be a marathon, not a sprint for a lot of these teams. Yeah, I mean, in the past, we saw, especially back in 20, 2021, 2022, a lot of these bigger events when you go outside of PMPL were three-day events. And I do tend to think three days is not enough to crown a champion that's maybe as worthy as you would initially expect for the caliber of those tournaments. But now having four days, 24 maps total, I feel like that's a way better portion size of maps to really have the best team stand out at the very end of those four days out of those 24 maps. So yeah. I'm super hyped for it. I think four days is just exactly what we need here for PMPL. MRC. Yeah, and it exactly, it also tests out the teams, right? Because it's not just four days. We're talking about four days of six games every single day. So you cannot get... themselves right because ultimately having just one player play the IGL role for six games yeah. could tend to be a lot so if you're able to play your your game style in with two different people as IGLs mm -hmm. that will work perfectly for you we see a lot We've of teams actually have subs so you can use the subs I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you there because we are going straight oh. into game blank Jackie let's jump straight into it Oh, well, here we are. I'm hearing all sorts of words thrown around, raging from marathon to sprint. I'm thinking this is going to be more of a fun run, as you've got me and Blank here to bring those feel-good vibes. How you doing, buddy? You ready for a, a big set of games? I'm ready for a big set of games here. 24 total. I'm going to refer back to the lad in my DMs earlier on saying, I have not said happy days in a while. Look, it Aww. is going to be happy days on this fun run here over in Sandhawk to start things off strong. You can see on your screen a couple of teams already dropping in. Gladiators up towards their usual spot of Northwest side alongside with Blackhand who have dropped over towards Hatton. Dangerous spot for them as Gladiators are used to dealing with that position on the map, Jackie. Oh, well, I'm excited for this one, mate. I, I think this will be a good test. Obviously, last time around when we both got to be uh, unified on the mic blank, we were delivered a handful of very explosive games. Now, a lot of that was down to my VP-related pandering. Of course, here, that physically can't happen. But I've already got my eyes on a few key names, organizations, and players that I think are going to be delivering really sort of diamond in the rough S gameplay over the next... Oh yeah, okay, so we're going to have a bit of like Jackie sauce thrown into the mixture, add into the recipe that's going to make something absolutely extraordinary happen during these games. We know it's going to happen because Jackie does bring the good luck to these teams, so if you're one of those... <laughs> One of those lucky teams will receive Jackie's blessing when he's back, because I believe he is having some technical difficulties at the moment, but we'll get him back to you as soon as possible. In the meantime, you'll have me. 
blank to give you the rundown of a lot of these teams. Now, there's a couple of faces that you might be recognising a couple of faces you might not be. Obviously, as a European cast, there's a couple of guys here that I can talk about. But obviously, African side, you do have Old Boy that's coming through as well as Icy moving over towards a European team of Titans looking very strong during these games. They've got a really good squad here and I'm looking to see what Robs can do. You know, previously SBG, previously Game Lord. You know, he's been on the rise for a long, long time, jumps into the team alongside with Havlik. I think Max is right to pick him as a prediction here because they're going to do really, really well. Right now, we've got Xenon on our screen versus Nexus. Now, Nexus are no strangers to a cow hot drop. They certainly know what to do with this one. They were absolutely cowed over in the PMWI versus this, but they've learned the lesson. They've learned from the mistakes. They're going to improve on this, see what they can get done. In the meantime, Xenon does move up. Kapahala watching the sidelines here. He's using that third-person perspective to his advantage. Exomacina. Moves forward, but will back off just a little bit. In the meantime, we do have our first circle on the screen, guys. Up towards that north side, whereas Zerich Zerich actually falls directly in the water and will drown. So an unfortunate start for the Mad Bulls. Lose Zerich off the bat. Really strong player on their side. Nexus, though, still holding on. Just waiting for this one to start popping off. We've got Koa here from 77k. Chilling around the sides. This is over towards Pinan. It will be versus Titans. As we know, this is the team we were talking about earlier. A very strong team. The one team that Max has got his eyes on. And Max has kind of moved away from that cursing ability of his. He's a bit more of a blesser these days. So I think Titans could have a strong position here. The only issue for them is that up towards that northeast side, Alpha team will be playing around that area. Which is just this lip that looks down towards Pinan. So even if you are a victor of this position, at the end of the day, you still have to figure out how to get away from this spot. So contesting Pinan early as two teams, you really do have to be confident in your ability to win out this fight. Because there are lots of teams around you. Even Zumwerte is getting stuck in on this one, down towards that southeast side. With Fury in the vehicle, coming up towards cave side at the moment. Falcons. Currently around Grand Camp Bravo, very much out of the action. So they can still move in, though, right on the edge of the circle at the moment towards Mong Knight. Rolling planes over towards that western edge, though. But you get quite a bit of information just hearing what's going on inside Paris as well at the end of the day. Effect, though, does start things off strong with a singular knock. It's over towards Major Pride side. I think they're over towards Paris Resort at the moment. Look at this. Two knocks already towards them. Black White now has to clutch it up, but just can't get it happen. And this is Gladiators. Coming over towards the western edge of the map. They've already crossed. Good stuff. It will be Black Hand getting back up on their feet. Tixie actually just getting involved there. Stealing away a lot of the eliminations over towards Black Hand between them and Major Pride. So Major Pride... Really feeling the hurt here. Still, just this standoff between Titans and 77k. Not much that can be done between these two teams. Rooker, Eugene here. Classic name, I love that one. Eugene just rocking into the lobby here. You know, he gets, gets business done. You know, he might have... A classical business name, but that just brings the business power to this lobby. He's been dropping those paychecks right into the bank, clocking in for that 9 till 5. And you know, when he's out of work, he's not a force to be reckoned with. But right now, this is work time, and Eugene's going to get it on. Nexus slowly making their way out of cow now. Xenon decided not to continue to harass them. Carefully looted up in the meantime. We're wondering about DMRs, whether they'd be a bit more of a fixture here. But over on Sandhawk, I do think still pulling out the DBS, which has been nerfed, guys. Has to be said. Still relatively decent of a choice. S12K even incorporated here for Octavian. Marshall from Xenon. Scouting out. This is the team up towards Tapmok right now. As Nexus did push them out. But again, this is a nice drop-off spot for them, actually, playing tap mock. A lot of angles that can be taken in this area, which is very, very useful to have. Alpha, 
be looking over towards Mad Balls as they make their desperate attempt to get in towards the circle. Remember, they lost Zerich early on, so losing another player now would be absolutely disastrous for them. So they can careen themselves past Paris Resort, find themselves into one of these rocky outcrops on the eastern side. Should be a little bit better for them. We've got the Triceratops buggy on the way to try and push through anything that comes between them and getting into the circle itself, impaling them on the horns. That's why they are the mad bulls at the end of the day. But greedy for kills, finds Fleeke, takes some shots, should have been an easy elimination. Nothing sticks, and Fleeke just simply rolls on out of there. Not a care in the world. No problem. Del Hap, still jumping up. But again, next circle, one of our biggest shifts here is zone two. But it will be pretty much direct sent over towards the season side. So I, I think, obviously, this is going to cause a little bit of commotion here for some of the players. Just in terms of trying to get in. But I think once most teams have found their ideal route in towards the circle, this is going to be a case of, you know, aimers, sprayers, being able to get that gun skill on board, fight those fights. Obviously, towards this western side and tap mark is a bit more environmentally challenging just with the way these paddy fields line up. Being able to get through there for Gladiators is going to be a bit of a struggle, but luckily no one else is ha holding them out. Xenon currently in tap mock will just be sitting pretty here. Obviously don't have the greatest of angles up towards that northwest side, but no biggie. I can still chill out. But for Gladiators, I think their main approach right now should be up towards that north side. Now, if you were listening to the desk, and I hope you were, there's some smart cookies over on that side. Loving life. And they were talking about how, you know, Gladiators, this could be the team to be watching out for. Yes, they're a bit of a slow starter, but if they do get that firecracker of a start, they just start rolling out of control. And like a snowball down the side of Everest, you quickly got a bit of an avalanche on your hands. So for Gladiators, this is the time to get a bit frosty, get a bit chilly. Let the enemy teams feel the freeze. As they slowly move up towards that north side, just hope that none of these other teams bring the magma and thaw them out of that. Nice little bit of momentum that they can find at the beginning of these matches. Hello, I'm here. Is it Max? It is me! I am Jackie 2.0. Not as good as the real deal, but here nonetheless. I'm going to have to deal with me. You know, you are worse than the real deal because I can hear you twice. <laughs> oh, no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Jackie 4.0 now, unfortunately for you, but uh, uh, I've no. Got, yeah. I've got an idea. How about I mute you on my end oh. and then you, you talk to me? Actually, wait, wait, wait. I got this. <laughs> Say something. Just Say something, bud. Let's go. I'm talking right now. This is I've tech support it. live. I've He's fixed the problem. I am guy. tech support. Brilliant. Beautiful <laughs> stuff. I'm going to let you take this one for a little bit. As I'm tired. <laughs> Hiya, you can drink some water, Blank. We deserve a break right there. But no interesting game. We have this circle happen quite a few times over in Sanok. And actually, in the green room, in the shadows, I was talking with Crowns. And he said that he was particularly interested to see what Greedy for Kill were going to do this game. How they were going to rotate. And Greedy for Kill rotate straight northwest of Paradise Res uh, from Paradise Resort itself. Really good position. Good overview to see teams coming in from the north or the western edge. So Greedy for Kill potentially have a good game up their sleeve if they play things correctly but other than that we know blank unfortunately paradise resort terrain all around it it's not easy to get in it's not easy to leave so teams are gonna have to be really smart as to how they approach it as gladiators start to get involved into cal where nexus gaming still are positioned which i'm not too sure about this play but they're doing it and that's, <laughs> that's all i can tell you right now that's all that you can tell us right now. And that's all that matters to me, Max. I'm glad that you're giving us a helping hand where you can. Straight down towards that south side, though. That is a bit of a nasty shift, especially for Gladiators to get themselves stuck in on the action towards Cow alongside with Nexus. They're going to have to clean up this fight and then make a quick and clean again rotation down towards that south side. Nade sent over the top from Gladiators. That's Meku. Sends one in. Gets a good amount of damage over towards Exo, but he will survive for now. Just stands there, menacingly, Max.
Oh dear. Okay, well, that's fine. I guess that I'm back on my own because Max was not live that whole time, so you will have heard me talking to no one but a ghost. But that's okay because I'm back. So hopefully save the day in a way that you might not quite comprehend, but you will soon because I'm here. I'm ready to go. I'm like all oh might on the case. But it is though off in the distance. Still taking some hairy fights here and there, but they do in fact confirm one onto Capahala, which is great news. Great news indeed. They can start to move their way down with three players now stuck in the blue for Nexus. Gladiators are in really good stead. And this is typically where we'd see Gladiators lose maybe one player. So it's a good thing that they, in fact, are able to hold on to all of them. But Meku making a dangerous play here. I don't like this. Get in the car. Get gone. You don't want to stick around here for too long. Kitsune, though, takes a big hit here from Marshall, who will stop him in the track, shows him the sheriff badge, and will put him in jail. Doesn't quite send him back to the lobby just yet, but he is down on the floor. Koa gets taken down as Icy. Lays a barrage over towards 77k, but it's all popping off now as many teams forced into the foray now. Dumwerte, just Corker. Still going strong on this western side. Blackhand also. Tempted to make their way in. Any team that already moved in towards that circle earlier on is super happy. Can see that in the distance, Matic actually able to get some shots back over towards Xenon. But not many players left from their side now. I agree. Though I am back. Normally for real. Jackie 2.0 is here to save the day, at least attempt to. I should be this Jackie 3.0. 2.0 didn't work out. Yeah. Go again. We had a few we had a few issues last time. We had to update it to the new version, but it's working nice. out. Okay. And I can tell you, unfortunately, one thing that's not working out is that Gladiator's rotation blank has been disastrous. Just uh, encountering team after team and losing player after player. Tixi also gonna be losing his life in the process. Yeah. So just Matic makes it across into Paradise Resort. And uh well, just gonna try and play the long game. Just trying to survive and get a few placement points, though. One team that was going for pivotal position was the side of Rook Esport. The fact that they just stayed to the western side this entire time, currently have a good little high ground position that's really hard to push. Rook Esport could be in for an absolute banger of a game one here, potentially even a win. Yeah, this is a really strong position to be. It's a classic spot like the Tangerine Dreams that is the baked bean. They're looking like they're on for a killer of a match here down towards that southwest side. But it is hard for Gladiators, right? Because they try and clear out that cow edge with Nexus being in the mix, but they forget to incorporate the fact that maybe there was a hot drop there and Xenon's down towards Tap Mock. Then you get that hard shift. It all goes wrong there forwards. Again, that western shift now on that circle does make life hard. For Blackhand, being able to recover earlier on is really good, Max. Now they've got a strong amount of players to move forward with. Head south, maybe pick up that position just outside Paris Resort. That's a good compound that currently no one has control over. Yeah, it's going to be a good opportunity to go for that compound. Blackhand could be the team to go for that spot. So Six sending himself away from Paradise. All of that mess, he wants to avoid it like the plague. So, of course, SBG just going to start to maybe look and lurk at the teams over to the east. You've got currently Falcons and also Clear Vision Esports. So those teams could be an issue. But I mentioned it while I was muted earlier, Blank, but... Alpha team spot also south of Paradise is so, so good because it doesn't matter who survives the fight in Paradise Resort itself. They're still going to have four players. They're going to have that little high ground position literally separated from the rest of the compound. And they can just yeah. nade it, shoot everyone that's going to try and leave the position. So even if Alpha team don't win this game, they're going to get a ton of eliminations. There's no way it's lower than double digits. Max, you're so right. I mean, that position is so good as well because you clear off a lot of the sight lines down towards that south side. You can fully focus on the mess that is occurring right on your screen currently as the nades come through from Clear Vision, attempting to take out the remainder of Falcons and clip the wings of this team. SBG off in the distance, losing a hefty amount of players themselves as Nexus managed to get back into the fray here. Currently rocking with a total of just two players. The fact of Octavian and Doran has got this far into the game is a miracle in itself, but that miracle is cut short. As the hands of the devil come back up and grab Nexus, pulling them down to the depths. Clear vision. Gets the player on his back. We'll make the Michael Bay play here. Try and carry him out of here. 
Oh, I like this play from Alpha Team too. They're keeping Reflex South, just scouting the rest of the circle. And this is good because you're going to need information to transition away. But you're going to have Black Hand over to the west. You're going to have to the east side, Clear Vision north. You're going to have a few single players potentially remaining. So they're going to be in the hot seat right now, Blank. They need to be able to just whittle down all the teams around them before making their very own rotation. You cannot show your back to these opposing teams. Though, SBG seeing the team, know this new roster of SBG finally changed over... What, two years and a half now, it feels, after having Game Lord. I'm really intrigued to see how this roster is going to work out. So far, they haven't really been involved in this game when it comes to playing aggressively, but they're going to get to that point. And so far, the fight versus G4K is going their way. Yeah, it's not bad at all. Falcons will lose their last player in the puncher. Will go down. Reflect, though, like you said, you identified this earlier, Max. It's such a strong position for him to hold. Narvalo dropping to the deck there is not good news for SBG. Right now, I'm glad the Reflect is currently on the main roster. This guy is a very strong fragger for their side. And a lot of times, they can trust him to play these types of positions, Max. Yeah, I thought Reflect actually was not going to be a part of the roster, and that would have been a massive loss. But I'm so, so happy he's still playing for the squad. Reflect is a play you want to keep on your side as much as possible, though. Snowix, one of the newest additions to the team here, trying to just maneuver his way through the madness of this compound. And with the DBS in hand, still nerfed, but still extremely strong if you get in that range. He actually takes so much damage from Delhap. And he's going to try and wrap up that fight, but oh. loses it to the hands of Snowix. And SBG make it out before how long as they need to push right into Alpha Team. That is the super DBS in action. Reflectors take some shots from the side. Immediately repositioning now. Now's on the top side, but quickly Reflect puts him down with the help of the DBS. This thing is absolutely... A winner weapon in the hands of the right player. Right now, Alpha still rocking with four players. One player is on the ground. Knocked at the moment, Max, but so many players start to get taken out. This is what we're talking about before with Rook Esports over towards that west side. Kind of cut off from the sightlines of Alpha. And they've done a fantastic job, Max, to hold out that position. The world of battle has been actually impressing me so much. The way they rotated to this position at the perfect time when Alpha team were not in that point of interest anymore was so, so pivotal. Or I like to, as I like to call them, TWOB. I just find it really funny to call them like that. But going oh, for the yeah. red, <laughs> the world of ballers also has crowns would call them. <laughs> and if they can control this ridge side, Alpha team is going to have a real tough time to make that move into the next phase. But it seems like they're moving back because they had to go for the res. And this is an opportunity you cannot give up, Alpha team. You need to keep claiming even more and more terrain. And from the move we're seeing from them right now, Blank, it seems like they are trying to close that gap between themselves and the world of battle. And if they can do so, they might be in a position to get full control of the eastern side and claim supremacy on this first game. But I do have to say, you can't see on the map right now, a sneaky team of Titan is <laughs> slowly sneaking into the circle south. And they have four players. They have all the resources in the world to win this game and steal it away. So you're going to have a few X factors in this finishing moment. Yeah, Titans have done fantastically well to move from Pinan. We talked about this earlier, you know, contesting Pinan with two teams, difficult news for them. Demuerto even coming up from that eastern side. So we not pay too much attention to them this game, but the fact they're able to get here with four players really speaks volumes for them. Now, Twob, oh, the world of battle, moving up <laughs> on this ridge side, looking to head over towards Alpha, but getting out the vehicle, they're a little... This is one of the worst terrains in all of Stanok, and the fact that it ends up right here south of Paradise Resort is absolutely awful for these teams. And oh boy, relentless on his push, just trying to shut down the entirety of the world of battle. And if he can do so, even more control is going to be provided to the Titans, the behemoth of this lobby. Mohammed does get rezzed up, but his teammate gets taken on down, and we're looking at the end of this team. The Blues and almost engulfs him, trying to rush his way forward. But it's nothing he can do. Alpha team claiming himself even more eliminations. Mandarin popping the hell off once more. As only four teams remain here on this battleground for game number one of PMRC Africa versus Europe. But Blackhand has been slowly but surely sweeping the edge onto the west. And we're still currently three players alive. If they get themselves those initial knocks, they could take themselves to win. But Alpha Esports on an absolute tear once again. And the double digits have been reached here, Blank.
Ah. Oh, I realized that blank apparently cannot be heard. So I'll have to take on over Hello. apparently. It's fine. We'll have to be good. But it's, but it's Jackie. Jackie 1.0 with Jackie 2.0. Well, 3.0 now. And Jackie, we had a great game to kick things off. But here the control is going the way of Rook Esport. It really is. It's like an exciting game of musical chairs inside and outside of the battlegrounds. I can hear you twice, Max, but I'll deal with it. I'll be able to make my brain piece <laughs> it all together because right now the plays will make up for any of the mistakes as the damage is going down. And this is looking like an intense clash that's about to occur. We could see a ridiculous play from Icy if he's able to cut his way through them so nicely. He's waiting for the timing, Max, and it's looking like the utility might kick that engagement Whoa. off a little bit earlier. Oh, Ram, it's such a great opening nade onto Koa. One of the top fraggers of Black Hand. The fact that you take him down specifically is so, so important, Jackie. There, Icy sne <laughs> sneaked his way around the corner. Unfortunately, it is not going to go any further than a top three. Still a great game from Titan. But here you go. The push happens. And the S12K is going to be the end of him. That's going to be it. And Rook Esport taking so much control that maybe Storm can bring it back. All right. Look at this position that Storm's been left in. Let's It'll be the about decisive decisions, man. He's got so much to do from this. That's the res coming on in, getting back on his feet, double up and play that numbers game. But the flank could be the all-important play. It looks like the angle's being watched, though, Max. They've got smart wits about them, but this man's got a DBS that's ready to pop off. Oh, the blue zone's coming in, too. Storm is going to be in there. I mean, Rook, you're going to be closer to the center. You need to go back to your position. Great oh. nade of the Storm. And that's it. Rook Esports to wrap up this game and secure themselves the first chicken dinner of PMRC Europe versus Africa. Oh, and what a big chicken dinner it's going to be. It looks more like a Christmas turkey with the way they pull that one off. That's a hell of a way to kick off what should hopefully be an explosive set of four days. Very intense game there, Max. Hell of an ending circle. I love what Rookie Sport were doing. They were not doing these overzealous, like overplayed moves. They were just waiting onto the southern western edge and just waiting to see every step what the circle was going to do. Where was it going to transition towards? And based on where the circle was going, they would just stay in their spot because at every pretty much opportunity, they were in the best position at those times. So good opportunities taken from Rook Esport playing the long game and securing their first win of the day. Great way to kick things off, getting the chicken dinner in, the points for the region and starting things off in a successful manner. Now it's just about continuing on from this trend and seeing just how far they can go in terms of running the distance. But a good start for the gauntlet, a good start for our first map. Now moving into the back-to-back -back affairs, it's going to be exciting. But let's get back on back to the desk and see just what the analysts and Max the Commentator hybrid analyst thought about that one. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere, it's Max Man. I'm pretty sure there's like a chant in there that PUBG Mobile fans can start using. But what an incredible game we just got to watch right off the bat, Sanhok. Crowns, I gotta give this to you, your African team's dominating there in the final fights, right? I tell you, to think that conservative play was actually going to work out in Sanhok, that is something I actually did not expect. But seeing the way the African teams have actually started on today, Max, you should be shaking. I am shaking a little bit, especially because Blackhound just obliterated Major Pride, one of the most aggressive teams from the European region. And the fact that they lost in the first, felt like two to three minutes of the game is so, so impressive. So we always have these questions as to how is Africa going to play outside of their region, but it seems like they've made these changes, are willing to be aggressive, and that's the minimum of what we needed from this region if they wanted yeah. to bring the heat here in PMRC. Yeah, and it's this not is just what's the... interesting. Uh, Kranz, off you go. I'm interrupting analysts and I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to say, it's not just um, in terms of like the aggression, right? You know, me and Max were pointing it out earlier. The rotations that he actually went on early on in the game, it's not something that would normally see of the African teams. And, you know, right now it actually did play out well for them in terms of Elims. But I mean, rookie sports playing conservative worked out for them to get the chicken. I do want to say it is a very specific scenario, though, because we do mm -hmm. not see circles end in the terrain around Paradise Resort that often. It is a really tough tough terrain to play and I would I can ask any team and they would say yeah we hated that game <laughs> because the circles are just so so rough to transition every single step of the way and if you don't have to transition which is what happened with Rook Esport right crowns you can just hold on to those little rock positions in the center and just obliterate teams that are rotating late that are lacking players because they've been fighting around Paradise Resort 
and you can just pick up the win because you've got the numbers to wrap it up. It did get close, but really playing the slow game for Rook Esport was exactly what they needed to secure this chicken dinner. Kranz, yep. I'm curious for, from your side, I mean, do you agree with Max in that sense so that the circle kind of fed into the conservative play maybe wouldn't have been as easy for the African teams to find themselves up in those top spots if it wasn't for where the circle was? Yeah, I actually do agree with that one because, I mean, it was all down to just playing with the terrain, right? Looking at the way Titan and um, Rookie Sport actually played it too, it actually worked out well for them because the whole trouble was up there on that northeastern side. Everyone was in paradise taking the fight. At the point, I was like, come on, guys, push up from the south. But, I mean, not pushing up from the south actually did work out well. So, that was actually quite nice um, from them and it was very, um, you know, zone-based. I do need to also like let everyone know, and, and Maxman, I'm gonna throw your your other analyst under the bus here. It turns out Crowns is a huge Storm fan because he was cheering in my ears the whole way through that final fight. He believed the 2v1 was gonna go down. Crowns, I mean, when you're impressed with that play, you are such a big fanboy. I loved how excited you got. Yeah, I was actually chanting, let's go Storm, 1v2 Storm. But ultimately, I mentioned this. I saw that rookie sports make that change in the roster and having default on that team, like I know that's a very strong mechanical player and him still being alive at that point, I began to, you know, doubt, you know, the possibility of that. But that nade from Rami, oof, broke my heart. I was a bit surprised when we actually saw him not willing to push anymore the players of rookie sport. I feel like if he held that angle, with especially a DBS, where it was an S12K. S12 he, he had a shotgun, which is a really good clutch weapon to have. And he was just trying to hold the angle. I feel like if he doesn't go back to the north side of, of that rock, I think he wins it. If he gets that opening knock, it's down to a 1v1 and he can clutch it out. But the fact that he took so long enabled not only the res to come through, allowed the first aid to come through, and then it's just Nade City to just wrap up the game. So it was a bit unfortunate, but I understand that also in those situations, you are under pressure. So mistakes do tend to arise. Max, were you, could, were you surprised towards the end game that so many teams were coming in with zero kills? Um, like it, it happened towards the end there where you sort of started seeing that a lot of the teams hadn't really even popped off once. They hadn't even tried to take a shot. A shot. Were you surprised when you were casting that, that that was the case? Or kind of expected based on the circle? Kind of expected because that terrain is horrible, <laughs> ready stated. So when you have bad terrain over on Sanok, you're just going to snake your way and just try and avoid these engagements as much as possible. I mean, a lot of the eliminations came from teams that were fighting in Paradise Resort. And because of that, all the eliminations are fed to the Northern teams, teams that enter from the West, from the East and the South, like Titan, were not elimination heavy. Their game plan was to make into the late game. And if they still have four players alive, maybe overwhelm the remaining teams and win that way. Though, talking about eliminations, and this is a question for you, Crowns, because I was nerding hard about that during that mm -hmm. game. Alpha team's position south of Paradise Resort was so, so good to get a ton of eliminations. What was it? 10-11 at the end of that match. Alpha team play that game textbook when you are in such a good position. Yeah, and I really enjoyed the fact that they understood that the one thing you don't want to do is get into paradise, right? Staying outside in the uh, staying in the outskirts, lurking around, getting yourselves one or two pickups here and there did play out well for them. Ultimately, they fell down to that uh, distraction that came through from um, Titan Gaming in the side of Old Boy, but still, it was still a good game coming through from them. Six games will be played tonight. One has been played. Sandhawk is now out of the way. We're moving on to three airing goals in a little bit. But first, we're going to give you a quick break so you can recover from all that action. We'll see you after this. Kennedy's made his way to the 2023 PUBG Mobile Regional Clash of Europe versus Africa. This is a compound heavy map where DMRs will be more useful than ever uh, to whittle down those opponents' utility in the endgame before making those dangerous crashes as the blue eventually closes in. Indeed, Blank, and there are so many things to look forward to heading into the Kendi, of course, the rough terrain, but more specifically, the G36C, one of my favorite weapons in all of PUBG Mobile, so I'm really hyped to see how the players are going to work their way around that weapon. But with that said, let's take a closer look at how these teams are going to tackle this new addition to PMRC. 
Mavatra is one of our hot drops today that me and Max are covering. It's a great position on the map, obviously not the best in terms of central position, but in terms of edge play, which is very prevalent here on Vikendi, it's quite decent for use. Lots of packed loot in this location as well, with nice rotational paths down towards that south side, which keeps you undercover underneath Winery itself up towards Cantra. So playing on the edge, Mavatra is basically your best friend. Another drop I'm going to be looking at here this time around is going to be Goroka, a little bit more central on the map of Akendi this time around. And the spot currently of Titan, so definitely not one you want to hot drop heading into PMRC. I would not recommend that to happen. But good also for many other reasons. One of those is just north of the city. You have that little bit of hilltop, which is really good for scouting purposes. And just if teams want to breach it, you're going to have that information really, really early. It's good when it comes to loot and also car spawns. But the reason blank why it's so good it's right next to Mount Kresnik, the best position in the map. One of the best reasons for you to rotate there, of course, is because it's elevated, it's got some good defensive positions, and it gives you so much information throughout your scouting period of time in the map, so you can make the best uh, play based on that information you gathered. So if you do Goroka, instantly loot up, go to Mount Kresnik, you're in for a good time here on the Kenzie. Tune in next time to learn more about the chillest map around. Welcome back to the PUBG Mobile Regional Clash. Africa up against Europe and Africa looking like the stronger team after game number one. But there are six games that they have to play tonight. So it is still an open season for all of these teams. And we are now moving to Erangel. So Max, man, tell me, how is that going down? So, I mean, for... for... I don't know. <laughs> it's, I'm, a, I'm just a little bit heartbroken, you know, after the start of that one for the EU teams, but we'll, we'll see. I'm sure the EU teams can try and catch things up a little bit, though going into Wrangle more specifically is going to be very, very interesting because, and we mentioned this many times during uh, PMWI and PMRC back in Riyadh for, for Gamers 8, is that we're going to have now three Wrangles back to back to back, right? And the most important factor here to take into account is that because you have those three maps in a row, 
you can make those adaptations, those changes if you had maybe a little bit of a rough start. But though a team that didn't have a rough start here is going to be Rookie Sport and uh, Black Hand, clearly crowns. I have to give it to you that Africa is bringing the heat. Uh, but um I don't expect that to continue on Arangle. <laughs> <laughs> well, Arangle is where we're going to test out everybody. And I feel like the African teams have actually gotten the memo as to how they want to start up in this tournament. Seeing that we have about what, five of them on that first page, is, uh, it's, it's giving me, you know, it's giving me flowers. Let's put it that way. <laughs> how does this, I mean, but, but Kranz, they, I'm going to be, I'm going to be naughty now, but this is mm. the way I like to do it. It kind of worked in their favor, you know, mm. in terms of where the circle was, it fed into the African play. Things could be very different here uh, on Arangel. And, and do you think that the, the African teams can keep that dominance up? Yeah, and I feel like um, because of what happened in that Sandhawk, I kind of feel like the African play style might actually work against the European teams, right? And we will be seeing that now coming in this next game. Because in that first game, we saw the African teams play based on position, right? Rookie Sports stayed with their position, decided not to leave there they got the blessing of the zone, right? I'm looking forward to seeing that coming through in Erangel. And if they're able to play their positions quite well, we might just be seeing double Africa. Maybe, maybe not, because if our predictions come up right now, I can't tell you that two out of three of us are thinking it's going the European way. I am a full believer in Alpha Team, uh, but no one cares why, so I, I won't get into that because I'm just the host. But Max, now why do you think that Alpha Team is the team to keep an eye out on for this next game? We already broke it down a little bit on the previous desk uh, segment, but pretty much them sending it so, so early south of, Paradise Resort, pa south of Paradise Resort was such a pivotal play for them to not only make it and reach the late game, is also to just stack eliminations really really quickly they got double digits really quickly and because of that how quickly they sent it to such a game winning position so early on i feel it was really important so if we can see that same approach uh, and playstyle arriving on a wrangle which is we said the bread and butter of pmrc you got three of those maps today i feel like that kind of consistency and momentum can be built throughout today yeah, and um, that's something that I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing them do again in San, oh, sorry, in Erangel, because we did see that these teams, what they're doing is they know potential odd drops, and they're just heading it there early, so they can just try to see if they can get some, you know, scrappy elims from there. And I look forward to seeing them doing that here in Erangel, because there will be a lot of hot drops. A lot of hot drops. That's what Kranz is predicting. Not only that he thinks Black Hand could be the one to win it, but also that you can expect a lot of hot drops. It's going to get really exciting as we move into game number two. I can't believe we have six games every single day for four days. There is going to be so much PUBG Mobile going down and you get to enjoy it all. We are getting ready. Blank and Jackie are standing by to take us into game. Uh, I'm getting hyped about it. And of course, Kranz, before we go into game, I'd love to hear from you because I actually didn't get a chance to ask you this. Why are you backing Black Hand for this one? Um, as you as you clearly saw from the last game, I'm a huge fanboy for Black Hand, and then ultimately I'm currently looking at um the Erangel performance, and I'm like, normally I know Black Hand would be able to do well on Erangel, but I, I would say my prediction is more of a challenge to Black Hand, especially given the fact that they might have to change their drop spots. Right? We know them to normally land in Yasnaya, but now that we have SPG there in Yasnaya, it might just be a little bit of a problem. Yeah. Yes, now Poliana is big enough where it could host two teams. I don't feel like SBG and Black Hang are going to fight. One team's going to go to the east, one team is going to go to the west side. Because of that, you can still drop there, just don't overstep your welcome. Hey, I think we're here. Blank, we're back. Both of us have escaped the game of musical chairs. Congratulations, we can share a chair together for our first, well, second outing into the battleground. How you doing, homie? You ready? Yeah, first out and together, I say. That's, yeah. that's the main thing. That's the main thing. I mean, you, you were you were like the lost city of Alexandria, but we found you. We've got you back in here, Jackie. We're good to go. Obviously, over towards Arangul, we've got the boys heading straight up the middle of the map. Obviously, that Sandhawk was very African team orientated. There was some really good stuff there. I think, Rook, you know, at the end of the day, they have that winning compound. But as Max said, right... You know, you take that winning compound, you don't have to flex out too much. So I think it's a, it's a case of like making that strong decision of whether to hold or fight. And, and they held, they held, but they did well. They did well. I'm, I'm proud of them.
No, they did indeed. It was a great way to ease us into the flow of things here. And you're right blank. You know, if this is like a Lost City type vibe, I'm good to be back. Because me and you together, oh, we come across like the Sun King Ra. We really light things up. We absorb all of that heat into the golden tip and then illuminate the entire place. So let's kick this off, see how things are going to go down here. As I'm hopefully thinking, things should just get better and better over the course of the day blank. You know, the return to online competition, see everyone's going to ease into it. And what level of confidence they're going to have in terms of some of the playmaking i mean they're going to need to have some serious confidence here jackie because we're heading straight down towards osnovka this is a big shift a big change of pace for a lot of these squads heading down towards osnovka not always the easiest thing in the world but i think with this particular circle it's very much guaranteed to be a osnovka finish with the way the playing path was going straight up the middle there's gonna be a lot of teams over towards the eastern side a lot of teams that can head up towards that west side so both of the bridges could be fairly contested earlier on Thing is, though, a lot of those major cities, those points of interest that people want to get into the thick of early on, are kind of situated over towards that eastern side of the map at the beginning. We've got Milter, we've got Farm, we've got Yellows to spread around with. Uh, we've got teams actually flexing over towards Shelter 2 with Alpha on that side. So we will have a bit of a cluster heading down towards that south side, and it will be on Demuerte, Jackie, to try and hold them out. Or they can opt for a different plan entirely and head further into Sosnovka. Oh, Dimuerte. Always exciting to see some of the things that they can pull out, of course. Diana, the artist formerly known as Milky Way, one of my favorite constellations in space. Well, actually, I think technically, uh, what is the Milky Way blank in terms of, of space? You're quite familiar with space. I believe you spent a lot of time looking into all sorts of different varieties, constellations, didn't you? Obviously, you know, like, I'm a big fan of the Big Dipper, the legendary oh. pan in the sky, which Bleak has already found himself one on his backside at the moment, keeping him nice and safe. It's what's required a lot of times here, Jackie. When those bullets come a plinging, you better get that pan ready to start getting those bullets off your side because they will sting at the end of the day. So make sure that happens. Bleak already, though, with the UMP, taking some pot shots over towards Mohammed. Not very nice of him. Does tickle him a little bit, but we'll get back into cover fairly quickly instigating a bit of a firefight and establishing some chip damage but fairly nice in terms of the positioning here from mad balls with how much spacing they have the groupings looking good feels like they could build off the back of this and zachary well he's found another man quicker than reverse image search on that one to contact here and this is where it could start to kick off Nice and aid. This actually can be very decent over towards the world of battle. Does connect. We'll drop a couple of shots that way, but won't find anything much more. But instantly switches over towards Hazem. Falcons. They do take out one, but what a shot from Corker. Plings both of them out of the vehicle. The eject seats in play, but not enough to keep them safe. Corker. Can't see that. <laughs> <laughs> Living up to his name, of course. Always an absolute blinder blank. That's what he does best. Cork is always a fun word to say as well, isn't it? Reminds it is, me quite yeah. a lot of conkers. Oh, May I love conkers. <laughs> The great schoolyard game, Lang. Oh, but this is not about schooling. Seems like there will be some lessons being taught here, though, as again, another fight kicks off. For Muhammad, it's the backline shot that will take him down. So not looking great for the world of battle here in the second outing as they've been removed from the equation quite quickly. Yeah, their Conker was two years old. It was frail. It was weak. Mad Bulls coming in with a five-year-old aged Conker. Too oh. strong for them. It cracked them, and they broke apart. In the meantime, we got greedy for kills on this top side. Up against Titans, in fact. And it will be Rob's going down first if he can hit it. But he's actually hitting the cheeky movements on the floor. Going for the 360 spin. Finally gets it done, though. Rob's the robber, a man that could definitely deliver at times, but in a situation like this, you just got to let it go on by. Old boy, though, on your screens now. Fan favorite, of course, on the side of Titan. Excited to see sort of what level of lethality he's going to be bringing out over the course of the next four days, Blank. Oh, it's so unfortunate as well, because, you know, back in the day, playing on Virtus Pro, this is the lad that was always left solo, and he would clutch things up, get to a high ranking as well. Uh, and it looks like, despite being surrounded by very strong players on this team, as we said before, you know, Titans on paper, absolute banger of a lineup. Mm. But old boy, once again, all in his lonesome. And I think he's feeling some nostalgia, and not in the good way. Probably not. Back in EU, let's see what he can do. At this point, probably more so just about trying to snake it out, survive, and waste a bit of time. 
and then we'll tune back in to see what he can develop over the course of this one. Maybe a little bit of gameplay towards the end blank. You never know. I feel like he's always good for a late circle finish to cause a bit of carnage. Yeah, as I said, I mean, this guy actually was the inventor of the level five armor. It's called the wall. The way he played around those things was impeccable. So I think if there's anything I want to see is level five armor, the wall come through from old boy. And one of these matches today, at least like his peaks were legendary back in the thick of it in PMPL Europe. Nexus over towards Miltapau, a very regular spot for this team, even way back when, when we saw Octavian and Kapahala over on Eastern Stars, this was their drop spot of choice, and nothing has changed since then, so they're very familiar with this one, and they should be familiar with getting down towards Soznovka as well, down towards that south side of Mini Milta, there should be some boats that they can pick up if they haven't already been stolen away. To Buerte, though, we said before, they could move further into Soznovka, uh, Jackie, or... They could actually hold on the bridge. And they've been doing a fantastic job on that bridge side. Corker hitting some absolutely nasty shots, but they've allowed them to go loot in Nova. Giving a bit of space to breathe and reset yourself. Continue getting yourself into a better position over the course of this one. Obviously, early doors here in terms of our second outing so far. And an awful lot to build off in terms of the eye test blank. I think that's the fun thing. Having the triple threat of the back-to-back -back games, I, I think that'll set us up quite nicely, just as a bit of a benchmark in terms of the optics. How's everyone looking? Obviously, PUBG, on any given day, you never really know how it's going to go from the opening moments. Someone that does always deliver for me, though, to Luca. Last time I saw this guy, he really was able to pull out a few intense plays. At this point, it's all just about getting away, regroup with the rest of the roster on the rotation here, and get yourself back into a better position. Just playing off the blue, take a bit of a slower rotate on that one. Yeah, for Mad Bulls, man, like Tudica, really, really good player. A little bit out there at times, though, for them, and I think they'd love to be able to recall him, put him back in the Pokeball, but it's just not to be a lot of times. He just does not want to get back in with a thicker bit, join up with the squad, but he still does massive amount of work, and I think that's the main thing. Right now, Furia, though, what a spot for them from Demuerte. Right on top of the bridge side, can provide a huge amount of information gathering for them. Off into the distance, can see if anyone's swimming across. Doesn't quite spot out the guys from Major Pride who are making their swim from Sharkfin. And they will get across fairly easily. But again, it's, it's on a lot of these teams now to head up towards this side of the map. And this just made things a whole lot easier, Jackie. You know, having that tiny bit of land up towards the main island of Arangal gives these teams time. And time really is the major factor that they need to... Make sure they have getting in towards this final circle. Yeah, set yourself up ahead of time. Be actually able to put yourself into a position you want to play off rather than having to pick up the pieces and fend for yourselves. At this point, about moving closer and closer in, you can see everyone starting to collapse through, swimming their way through the ocean like the Great White. And I like the points you were making about Fury. I feel like at times this man's skill ceiling is on true display. Very supportive, but knows how to adapt when he needs to be the one to take charge. Here, bit of a scouting mission. Gets contact from a distance, relays the info back, knows it's not worth taking the engagement, but has so much more info to build off of here and actually wants to see what he can do with this. Just keeping an eye on the peak in terms of the circle closings. You've got that extra layer of info with Nexus on the move up towards where Falcons White are hanging out inside of the compound. Now this could cause a bit of chaos. Yeah, already not comes through over towards Puncher. So I'll have to back off just a little bit. They might just be able to find themselves a cheeky elimination on the get-go. Six here from Falcons. Strong player in his own right. Has pulled off some pretty legendary plays over in PMWI. We'll just have to get out of there. It is a solo now, so not much else to do in this situation. Now, I'd hope to see a few more DMRs being spotted. You know, I could kind of understand the shotgun meta over in Sandhawk. It is a very close quarters type of map, but here on our ankle, I want to see some more of those DMRs, man. You know, bring me the Mini 14, bring me the SKS. These things are all very, very useful. You know, I like the Pocus to spot in the M16. You know, tap fire or bring that into full burst when you get into close range combat with the PP Bison on side two. It's good stuff. But six, this is what I'm talking about, man. You can never leave him alone because he still gets work done. He's got an itchy trigger finger and he's able to engage and do a fair amount of damage on the knocks. He's got time to play with as well. Positioning, he can heal off. Not really any line of sight for the angle for them to continue battling towards him. But of course, the blue always going to be nipping at the heels, keeping him moving further forward. 
then this engagement will be relatively drawn out. Switching back over towards the barn with Nexus and Co as well. Obviously, you remember, they kicked this one off, came in with the clean first knock, looked like they had control of the situation. Since then, it's all been on six to play this weaving game. And he's got a bit of a good move on him. In terms of the timing for it, they're going for the rotate out as well. So he could backpedal his way through. Close quarters connection again being found as it seems like there may be a third party on the cards. It's so important for Mexo as well to get that knockout over towards Xenon as they come through. But Six delayed them massively, so much the fact that a lot of teams be able to get ahead of them, including SBG. And now Narvalo's just sending the grenades over the top. He knows exactly where to place them, where these positions are on this little coastal side where you can hide out. And I think for Nexus, this might be all but over for them as Exo tries to get a little bit more done, but he's nowhere near the rest of his team, Jackie. He's not. He's bobbing. He's weaving. But he's probably in a position where he's going to be panicking. Meanwhile, back on the POV of Furia. This is from a distance. He's getting stuck in wherever he can. I like the timing on the face from Marshall as well. Trying to take the wide swing off the audio cue. Barely missing the bite with the DBS. And now it's turning into Nade City. Everyone's got the frags pulled out. Pin pulled, ready to engage. And Exo, he's just trapped inside the shed. Tries to go for the bold maneuver, but he might be left for dead. Oh, it's looking rough, Blank. Doesn't quite find him. Marshall gives him a bunny hop and squishes him down to the ground. That is unfortunate there. I, I really felt like there was a big play coming out from Exo in that situation. But again, the big delay still comes through. Six is still going. Has found himself a first aid kit. This guy had had no meds at all for a long, long time. And he's able to quite finally squeak himself just a little bit of something to keep him still going. Obviously, he's going to try and expend as many of the bandages as possible first before he starts moving into that bit more high quality gear in terms of the first aid kit. Senke does go down on the top side as SBG still moving through. Narvalo off in the distance here with a nade. This could be big. It's such an easy toss as well. Oh, if you land a three pointer on that one, it could be absolutely atrocious. The level of lethality it would hit with. Marshall, low, but still kicking. Able to keep himself square for now. But this is really looking uncomfortable. You're looking at the quick rotate for six, trying to get away, spam towards the back, but near misses. No real Man. connection. I can't believe he's got out. There's no way he's lived through all of that, Jackie. It's crazy how he was able to just weave his way around and survive that for such an extended period. Meanwhile, back towards the bridge there. It seems like it is starting to kick off a little bit here. Smoke pulled down to provide a bit of cover. And there's the aggression on the marshal we were waiting for. Strike whilst the iron's hot and finally finish off Xenon. Now, in the midst of all this, Tamuete has done a fantastic job. They really laid claim to that bridge side. Uh, and you said correctly, you know, Fury, when he took his time to take those shots, it was so important because he was delaying anyone from getting too close to that bridge side. He never overextended, never, never tried to take those extended shots over towards the northern edge. Just wanted to make sure that anyone getting too close would suffer a casualty, which now allows Tamuete to hold a really strong portion of this northeast side, understanding the majority of that bridge is not going to be controlled by anyone. Now Valo and the rest of his squad and SBG, probably the biggest issue for them going forward, but they're going to get ticked out so hard by the blue coming in. Yeah, this is just getting worse. The longer the time ticks on by, the more damage you're feeling. Really just ringing you down, putting you on your last legs. But for Six, I'm surprised he's been able to create such a space between this awkward scenario. If he can barely survive this one, he'd be lucky. He tucks himself in, but it's too little, too late. Finished off from quite a distance. I ah, so sad. He had the amazing, awesome spin out almost into a perfect park as well. Gets out just on the wrong side of the vehicle and Diana will pick up that elimination to clear things out. Now to Muerte in a really strong spot. Gladiators did make a fantastic little rotate down on that south side, circumvented a lot of the issues over on that western bridge, but they've got further to go now as we head up towards that northeast. This is littered with a couple of compounds right here and there nothing too strong nothing too inescapable by any means but at the same time there's a huge amount of trees in this area nice rolling hills so it's going to be an interesting finish and teams will have to be very careful with the way they come in because the sound cue is going to be big oh boy though no. it's what we're talking about can he go for another oh this is madness blank the way that he's dancing around them 
Oh, he's pulling off the play. Molotov going to be bounced in through the window, though, to he's slow alone. him down. He commits to the hard heel on this one and wants to keep himself in it. How is old boy fighting his way through this? Thump up on the peak. That'll finally stop him in his tracks. But that's madness. That's greedy for kills. Almost being completely wiped up like a spilt drink. So I'm talking about that's the level five armor coming to play of the wall. You know, I was even talking about something completely different because I just thought that would be another day in the park for Gritty for Kills, taking out that elimination. But no, it was not meant to be. It's old boy really gives it back with a one two stinger coming their way it gets two knocks but not quite enough the fact that he just stuck the heel as well instantaneously this man knows pubg mobile oh yeah i love the initiative as well on the play right rather than waiting till someone checks someone comes in to clear it he just peeks off the back of the audio cue takes the initiative and the peeker's advantage with it and is able to almost make a hell of a clutch out of that one. But at the very least, it shows you why old boy will make you say, oh boy. He is. He is the, the great surpriser of PUBG Mobile. I'm going to have to shut up every time he's back on the screen again. Now, Valo racks up with his teammate here. In ours. We'll just be chilling with him over in this ditch now Navalo historically known as the survivor this guy is great in these end game circles really difficult to pin down a lot of times and this is a pretty decent position they picked up at the beginning but more of a scouting point to launch themselves further forward now Tomoite's fairly far back at the moment will be just chilling in the wings and they've lost their player already but seven eliminations accrued on this map it's already good enough right with eight teams remaining you know a strong top five finish is is on the card for De Muerte. Maybe a chicken dinner if they play their cards right. But again, getting up to words where clear vision are currently playing is that strong spot. They have to hold both sides, the east and the west, and that's the difficult part. So they'll have to regroup when necessary. That's the big thing for clear vision. What are they going to be looking for? We'll see if it's going to be 2020 vision the longer this one goes on. Well, how things will be looking when the dust settles. Right now, it's the smokes providing somewhat cover for SPG. Has they been able to get stuck in with the odd fight here and there? At this point, though, you're down to just one man that remains in a very uncomfortable scenario. Teams all around him effectively trapped in a bit of a rough triangle. Shots coming through. Follow-up smoke goes down to buy him time with the util, but you can see with the zone, there's an awful lot that's about to develop here in terms of the spacing. I mean, you call this a triangle in terms of the amount of teams looking his way, and he's practically in the Bermuda Triangle at this point. It is dastardly dangerous in this location. He's going to have to hold on for a little bit longer against these heavy waves and the storm that's brewing inside this small position at which he, in this case, is in the eye of the storm. Greedy for kills down towards that southwest side. We'll be hanging out just outside the air airstrip right now. Obviously, it's a little bit of a hill to climb in their case. They can still play this one out. Blackhand, do take a knock. And again, with this low ground they're playing around with, Gladiators is slowly working their way up to where Clear Vision is playing. They've got to understand there's a team on this side. And like we said earlier, the Gree group is in now for Clear Vision. They understood and identified the main force was on this west. Okay. Hocus Pocus with a little bit of magic. He splits them in two like a bad magician. But how much more can be done? As you can see, Clear Vision are on a bit of a mission to build this one back up. Hectic fights occurring across the battlefield at this point as well. Matic, even for GG, trying to take a couple of pot shots and delivering a fair amount of damage with a substantial tag from the bat line. And they've got a large area to control here. A lot of hill control, Blank. They've got good line of sights to work off of. And you can just see the bullets from all sides being spammed in. 77k again engaging as four brings the lightning, but he's hammered out immediately, taken down as he's on his knees. Now, this is a really important time for Grief for Kills. Either they move out from this compound on the south side, or they just continue to harass versus 77k. There is a potential that this circle moves down towards that south side, but I think you've already cleared out that south side of the airstrip. So pushing over towards 77k, taking them out early, then controlling the entirety of the south side is not a bad idea. Looks like we will see Hemo actually moving first over towards that position. Does flush out that target. 
In the meantime, we're watching Gladiators take down the remaining members of Black Hand. And it's good to see the Gladiators are actually incorporating that Mini-14 into their setup. You know, they were absolutely decimated mm -hmm. by vampires over in PMWI. And it looks like they said, you know what, if it works against us, why don't we just use it ourselves? And I'm glad to see it. I'm a big enjoyer of the DMRs and the fact that it's getting more love and more limelight is damn good for me. Ooh, I like the teasing that's going on here as well from yeah. Clear Vision, right? Just drive in, try and draw those crosshairs off of the angles they're supposed to be harnessed on. And actually, maybe a little bit more than they bargained for. Jumping out of the vehicle and looking to try and isolate the fight. Ooh, you could definitely cause a bit of a problem here. Spam back, that's large nice. tag. Oh, but Ooh. there's the bonnet blank. I did not see that one coming. He has to get quickly into cover. Luckily, the smoke already set up for him. He usually pulls the pin on a grenade. Now, if Matic hits this, there's a potential they get back into this engagement. Doesn't pop in time now. And Clear Vision continues to move forward with Meku and Tixi on the ground. Matic's got a lot to prove here. Matic, can this man do something ridiculous? Being pushed from all angles. White swing towards the right. Winding up. For a left hook as well. Has the HE ready to detonate. And he can pick off the back of this. He's being spat yes! upon. But it's good damage. And he shuts them down blank. That is a huge maneuver. Dude. Oh. There's a potential to get all four members up, but De Muerte's heard this. They're starting to swing in on that side as well. Three players, so they might be feeling a bit more cautious about this one. They don't know if it's a full four-man squad wipe, in which case all players are still alive. But Gladiators dodged a bullet on that one. They sounded so dominant in their engagement versus clear vision that De Muerte is worried despite the nine eliminations they've got on board. Absolutely balmy. Standing tall like an icon right now, noticeable from worldwide locations. He's like the Eiffel Tower. That was a hell of a spotlight play. To keep them in a winning position at this point, you can certainly get back into the game. And it looks like right now, GG, they're going to be hard set on trying to build even more into this. But the fights don't stop here. De Muerte on the rotate, getting away with the fast vehicle play. Ooh, like the maneuver. It's good on the movement. And he keeps himself alive, getting into the vehicle just in the blink of the eye. He's out there as well. The fact that he went from a crouch to a stand-up, squeezed his body against the window to make sure the vehicle just brushed him as he went past is amazing. Looking for some kind of cover, directs his attention towards this rock, sets up the impromptu defilade with the vehicles as well. Beautiful stuff. But again, we've got to look up towards Gladiator's side. Matic just pulled off an incredible clutch with the help of his teammate. 2v4, essentially. And despite clear vision, having an unbelievable position on the map with all the high ground to play around with they've been dismounted now gladiators hold that throne they'll be looking down towards the muerte right now diana moving around the vehicle trying to see what he can spot out and meku continues to just harass from that top side chip damage left right and center everyone trying to establish confidence and control here as we get closer and closer to what is going to be an explosive end game on this one interesting to see as well how slowly the pace has changed and been taken for greedy for kills from that awkward encounter they had with old boy they really tried to dial it back <laughs> let everyone else scrap it out right and then get involved when the numbers are thinned it's not worth it. Well, one of these European guys could do that to our teammates. It's too <laughs> scary. But yeah, right now, I think that the good thing is, we talked about earlier, do they just hold on to this compound? So they breached out just a little bit, took down one of the players from 77k, left them as a three, then moved back to this compound they cleared out earlier. It's smart play. Now they hold on to one of the more strong positions Ooh. on the map, but Meku round the side, just on the barest edge of the smoke there. Does find the shots. Now Diana's taking hits, but Kitsune goes down, and it's backwards and forwards here. Tixie is just going to send in, though. Oh, you've severed the brain from the operations. It's up to the rest of the brawl now. How can they react based Whoa, off this? Maloy! Oh, he's hot, but he's far too hot blank. He's taken it literally as he's ignited on that one. Got to get the heels in quick and reset because you're still mid-fight. That's a really good molly from Meku. Yes, Kitsune goes down to that nade, but it buys him a little bit more time to get repositioned. And with that, they actually get the circle shift too. So it's more important than ever to get rid of Tumwerte on this northeast side. Now, I said a top five position would be strong for Tumwerte considering they're down to three players. And they have delivered on this game, Jackie. This is really nice news for them. With a couple of changes on the team side for Tumwerte, looks like this is a winning combo for them. Diana sends a grenade over the top. Still five more remaining. 
remaining, and this could cause absolute pandemonium for Gladiators. They just want to remain on this high ground as long as possible. But Tumwerte, they're not scared. They're rushing in now. They know it's a 3v3. They're getting stuck into this one. They really want to try and blow the top clean off. Diana with so many nades in the back pocket as well. This man's going to be looking like a human mortar when the engagement goes through. Having a quick look around at how the rest of things are developing as well. You can see, still down in the compound, just playing the slower game. Ooh, greedy for kills, waiting to see if they can do something ill. Bit of a contact peek on the spam across. And still, back over at the fight that's been raging on for control of the hill. That's another connection that comes through from Matt. Alloy with Perfect. the backup of Diana, and that's a cleanup onto Alpha Team. So Sheeper managed to get him way in. Obviously, a top five finish is good for him, but Tixie's able to take down Malloy on the cross. Now, Tixie looks for another. This guy has been seriously reliable for Gladiators for so, so long now. Does spot out Fury. Fury will have to move at some point. So just locks him down. Whilst they're threatening the res down here, just locks onto that opponent. What a play from Tixie. Drops him down to just two players now. And, you know, this is all off the back of this one player. He is really doing some good stuff for his team right now doing them justice and hitting very heavy handedly as you could say goodbye to 77k but the battle itself oh it'll be worth a ton of money with how they're playing right now looking like diamonds are forever with some of the maneuvers we've had coming out tixie though he's got to be a big problem on this one he's taking the little peaks here and there you've done so much damage but can't actually convert any of this initial chip damage you've done Ooh. into finally shutting them down that is a disgusting circle. Now, the best thing for De Muerte was the fact that that loot crate dropped right next to him. Now, it's hard cover a loot crate. It doesn't really get much better than that, but it's not in the circle, Jackie, which is the difficulty. Matic takes down one of the players from Greedy for Kills. He tries to move up nice and early, and they have been just a little slow. They were waiting for too long for this circle to keep moving down towards that compound, as opposed to looking for a bit more pressure around the map, right? With the four players that they had, they should know that these teams are whittled down just a little bit, and having a bit more control over over the map would have been lovely earlier on. Now, Tixie continues on his little spree down the hill. I did enjoy the way that Gladiators moved back as well to further higher ground. It's smart because a lot of the players on that team are using the DMRs. It's going to be extremely good for taking pot shots over towards the Muertes in move out and greedy for kills who are currently in the open. It's great how Demurte have played this, though, from such a poor position, constantly just finding the damage across onto the players on the lower ground, being able to even get a couple of knocks out of it onto Greedy for kills that have been biding their time for such a large portion of this circle. Tixie, he's been waiting for finally a chance to put down the players that have been directly in front of him, and they haven't given him an inch, but he wants a mile to work with. You can also see, again, more damage on the side. That is Greedy for kills, finally finished off. They played a good game, but it's too little towards the end, and this is where we get an intense one for the finish. Matic continues to move out though, straight towards one of these trees, gets himself set up, understands that Malloy's already moved down. Meku tries to just bait out the quick peek, and already Tixie's there taking the shots. They've got all the angles in the world. There can only be one player remaining in a single spot, and it will be Diana. They take him down. The information game coming through from Gladiators this match was absolutely huge. They didn't have a lot of eliminations, but with that entire explode in that vehicle, three eliminations there, two eliminations there, I'm going to say I think they hit 12 elims on that match, which is massive. That's a fantastic game. Uh, you think about some of the ways they were played against in terms of the positioning, right? Their crosshairs being drawn off the angle, making it look so uncomfortable for them for such a large portion of those final two circles. But they took every fight that came their way and did so with swagger blank. And to go on to finish it off in this manner, absolutely incredible for them. A well-deserved chicken dinner. Yeah, it's great. I love the way they play that as well, Jackie, because they push further back to try and pick up some of these positions where they have range, where they can use the DMRs. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting because we used to see a playstyle where you try and get as close as possible with the shotgun. Uh, and it looks almost cowardly from the perspective of Gladiators, but it's not. They're just looking for a better position to use those DMRs. They are. They're just taking the fights that they favor. At this point, though, we'll head back over some of our favorite people as we've got Tech Girl and Co. back on the desk to break this one down.
Thanks so much, Jackie. Now, I know we need to congratulate Gladiators for what they did. Fantastic. They win. They get the chicken dinner. But I want to talk about De Muerte because I actually thought that the way they played that was really interesting. There was a moment coming into there that I thought that maybe, and I mean, I know, Max, man, you agreed with me on this one, that maybe they looked a little bit scared, but yet that play style worked for them, found themselves in that second spot. Yeah, it's very interesting how they went from that super aggressive push north against Black Hand, against Clear Vision, against a portion of Gladiators. And the moment they understood they're starting to reach and to encounter a bit more resistance from Gladiators, they were like, ah, we don't want to get too involved on this. We're going to go back over to the east. I feel like that is a misplay because we saw Gladiators lose a player. I feel like if they fully push on that location and they eliminate Gladiators, that's not only a potential chicken dinner, that's a chicken dinner with, what, 15, maybe even 20 eliminations because they already had double digits at that point. So maybe a little bit yeah. scared from De Muerte, but it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, right, Crowns, because they got so many points in this game, it is still a massive W for De Muerte. Yeah, and I was going to say, Demirete actually did go through a lot in that game. You know, starting off with taking out the likes of Falcons and every other person who tried to cross using that Eastern Bridge. They already did start from there. And ultimately, I also might not push into a fight when I see Gladiators on the left-hand side of the elimination feed as compared to anybody on the right-hand side. So they know it's just knocks and um, maybe not too many knocks there to not send it into the Gladiators. But ultimately, like you said, it did work out well for them. That's my thinking. I was like, they already knew they were in double digits. Like, do you want to take this fight, potentially get knocked out, or do you want to wait when you know you can make it to, to potentially get into the final so you get some good placement points as well into that final circle? But who knows? I think it worked out for them. Gladiators, though, not exactly the team we would have all peaked, uh, picked to, to win this one crowns, but they did it, right? Yeah, they actually did do it. And one thing I enjoyed from the Gladiators is they took the step early on in the game that every other person did not seem to want to take. Go towards that Western Bridge. Everyone feels like, yeah, that military base bridge is the bridge everyone's going to be on. That's where the bridge camp is going on. But, you know, there was no one there. Greedy for Qs did use that to get into the game. And ultimately, teams that actually did use that Western Bridge did get themselves quite a good finish. Yeah, I mean, exactly. The thing is, this is the pro strat that you always see from Gladiators on some Nuka Island finishes, right, Crowns? They eliminate all the teams like Rook, like Madballs, onto the Western Bridge. And after, what do you do? You just get control of the Western side. And I thought the team actually that was going to have a great game here was going to be Alpha Team. But the way they just sneaked behind Alpha Team and Gladiators just sweeped the entire squad, even chasing down a Sheepa at some point, I do believe, just to get that final elimination. They just get then access to the high ground positions, easy transition points to even stronger bridges later on down the line. And then you have Meku, who was looking fantastic this game. And not only that, Crowns, but Matic playing with the Mini-14, a meta weapon that's become so much stronger in this current update, has just been able to get headshot after headshot and yep. peeking up at 21 points on this game. Yep, and this is... the instance Gladiator got on top of that high ground. I'm like, do not give such high ground position to the Gladiators. And they held it so well on the west, and then eventually pushed them down to the north, and they were just actually having so much fun with it. Do you know what I do like when we when we start looking at the results so far, though, is that every time we go, this, it's been two maps now, and every time when we get into those final fights, it's even killed. Two European teams, two African teams. Were you expecting that, Crowns? Yeah. Well, I was expecting more African teams, but still, I'll take 2v2 <laughs> at the end of things. I mean, I'm setting it up so that you can knock it out the park, because I live in South Africa, so you know where my heart <laughs> really is. But this is what's been quite interesting, is despite our conversation, Maxman, at the start of this, about the teams potentially having very different playstyles, they seem to be working it out amongst themselves, and we're getting really good games because of that. Yeah, I, I do like what Africa's been trying to do, trying to play a little bit more aggressive. They're still being a bit reserved. I think the one team that comes to mind, and I'm not sure if you agree here, Crowns, is G4K, Greedy for Kills, that were playing maybe a little bit too slow in their compound. I feel like if they eliminate 77k a little bit earlier, maybe they can try and create some game-winning plays later on down the line, but it did slow down the entire approach to this map. They're looking at some of the top fraggers this game. Diana, I mean, sure, Demuerte, I had my criticism about this team, but Diana, or X Milky Way as we know them in the past, uh, has been stepping up big time over here on the Wrangle. I mean, doing so much work from that eastern side oh, of the zone and also doing so much work. And I mean, the gladiators everywhere when we what? look at the at the damage counts, which is not it's not a surprise seeing how well they were able to do. They, they were they were actually so pivotal to that bridge camp that was also coming through in the fight against rookie sports and the mad bulls that they did so much work on that west. That is so much damage they were able yeah. to accumulate and then bringing that to face the players there from um, from alpha team and then going on 
I could just keep mentioning the amount of teams the Gladiators took and those damage numbers, definitely they, they deserve that. I do want to bring up one point though, and this is a little bit of back and forth we had during this game, right, Crowns? And we were talking about Gladiators split northwest towards, I think it's phase five, phase six at some point, where Black Hands were north, Clear Vision were over to the eastern side, and Meku had an off angle wide outside in the blue. I was a bit mm -hmm. critical of that because I felt like they needed to regroup a little bit more. It ended up working out, but you were actually a big fan of Meku split, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm someone that likes the off angle, especially when you're taking long range fights, right? Seeing the fact that they had three players out there in the zone and then they had already spotted the side there of Black Hand. And I said it, it would only be a bad play if they've not spotted Black Hand. And seeing the fact that they knew Black Hand was there, they held that off angle. Meku was all there till the last player of Black Hand got eliminated and then the group up that we wanted from the Gladiators eventually came through. We've seen our first Aaron Girl. We've got two more to go. We're going to take a quick break, and when we return, you'll get to see the second one. Tixie picks it up. There is Nox sent back their way, but only on Tomatic.
to the PUBG Mobile Regional Clash. And you know what? We want to get your views on this because obviously we do this for the players, but we also do this for you. We want to put on the best possible show. So we'd love your feedback. We'd love any suggestions you might have for the show. What is it that you want to see? What is it that you don't want to see? You can let us know. We're dropping a link in the chat right now to a survey and we'd really appreciate it if you gave that link a click and you went and did that survey so we can try and bring you the best possible show. Your feedback is important. That's what it says down there and that's what I'm saying as well. Let's get into the second Aaron Girl. How is it going to go, Crowns? Well, I feel like the second angle is where all of these teams would have taken what they've learned from that first angle, and then they will come put it in play in mirror, uh, sorry, in this next angle. You do not want to make the same mistakes you made, especially with the drop spots. Yeah, yeah, you want to be careful, especially on those rotational paths. If you do have, by any unfortunate luck, another Sunlovka Island, at least you know how to approach it. But we should have a more normal, basic kind of game, hopefully this time around on a wrangle. So we're going to see how teams are going to be adapting to that one, of course. But when it comes to drops. I'm looking at Roshok more specifically. I want to avoid that entire fight that we had happening earlier. So uh, hopefully no hot drop this time around. So teams can have just a little bit of a smoother early game into those later stages. There are the tournament, the overall standings so far. Any surprises for you, Maxman? Any surprises of right now? I mean, really seeing Rook and, and Blackhand up in uh, second and third place is not really the big surprise is mostly like the amount of eliminations they got they were fragging hard especially in that first game so i want to see if that can transition throughout the rest of the day other than that mm. really the big surprise to me is seeing major pride not doing anything for the european squad one of the most aggressive european teams with their roster and yeah. unfortunately not able to find any success so crowns i'm hoping to see them step up on this second wrangle yeah, Major Pride and even Nexus, right? This was something that I actually did have in mind when before the PMRC started because I was like, okay, the European teams or men, most of these European teams have just come from playing the PMRC MEA versus EU and they didn't do too well there, right? So I was expecting that, you know, this would be like their redemption chance there for the European teams to come short, especially with Nexus gaming, right? But seeing the way Nexus is right now on that overall rankings, I'm not too happy about that. It is obviously only two games, but I always like to ask this because I think that the, the, the whole point of it is that a lot of people watching, they want to see their favorite team crowns from the get-go. They want to see them up in the top three, top four. It is, a, it is a marathon, like we said, but for the fans, it's not good enough if they don't see you on that left-hand side of the board, right? Exactly. If you're not on the left-hand side of the Elim feed or you're not on the left-hand side of the board, it's not something that we're really happy about. And I'm really looking forward to seeing many of these other teams that are out there on the second part put the numbers up on board. Yes. I've got Mad Bulls there because, I mean, I feel like it's about time we see Mad Bulls actually pull up with a good performance. Well, they were onto something in that Arangel game. But what's going on, crowds? You're picking, a, you're picking EU teams now? What's going on? <laughs> We're going into game. Well, Crowns, well, Crowns is picking EU teams. So, Blank, Jackie, over to you. Well, hello. Uh, I think in the meantime, it's just Jackie. But we will be getting Blank joining me, and we'll both be here to guide you through the explosive action as we do kick off our third affair here. Of course, continuing on on the streak of back-to-back -back erring gals. Erin got number one, delivered. It had an explosive endgame to it and left us salivating for absolutely more. This time around, what's it going to be like? Normally the way it goes, the sequel isn't as good, but then sometimes the third movie in the franchise is an absolute unadulterated banger. So who really knows? I guess we'll see what the reviews will say when they come on in. For now, though, starting it off nicely, of course, just letting everyone begin their parachuting journey down as they plummet towards the ground and hopefully we'll be able to bring back. your spirits back up because we've got Blank on the mic. I'm back in there once again with it, looking at the games, checking out what's happening. We've got our second Arangula game, which Jackie has pulled us into so marvelously here. Obviously, that first one took by Gladiators. Dropping down towards Ferry Pier right now. It tightens off towards their western side. But the desk highlighted it as well. You know, Duerte did a really good job. You know, it's not easy holding out over towards that eastern bridge. But we're moving away from the east. Actually heading over towards the west this time around. Over towards the fields of Gatka, Everest, as well as Hospital and Georgia Pole. So a real interesting type of terrain in this area of the map a bit rougher to navigate around and already mad balls lose a player i didn't realize that you spoke dog blank what a bit rougher 
No, oh, dear me. <laughs> Sorry. Give this boy a bone. You, come on. <laughs> there he is. Oh, it's fantastic. You definitely weren't barking up the wrong tree with that one. But it seems like there's some good sets of jaws coming out, as we've already got a few early knocks coming through. So a bit of biting to kick this one off. Blank? Absolutely. I mean, Mad Bulls, they lost a player, but they shook that one off, got all of the wet off of them there. Obviously, they're down to three players. It's not the best thing in the world, but they'll keep on going. You can't put these guys in the kennel just yet. They've still got more to go with as the Mad Bulls will continue out from Rozog, most likely moving off towards that western side, towards Xenon and Major Pride. It is a bit of a difficult rotation, specifically because Major Pride, you know, they know some of Zerich's rotations very, very well, considering Effect and Naomi used to be on the same team back in the day. Yeah, the brothers in arms from a, a different time. <laughs> different era. It is, yeah, like a bygone era, Blank. Kind of feels like the culmination of everything, you know? We've got the perfect timeline now. Everyone's just where they're supposed to be. It's like Wizards, Blank. You never arrive early or late, just perfectly on time. You could have stopped it, stopped it. It's just like Wizards, because a lot of mystical things can happen, you know? If it means the right timeline... Wizards are always going to be involved at the end of the day. And you've got to be a wizard of PUBG Mobile to take some of these games, the PMRC, because you need to bring out some explosive magic to make sure that you end up on top. Currently, Gladiators are sitting there with 24 points, with the pointy hat in in as well. So they're looking pretty good for themselves. Obviously, they've taken a little tickle of damage, but no players are down and out as of yet. But we have two African teams, Hungry and behind them, and Rook as well as Black Hand, which is not what we expect to see here. I didn't think personally, and I'll take the hit, I'll take the fall on this one, that Africa would put up as much of a fight versus Europe as they have done so far. So really proud of this region so far. Looks like it's come a long, long way. No, it's interesting, right? Because even before the event started, we were kind of discussing the difference of meta in both regions, the way the play styles kind of combat one another. But already here, when we talk about the actual combat, there's been some big highlights individually, some of the players being able to definitely step up to the bar. And the rotations have looked pretty tasty as well. Continuing on from a bit of a savage start on our second outing here, there's a bit of damage being done, finishing off some of the downed players. There's 77. 7k continue on from the form they found into the prior game being very effective at creating space and building up elim points into the early game in terms of the circles yeah, I mean, 77k, not bad results so far. I think they've had some decent rotations, like you were saying, Jackie, picking some of those eliminations where they can. Black Hand are dangerously close to them, though. Morteza has a nade, throws it completely the wrong direction, though. His info was given to him by a bad broker there, and he'll have to go back over that way and maybe try and extort a little bit more information out of him because he certainly will need it versus Black Hand. This is a very strong team. You need all the info you can get on top of them, but this is just a dirty spray coming through from Morteza, a veritable player that has been in the scene for quite some time here, really done some good work, and that kind of spray down, there's not much you can do about it as you try to get on your bike and get going. More iconic than Morticia Adams with a maneuver like that, and definitely going to get you bopping, remembering the theme tune over the course of this one. It's a good space, good early way to kick things off, get a few elim points in, but not over-egging the pudding. Still being able to play a relatively slow game, build up the loot, and play it for the longer con. Rotation's already coming through as well, with one vehicle being shared between them, like a good older brother does with a younger brother blank. You just take the one vehicle, and you both play with it together. A toy car, <laughs> of course, in this instance. Not a real car. That'd know. be silly. That would be silly business. Indeed. Obviously, a lot of teams haven't moved further over towards this western side just yet, but dropping in very peer, Gladiators have decided to pick up some positions over towards that western side, just spanning down over that fielded area. You know, Max is over in our chat at the moment, just screaming. Someone's got to take God Compound eventually, but we'll see if this circle does shift up towards that northern side. Potentially, people want to play around Hospital, maybe pick up some crates position. You know, the apartments over towards south 
Super George as well are really, really strong, especially when it comes to holding out the coastal side. But we'll have to wait and see because second shift, always the big game changer. That's where we're going to set up a lot of our end games. But it's not a bad idea to get at least one player to scout over towards God Compound nice and early. Potentially scout if there's any teams already picking up that spot. But right now, it feels like a lot of teams are just circling this area, Jackie. Flying their way around and seeing what they can observe from a safe distance, of course. Talking of compounds, you can see Major Pride being able to set themselves up relatively early in what could actually be a bit of a power play position when you look at the rotations and the other squads that are moving relatively close by. Looking like there almost would be a bit of a clash if this one continues suit between them and what remains of mad balls the longer this goes on. Of course, already down in numbers somewhat. Early rotations as well. GG taking control of the hospital and being able to get some last minute looting in with the positions they've taken here. Already flying ahead with the points they've accumulated so far off of their prior win. If they can cause a bit of a repeat bang and get the back to back, that's the all important one that would really project them far further ahead on our first day of competition. Yeah, because we always worry about gladiators, right? We're always worrying that it's going to be a slow start. They're going to put the key in the ignition and the engine's just going to sputter. This time it's sputtering to life, but just a little bit. We're getting the warming of the bonnet. And I think that potentially gladiators could come out swinging this time around. I think they've identified this problem a fair few times in the past. You know, I was speaking to Kitsune over at the PMWI as well. And he was saying that, look, guys, I know we're a slow starter, but I promise you, by day three, things will be better. And it certainly was, you know, picking up their third place was fantastic news for them uh, and I think that's something that needs to continue now this is what I was talking about beforehand immediately you will see teams like Rook as well as Mad Bulls Gladiators all getting into their vehicles and potentially taking a stronger position around this circle more than likely to head up towards South George area I don't know if it's going to center down towards the fields on the south side if it does it's going to be chaos Oh yeah, chaos is certainly one way to describe it as it feels like that's the way the stage is being set. Mass migrations with the rotations, everyone trying to get ahead of the curve and be able to take control of these compounds earlier than the next squad that arrives on the scene. All important as well, of course, is your last real opportunity before what could be ahead of a fight kicks off. So if you can gather the extra utility, get the stims in the back pockets, maybe it will save your bacon when things go through. Little bit of a tag and bag from a few sides as well, greedy for kills, getting stuck in where they can, with a few knocks starting to develop. I think the major thing to consider a lot of times with these types of circles as well is that like, we're cutting out a huge area, Jackie. Uh, with Mount Everest still being in play, with South George still being in play, people don't really want to get stuck in towards Crate side. They don't want to hit up those apartments, which are dastardly to get outside of. So they'd rather just remain careening on the outer edges, over towards these little buildings that are a little bit easier to get out of, towards Hospital, just on that tiny edge there. You can see players from Alpha actually heading down towards the bottom side of Mount Everest. So it's getting real packed real quick. It certainly is. Everyone bundling in. It's looking a little bit scary. Looking at some of the positions you can see here as well. Fine margins setting the distance between a lot of them on their quick rotates with the blue dealing damage to the muerte, living up to their old tricks. They like to take those slower rotations, play around the edge. We see it as the classic maneuver, similar sort of scenario for Falcons White as well. Six in the prior game, well, he was really quite naughty when it came to just dodging, ducking, diving, keeping himself moving and making it uncomfortable in any fight that he was forced into but i do like to see this blank currently everyone from the side of titans alive and kicking old boy it's fitting that he's on our screens nearly basically had the 1v4 versus greedy for kills with the way that he played it with the squad supporting him well they could certainly pack a punch in our second outing here on erringal I'd love to see it coming through from Titans, honestly. They're, they're a strong team. They're a strong team on paper. I said it once before, and I'll say it once again. But recently, we have been seeing that paper been put through the shredder. And I don't really want to see that happening whatsoever. So I think that for Titans, a little bit more coordinated play. And that'll happen over time. It's a relatively new team on the block right now. They need to get that synergy going. There is four days, and that's probably the magical number for them right now. Is the fact that, you know, a lot of times... 
we see these three-day tournaments, there's not enough time to get that synergy on board. So for them, this first day, this can be the day for them where they figure things out, test some stuff, see, see what's working, what's not working, and go from there. Because it's very, very important for them in the next four matches to build that synergy now. Because they're a team that can absolutely pop off out of their mind. They're not falling behind too hard right now, currently with 10 points, but they want to up that point caliber for themselves. Yeah, push it as far as you can, as early as physically possible. It's interesting as well, having a look at some of the scraps that are going on inside of the blue, you can see the World of Battle weren't able to really get a good eye test of them in some of the prior games we've had. Here and there at the minute though, they're trying to get as many eliminations in as physically possible, still scrapping from rough positions with low health and doing an awful lot of chip damage from a distance. In fact, even going on to actually build the odd elimination here and there, giving them free to play with so far into this one. Back over to the POV of Demuerte though, good control of the vehicles, they've all got a vehicle to work with, compound control as well, and this is where it could get uncomfortable for Falcons, they're on the drive-by, but if they're spotted out, oh, it could be a rough encounter, looks like they have seen each other though, and we'll see how they opt to play with this, with six already advancing further forward, thinking they had left the compound, but look who's lurking down on his last legs, that should be a clean up on the knock, so their numbers are now thin to just three. I'd say sadly, now just moving off with two players. Really, really unfortunate situation. I don't like that they left their boy in the lurch there, though. I think they could have maybe picked up Corker in time. Immediately, though, to Muerte. Malloy there takes some shots coming through from Major Pride. Still looking to hit a little bit more over their way. Fury will just pop the tires now on the vehicles, try and drop them as close to the ground as possible to provide some kind of impromptu cover. Not the best spot in the world, but they have got very central. That is the main thing, Jackie. So they can play out this game for a little bit longer. It's unlikely we're going to see too many serious crashes over towards this position because Major Pride has oversight over this spot. So until someone from Major Pride comes out, starts tossing grenades over towards De Muerte's dip, they are relatively safe. It's going to be hard to cross this field without Major Pride shooting out the vehicles. And it's honestly a miracle that De Muerte have. It is. It will buy them a little bit of time to work with. And one of the nice things you can see there as well is Furia, just in terms of the adaptation, right? Even when he's in an uncomfortable scenario, always tries to make the best of it by playing the mechanic, setting himself up, getting that additional cover, removing the vehicle from even being part of the equation if they work the lob in the nades to get that increase on the splash damage. We can flick back over to what Blackhand are up to as well. A storm seems to be caught in the eye of this firefight. Two close positions being taken with the blue making it even more I say a bit rough. I mean, Twab all stuck inside the back line building, isolated in the 1v1s as well. You're trying to get the rotation off, but it looks like the frag round the corner will blow the legs clean off and make this an awful lot worse. Thinning the herd again and putting them into a really rough spot. Now finally committing to it with the elimination coming through, and that's them wiped off the face of the battleground. This is a grim prospect for a lot of teams now. Jackie looking down towards his southwest side. You've got the field taking up more than a quarter of this little circle itself, which means that rotating from the northeast side, where the majority of our teams currently are, is going to be difficult. We've also met with the ridge side that currently Xenon as well as Titans are playing. And right now, I think Major Pride's got a very strong compound, and they need to leverage this compound now because, like a crowbar, they're going to have to pull the hatch on this game because so many teams coming down towards them from that northeast side, they need to clip the wings as of many of these teams as possible, Jackie, because if they don't, they're going to be met by crash after crash after crash because there's little anywhere else to go at this point. You know, you're quite limited in terms of your options, so you really do need to be ahead of the curve. Any late decision making, last second fumbles, any blunders here and there could make it so awkward, even on the re-rotate here for Blackhand, trying to group back up with the rest of the team. Play around the edge you've got and use that match geometry to some form of an advantage because you're in just such a rough position. You could see with the crosshairs and the angles that were to work with for greedy for kills and with the compounds that were taken, you were in no man's land. Just trying to breeze your way over that grass valley and get yourself some distance between both sides. And this is greedy for kills taking a slightly different approach as well, looking a bit more proactive in terms of the damage they're attempting to establish. Previously, we saw them trying to take that really slow roll game, whereas now now they get stuck in. We can also see Falcons back again towards the top of the hill. Clean line of sight for the contact. So a lot of information gathered for them. 
And this is looking like we're getting closer and closer to what could be a bit of a scrappy affair now, Blank. 100%. I mean, Alpha right now down in the dip is the best thing they can do towards that south side of the map. It's not providing them a huge amount of cover, but it will allow them to easily rotate out from this position. Now, Titans have one of the strongest spots in the circle right now. If we get another southwest shift, look at that. Old boy even managed to find himself a shot, but it's a L triple A able to find himself a nice little DBS shot through the building. Now, just one player left alive for Blackhand. Can he clutch this one out? Oh, this could be an A-star play if he's able to slay. He's already done so much damage. And he's playing with the timing, trying to keep them guessing with the audio cue. Small gap through the window, takes the pot shot, but isn't quite able to deliver what he wanted. And now dials back the pace a little bit. Hit the deck, play for yourself, rather than forcing the issue. He's got utility as well. You can set the place ablaze, and he's got even more to go with it. Keeps dashing them in, finishes off the knock, tries to get the bandage in as well. And has brought this all the way down to a hard stuck one v1 meanwhile you touched on it titans and right now they are going full team titan getting stuck into an awkward encounter in the middle of the ridge nades being delivered one after another and that's one that's going to be remembered chunky like an overfed cat as it damages the entire squad and leaves them in a ridiculous spot now Titans just toppling this team terribly hard at this point in time. There's not much they can do about it. And what a play from them as well. They identify this might be a team that can crash into them later on. And with that circle shift off towards that eastern side, they've now cleared out a lovely little dip to play around. But still, Blackhand is fighting off versus Allah on the outside for SBG. Goes extremely low. And all Keme needs to do now is get this one nade, bank it off the edge. But he moves to the side and he'll bank the wrong way. Quickly makes an adjustment, but won't take him down and still just dancing around this window. Oh, there's the encounter that he wanted, though. Eventually, he's able to aggress on the peak and finally stop the absolute shenanigans that were coming out from SBG. Madness to think what you're left with there, really. Effectively, it was the one on three. One by one, he chipped his way through them, just playing a slower, more snaky style of PUBG M and being able to pick up the pieces on that one. Not quite the full squad wipe, so a fight that's reset, but the damage he's done can't really be recovered from when you're talking about the amount of eliminations he's picked up there on the squad oh flicking back over to the pov of gg as well they were able to pick up that chicken dinner into the previous time we saw them out here this time around they've been taking a bit of a slower style of affair but still finding eliminations here there and everywhere tied with black hand for most elims at the minute with five apart blank looking heavy-handed yeah, I love this side of the map as well because they've got that little slope that heads up towards the fielded area. Doesn't mean they have to engage right away, but they can still gather as much information as possible. Right now, Major Pride have the push down in towards them. They were holding that lovely little compound on that northern side. Now they have to move over towards where Matic is currently playing, and he has eyes on. Oh, spam across. Eugene's got the specs on, and he's trying to spot them from a distance. See if he can deal some damage. A bit of disrespect here from the large range that he's in. Constant carnage occurring as well. And that Elim feed, as you can see, everyone is scrapping for control of any real area to breathe. At the minute, the spacing between them is getting smaller and smaller. Very fine margins with Nomi chiming back in again. And that's major pride going head to head, it seems. Up against GG Blank. That's a fight you do not want to be a part of. Really good plays though. Right now, Gladiators, like we said before, the key was the ignition. We were worried they were going to stall, but right now they're off to a zero to 60 miles per hour start at the moment. Nomi quickly moves inside, tries to find himself a position, will get taken down, and Effect tries to move out now. But look at this, Gladiators have so much control. Marshall even sees it, but expends the mag before he can take down the UAS behind this hay bale. But the explosion might just take down Effect, so it has to crawl away as quickly as possible. Burley getting himself out of dodge. As you can see, the pressure is on. Everything is getting worse. Second by second. And it will be Black Hand that's finally taken out of the equation. A lot of damage, a lot of limbs, but no more to be said about their legacy here in our third game of the day. Clear vision still in it. We've actually a full squad to work with as well. GG, they're going to get contact onto this now. You've got high ground from this position. Matic, he thought that he had the big maneuver, taking the wide swing for a bit of chip damage from quite a substantial distance, Ooh. peering off into the real distance as well. Look at the fights that are occurring, Blank. This is an absolute scrap. It's right now Titans versus Nexus, and they cleanly finish up that fight. 
They lose one knock, but look at that. Eight eliminations. Yes, Havlik scouted this out earlier, and they have laid claim to one of the best spots in the circle, and it was cheeky from Nexus. They came up from that south side. They moved in that building as soon as they saw one of the black hand players get removed at a distance, but Titans weren't willing to allow them to take that position away from them. Immediately sent in, and Nexus just wasn't ready for the rush coming their way. Oh, you're watching Kitsune's POV on that one as well. Looking at the arc, the camel drop with the frag, thinking Ooh. that he's going to decimate, but he doesn't need utility. He's a human firearm as he gets stuck in, burning down the damage and being able to make this just so really rough now. He's not only got the elimination, but you can keep the pressure on as they're trapped in what is effectively looking like some sort of death triangle. Any peaks you go for, these angles are going to be covered and everyone is starting to create space. They know timing wise that circle's going to start edging its way in. So you've got to take distance off them. That's one way to do it. Sending in the vehicle up close. Not going to work too well though as that will come back to bite him. Half of his HP wiped clean off. A man Balls looking to instigate the fight from that contact. Toluca armed with a DBS, doesn't need it. Instead, he'll deal damage with a rifle. The dinner plate comes out. The DP, perfect weapon to use here. Has a lot of bullets in the mag. Quickly sprays down. Fairly accurate too. Good stuff for them. Now it's Rook on the top of these buildings. Still can play this for now. They picked up this building after Titans left. They made a pretty heads-up rotation earlier on. Head towards the western side, towards that beachhead, and just stay quiet. This team managed to find themselves a strong win on Sandhawk using a similar kind of strategy. But look at that! <laughs> Meku just moves straight through, runs down the two players from Xenon, and is, in fact, looking for a little bit more. Managed to get towards the telephone tower. We'll be looking over towards Rook inside the building, but they've got bigger fish to fry close. By the Matic already spots some flea case down, but Kitsune, the IGL, left oh. in the dust. Oh my god, Toluca as well with the dodge and the close movement. Oh, blank. There's nothing calm about this. Toluca now trying to wear the shoe that was thrown against him as he dives into the vehicle and wants to get some form of distance between them. Meanwhile, Titans stuck in the thick of it here, attempting to gain control of this compound and not give it up with clear vision, putting pressure, pressure on more and more as they take that hillside control. You've got the bat line developing as well with Mad Bulls still trying to keep themselves in it. Toluca effectively isolated in a one versus three against gladiators uh, titans if they can hold this blank and keep back clear vision they look like they're in a prime position to go on a real streak looking at the squad spacing from this point forward yeah, I mean, at this point in time, it's really up to the circle. It's a coin flip, a choice. Does it head up towards the fields where gladiators can dominate? Or does it head down towards that south side where titans can huddle up, reinforce, hopefully hold on to this compound versus clear vision? Feels like they've expended the most of their utility up towards titans, and they weathered the storm. Sure, they've got shrapnel sticking out from their military vest, but they're fine for the time being. They'll keep this one going, but it in fact moves over towards Tulica. Now, Gladiators might be able to swing just a tiny bit further in towards this circle. But the fact that it has gone so far to the west, Jackie, leaves these rooftops still in play. And these are prime time angles, power play positions that will have more and more impact the longer this one goes on. Still utility in the back pocket as well for clear vision. And that might be their biggest boon about this. Use the one vehicle to draw the crosshairs. Try and bait them to peek into you. Then you rain down the barrage with these consistent frag grenades bursting one after another to lower the overall HP pool. And everyone's looking far worse for wear. You can see it's really started to chip its way through them. After this contact, now it's looking like they're ready for the engagement. Smokes breaking up the line of sights as well. Well, finally starting to take that push up through the hill. Pocus with the frag through the back of the window, supporting his teammates from the rear. Oh, blank. The way this fight's going to go down is going to look uncomfortable. If you push into the close range, Titans, it's all about the angles on this one. And they're trying to use their own utility to stop you from ever getting your foot through the door. This is the old switcheroo. I've seen this one before, Jackie. The smokes and they move to the other side. And right now, Clear Vision is left wondering as Icy continues to make noise on the other side. Havlik does finally go down, though, with the barrage of nays coming through from Clear Vision. It was only a matter of time. The fact that Pokes had so many. But it's Gladius coming in from the side. They find a huge amount of damage. Pokes might be next to go. And Matic, it's brewing up a storm so far. Oh, Matic. 
The madman himself being able to it's constantly back. deal damage. Oh, he's in a rough position as well, though, with the blue tapping its way through him. They turn and burn, shutting him down and removing them. Gladiators, no chance for the back-to-back. -back. The two-peat will not happen. Nine of limbs is all you get on this one, even with the timing and the flank that could have been made of absolute magic. Now we flip back on the Titan we've been talking about on the whole time. Oh, and Havlik, oh he's a mean machine, blank. He shuts them all down. Clear vision are gone. That was unbelievable. The fact that Titans have remained in this position for so long. These guys have got armor made of titanium. They have withstood a force that would take down at least eight other teams in the process. The amount of nades coming through, the switcheroo in play, the advantage taken off the back of the third party that comes through from Gladiators. What a game played out by Titans so far. It has been an unbelievable journey from this side of the map to further over towards this compound they have been constantly moving constantly trying to adjust their positioning they just got a whole heap of supplies delivered directly towards them in the form of the gladiators and the clear vision remaining members oh boy playing on the roof a really strong position that's still in play and it's most likely going to be the pivotal spot that smoke is so good denies the sidelines from the players on the roofs off towards that western side and attempts to try and find some of these players down in the fields it's genius, and you can see they're being able to cycle this utility as well. As like you were saying, just so much loot delivered to them. It was dropped off by drones effectively, and it's waiting at their feet, so they've still got more nades to throw out when they need to restrict vision once again. Two liquor, realizing that he's probably in the worst spot possible. Sure, you're in the middle, but that means you've got two teams about to swarm onto you. No contact from Titan just yet. Splitting up into two groups. Take the far left flank. Use the utility you've got to create distance. Oh boy. Gets into a better position. Drops that smoke. Gets the full heal in. Icy seems to have had a read on two liquor lurking out in the gulch. Lob that down and see if you can blow him out of commission. Oh. Prime hit on that one. That's a free pointer. 14 eliminations. We're only a third match into this game. Icy instantly moves forward in the exploded buggy so far. Havlik also moves up, currently on a tear with seven eliminations. Just on the drive-by. And it's Titans old boy take them out with a nade from Icy to finish things off. Titans just played the game of their lifetime here on our angle. That's absolute insanity. The eliminations are one thing, but it's also just the sheer audacity they had when it came to the team play. Uh, that was textbook. That was just absolutely fantastic PUBG when you're looking at the way they played it. Titans really did bring a whole nother level of lethality to us on that one blank. Man, they kicked half the lobby's teams out at that <laughs> point in time. It was insane. Goodness me, the guys on that team also must have every single one of them owned their own medical license because the fact they were able to live that one out for so long, just unbelievable. I mean, Clear Vision did a great job lobbing those grenades through, but whoever on that team, the Titans, called for the smoke and the switcheroo, again, you said it, and it's the best way to put it, genius. It really was just textbook stuff. And school was literally in session on that map. And they taught everyone a lesson. The way they were playing it in terms of the comms, the spacing, and how they took those fights, right? It wasn't just hard committing. No real tunnel vision blank. Even you were oh. calling it out when you're looking at the way they were making split second decisions and winning 4v4s that they were disadvantaged in. Crazy, crazy. I mean, look, the only thing I can say is I'm glad old boy's back. Oh yeah, old boy always getting us excited, but let's get back to the desk to try and break this one down as that was explosive. <laughs> through day number one and two teams have both finished in the top four twice and both of them have been able to claim a chicken dinner uh, along with that it's rook and titan and there's so much to chat about uh, max man said it just before we we're about to get in he's like i've got so much to say so you know what i'm uh, max what's the first thing that you want to speak about when you look at that air goal i mean oh okay i can't even pick there's just so many things to break down this match which is rare like really on a wrangle like this there's so much to break down but really i gotta say that play from titan and the Casters just talked about it at the end there. The fact that they did smoke out their own buildings to make those nades so much harder to hit was pivotal. Though, Crowns, I was talking a lot about a specific item this game. That if Clivision had it, they could have won that fight way, way earlier. Uh, is a Molotov. It's one of the few buildings that has a wooden floor. One Molotov in that building right on top of Titan. It would spread. They can't play that position anymore. And then it just becomes easy for Clear Vision to pick up the pieces. But 
the smokes plus the lack of Molotovs made it so, so easy for Titan to not really win the fight, but to delay it so that Gladiators would go for the third party. I tell you, and that, and that crash coming through from Gladiators was, I'm pretty sure Titan is just like, yes, yes, this is just happening. Thank and you. then they started to send <laughs> their own nades down onto the side there of Clear Vision, and well, it did work out well for them ultimately at the end. And I just want to piggyback off something that, you know, the casters said there, that Titan's not getting tunnel vision. And I mentioned this like, you know, early on in the game when I saw them hold that southern position, that if they do not get tunneled vision, they will be able to get themselves so much more elims and farm elims and they, that's exactly what they did yeah sam i'm gonna ask you something can you ask me what i thought about that rook push at the end what did you think about that <laughs> rook push at the end max ben i'm so glad you're asking me sam i absolutely hated it it was horrible it was not what we wanted to see from this team two main issues come to mind and, and i feel like crowns we might be in agreement on this one number one they were way too passive i feel like if they push while this entire ordeal is happening between clear vision gladiators and titan not only do they get in a position without having to take a fight they get so many off angles that titan cannot leave that compound and on top of that when they start pushing into the circle they all regroup in the exact same position when there were so many pivotal rocks i feel like they could have easily secured himself a chicken dinner here but a little bit too passive yep. it didn't quite work out yeah it was just pretty much a whole lot of uh bad events you know on each other stacking on top because when we're like oh rookie sports is not moving into the circle that's a little too passive hmm, but maybe they could just do this and then their next move is not what we think they're going to do they go to the same place and we're like no now that is even worse you know and i feel like there's that slim line between playing passively and playing yeah. conservative and i think rookie sports might have just missed it that's the thing that this gets me a little oh, sorry i mean off you go carry on on that topic and then i'll add my opinion then when you're done <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say that Rookie Sport, we see the potential of this team. They get to the late game really consistently because their macro is on point. It's just we need to see them be a little bit more controlling and decisive in the late game situations. And if they do so, I feel like we could see this team be one of the best in Africa. No questions asked. We were talking about passive play, though, and it's not something that you would normally link to Mad Bulls yet. I mean, to get a top three finish with one elimination, Crowns, I, are we concerned about that or not so much? Yeah, I'm actually very concerned given that they were my pick going into this game. I do feel like it's time for the Mad Bulls to actually stand up and start doing something. But ultimately, they started losing players early on in the game on their rotations, right? We see every single position they held in that game, they lost at least one player, starting from the hospital to when they started making it down into the open fields. And I think that's just pretty much where they got it all wrong. Maybe if they stuck together a little bit more, it might just work out well for them. Wait, would you, we just get the numbers. I almost want to go back to the eliminations. That was insane. <laughs> They're all just popping the hell off. Titan on absolute fire. And really, we, we, we said it at the start of this show, on the pre-show of day one, actually, of today. We were like, this team on paper looks good. I think Blank also mentioned it during the game mm -hmm. at some point. On paper, this team is absolutely phenomenal. How does it work on the execution side of things? And I, I wasn't sure what to expect in the first two games, but now this is a, just a very straightforward game. They had some nice splits south, and the moment they regrouped in that position and they were not tunnel visioned, as you already mentioned, Crown. I'm, I'm hyped with this roster. Like, this is just the start of what this roster has to offer for 2023. And so early on, they're already playing this good on an angle. I'm hyped to see how not only PMRC is going to go, but how the entire year is going to wrap up for this team. Yeah, and especially for that Titan Titan team, right? Especially given the fact that, you know, I've seen old boy do this in two regions now. Whenever they're coming in new, they just tend to just, you know, give that much aggression, right? And they did this when they came to Africa too, right? Their first week, they were absolutely banger and giving so much of play, letting everyone in the lobby know that we might be a new team, but trust me, we know how to frag. They definitely do know how to frag and they also know how to claim a chicken dinner because that's what they've done. We are halfway through, like I said at the start of this, and we are moving to the final wrangle after this.
cautious. Oh, this is actually easy. rolling down. Okay, yeah, they're not even going to waste any time. They just move out to the only position that they can go. The Molotov in from Tixie. This is bold. This is brash. But it is what you expect from the Gladiators. They want this top. I'm sure we are going to perform our African counterparts. We expect support all over from Europe to cheer for us. ديسكانور انت وانت مع بعض ركنا شافوا افضل المستغلين الموقف الحالي احنا شايفين ويوم بي بصفر عادي جدا يا ولد يا سنكي لكن لسه سكانور بيحاول يفتح لحد اخر لحظة ونشوف انه يكون مستمر في اقضي النقاط قدر الامكان نحن لا لما ما يترقبوا منا من شجعون في هذه المنطقة سوف نكون بحاجة الى دعميكم للفوز بهذه الجائزة Welcome back and welcome to our final wrangle of today. It is, of course, day one of the PUBG Regional Clash, Europe versus Africa. And I'm not going to get into the European-African battle just yet because I kind of want to hold that till later in the show. Right now, though, I want to talk about Erangel because it has been the thing we spoke about right at the start, how our teams were going to adapt to three Erangels and how do you think they've done that so far, Maxman? Well, some teams have tried to adapt a little bit more with the hot drops. I feel like there's still some weird things going down sam mainly i'm seeing sbg and yasnaya poliana the way they're playing that is very odd to me getting back to yasnaya very early on when the circle's hard west i didn't mm -hmm. quite understand that so yeah i unfortunately I, I do also know and this is talking with a few of the teams and and, and players uh that they're also using this as a training opportunity leading mm -hmm. into pmpl so maybe teams are going to come up with some unusual strats to try and prepare for the full season because as you know pmpl that's where you're going to get all your points to try and qualify into pmgc so I feel like teams have got their focus elsewhere right now. So right now, they're just maybe trying things out. Yeah, and uh, given that uh, Yasnaya is a place that I was also looking towards as for the African teams, like, okay, I know Black Hand likes to land in Yasnaya, which is why I started having a little bit of doubts, like, how are they going to fare when they go up against another team? But 77k landing in Yasnaya is something I don't want to see in this next game. 
Halfway through day number one, and it's still quite tight at the top of the leaderboard there, and you can see only a few points separating everyone. Any teams that you see now sitting in the top eight crowns that, and I know I asked this to you earlier, but I always find it interesting when we're looking at the scoreboard, that you're kind of surprised, because if you're sitting in the top eight now, halfway through day number one, you've had three pretty consistent games. Yeah, and um, I wouldn't say I'm surprised, but I would say I wouldn't have expected this from G4K, especially given the fact that there has been no Miramar games, right? We know G4K to be that team that is quite strong on the map of Miramar, and given that they're able to pull up a top six, even without any Miramar games, I'm, I'm actually impressed. It is impressive for them, and obviously they'll be really happy. Uh, you know what else is interesting to me, Max, man, is if you look at the top eight, there is a nice even split between European and African representation. You can appreciate the symmetry also of not only the first page, but also the entire leaderboard. Exactly. Look, just, just look at it. <laughs> it looks so bloody satisfying. I'm loving it. But it got some interesting teams, a nice pack of African teams more specifically doing well in the top eight. Though Titan and Gladiators are currently the cream of the crop when it looks to uh, these rankings. And it's so interesting when it comes to storylines too, Sam, because Old Boy was a previous player of Na'Vi, which is pretty much the, the entirety of Gladiators right now. And they're back head to head, back at a similar level, which I absolutely love. And I truly hope that this kind of storyline is going to bleed into the full season of Europe. We're going to have to keep an eye out on that. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And now, Kranz, for, from your side, your African region, are you happy so far with how your teams have performed or are you expecting more from them? I'm excited with the way things are going so far because I'm enjoying the fact that they're not uh, they're not totally being pushovers like almost everybody would have thought it was. You know, everyone was always looking at the African region as a weaker region in terms of like fragging ability. And right now, seeing the way they've been taking the fights head to head, it's been actually quite impressive to see them hold up against some of those European teams as compared to yeah. me expecting them to play, you know, a little bit more passively. Yeah, exactly. And, and talking about, we, we mentioned this many times that the Africa teams are a little bit more passive, but I don't know if you agree with me on this one, Crowns, but it feels like we are seeing that slow transition towards trying to be a little bit more controlling and aggressive. It's not there yet. I mean, we saw it with Rook more specifically last game that they were not willing to make what could have been a game winning yeah. play. But teams are understanding, okay, versus these European teams, we need to start fragging out and balling a lot more, just like World of Ballers, and try and do well in those late game positions. So. There is that process starting off, and it's good that it started on day one, so we might see big evolutions later on down the line. Yeah, that is something I wanted to point, point out also, that the fact that they're able to do this on day one is very interesting. I mean, we've seen greedy 4 kills hold good positions in the game, and they're able to get themselves pretty sweet eliminations to go alongside it. Rookie Sports has done that in the first game of the day, and um, I'm really enjoying it so far. It almost feels like they're not used to it yet, because, I mean, we can see it. Sometimes they get the good positioning, but they don't get the elims, and sometimes they get the elims, they do not get the good positioning, and I feel like they will be able to nip it in the bud as we continue to go on. Putting up predictions right now. I went with gladiators because I think they're knocking on that door and they're hungry for some chicken. Tell me, Maxman, you got a very, very quick way of, of telling me why you think Titan Gaming <laughs> is going to take another one? Because they're pretty good. No. <laughs> I, like, I mean, there we go. We're, there I'm actually go. perfect with that. And I think that that was a good explanation. Crowns, can you better Maxman's explanation for your prediction? <laughs> um, well, the Titans are good. But I feel like Rookie Sports have shown me like they have something coming. And like, like you pointed out, right? We've seen them in the top four in every game so far. And I feel like they've gotten the fresh chicken dinner. Now we're going into another game right now. And it's Erangel. And I feel they, 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 they've, they've been knocking. They can do it. I think you're wrong because Max Man's explanation was shorter and better. Thank you. So we're going to go. I'm the desk host. I can, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Obviously, predictions are all just fun. And we'd love to hear from you if you're watching. Tell us who you think is going to win in the chat. Have a little bit of fun with us. Let's see who's right at the end of the day. I am definitely not keeping score. I think so far we are all on zero. Time to get into game. Blank, Jackie, they got you covered. Or not into game. We'll just carry on chatting. Yep. There we go. Now, Max, man, I can actually give you more time to break down why you decided that, that Titan was your choice. I guess not. No, I guess not. Let's go into game. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Max, don't worry. I, I always <laughs> want to know what your opinion is. It means an awful lot to me. So after the game, specifically, I will personally come and find out exactly what you were going to say. But for the meantime, let's give it over to a man that I also really care about his opinion. Blank, tell me about it. What are we going to be seeing here? This is our third of the three Erangals in a row. Based off the past two, are we expecting anything a bit different? Maybe a different sort of flavor coming into this uh, one? 
man, you've just parted a DBS with me. Like, well, that's a loaded <laughs> question right there. Man. Yeah, but I know yeah. you can find your way through it. <laughs> you, you've true. got all the answers. You're like a Swiss I'll, army knife. <laughs> I'll muddle through. Let me pull out the fork first. Look, as we get into this one, you know, we're going to have a look at this game. Obviously, we've had some EU teams doing some incredible work so far. Um, Titan, Gladiators really taking a home on these past two matches. Mm. Titans just came off an absolute blinder of a match, which was lovely to see. Um, Gladiators actually dropping down towards the south side. That's Matty going far. This is an interesting change of pace for them. Maybe picking up a little bit of loot down towards uh, C block and then move up towards Ferry Pier afterwards. I mean, this playing path didn't really give them a huge opportunity to get towards Ferry Pier without making a long drop, picking up those vehicles. And we both know, as we've dropped into these maps before on a long drop, doesn't always go to plan. No, indeed. I think you handled yourself well on that one, Blank. You avoided the shotgun shells and you gave us exactly what I, I wanted. You know, you I set the stage. <laughs> Hell yeah. You, you've given us the recap. You've got us ready for what's about to come. And like we touched on, this will be the third of the three back-to-back Erin Gal affairs that we have. After this, we get that complete change of pace with Miramar and Vikendi waiting in the wings. And I'm glad today, Blank, it has been a bit of a different flavor in each and every outing that we seen right with the different chicken dinners being picked up a bit of a close affair when we talk about the overall standings with the global points between eu and africa i think all of us have been really pleasantly surprised with the level of competition we've had just on day one alone if this is like the taster like the opening morsel that you get an appetizer if you will the deeper we go the closer we get towards not only the main course but that dessert at the end i think this is going to be a banger of a tournament a lot of talent scouting that could be done in terms of the optics of these next few days yeah dude i mean i'm all in for the 24 course meal i'm oh, yeah. ready for that one and right now this fourth course that's coming through i think this is going to be a good one here on we've already seen some good teams putting up some great numbers so far right now titans have surpassed the gladiators they're currently 37 points at the top of the leaderboard with gladiators dragging behind by just one point it's not too much but we have four African teams underneath them right now from that region. Looking really, really good. Zerich gets absolutely handled there by mid along the way. Anything but mid, though. This guy's on the top of his game for a shot like that. Oh, man. That was a, a big old banger. Certainly want the right home about, to be honest with you. So it's a nice way for him to start things off and instantly bring himself into the forefront. This is interesting. Look at the position we've got here for clear vision. One versus three, effectively, with the push coming in. All different angles being swung upon. And that's rough on the peak. The Bizard being able to deal enough damage to fully shut him down. Finished off with a conversion from the knocked position. So, Falcon swooping in early, much like the Bird of Prey itself. Yeah, good stuff there. Everybody knows that Max Landessi loves that PPP zone. Oh. It is his gun of choice when he drops into the game. And look, it did good stuff for the Falcons there. Picked up one of the players from Clear Vision, leaving them sat pretty unhappily on three players. But we saw what Mad Bulls could do with three players last game. Able to get very far into it. And, you know, we kind of underplayed Hulika's position in that map. Managed to get himself a third place because Titans were playing just one hell of a game. Uh, but the fact that he was able to get that spot is really good news. Now, I did have Mad Bulls over in me and Max's rankings as one of the good teams. I thought was going to do quite well in these matches. They were in our number two tier. Uh, not number two, alphabetical two. Uh, actually, number two. Yeah, I am absolutely going crazy. It's so hot here, <laughs> It's very Jackie. warm. <laughs> it's, it's very so warm, warm. Man. It is. The it number is really two didn't warm. sound right in my head. <laughs> Just the, the number two. Numero yeah, dos. Oh, dear me. Numero yeah. dos. That sounds better. Yeah, I'll go with that. Top um, 10 Cinco PUBG Mobile play. Honorable I've mention. I've forgotten what's going on. Um, <laughs> but I'll get right back into it. Yeah, that's it. Mad Bulls, great team. Hopefully they'll do better. <laughs> I agree with you, man. And like, honestly, <laughs> you, you know, you look towards someone like Zerich, right? Can he feed the hot hand, I suppose, is the big question. Uh, in terms of the eye test at the minute, I still feel like he's being able to pull out some big plays now and then. It may be a little bit hot and cold. That's the only problem. I will say, though, in terms of his own mechanics, he's looked great when it comes to his off angles. Really good understanding of how to instigate fights and the way to play around it you can see mechanically he's done his homework
All right, then. At the minute, Arthur, much like the Arthur meme, he's got his fists ready to see if he can catch hands on this one with the early damage re-established. Fielding, Max Man's most fabulous weapon. With that PP Bizard in the back pocket, I don't know why, it just made me laugh thinking of Max. He just makes me happy. Either way, though, this fight is going to be something that's going to leave you unhappy as the barrage rains down to Licker, hitting heavy with the frag from quite a distance as well. This is an opportunity I didn't expect. Storm now getting stuck in with the third party, the Mini 14, certainly packing a large sized punch as it hits from a distance, gets another knock through. Ooh, it's looking rough for the world of battle as well as they're feeling a world of hurt paper thin walls as they fall with the shots coming in again that's a very early removal from the equation for the world of battle blank they just haven't been able to display that level of killer instinct we were kind of thinking they might bring out the day and there's nothing that's going to bode well in terms of the positioning here for Mad Balls as well. Sure, you got the compound, but so much early damage from a spot where they were thinking they can clean up. You've still got Blackhand with hill control as well. Oh, but suddenly that line of sight isn't such a delight. Seems like from the distance, they've now been spotted with a lot of tag damage being instigated here. Shots there with eye nails. We'll be moving around. Tri Triceratops buggy, man. I am a big fan. I think I need to go grab one of those for myself in game. In the meantime, let's take a quick look at the old lobby itself inside the map because we want to know exactly where all these teams are. Now, Nexus is something I've identified, Jack, and I don't like it. I think their confidence has been massively knocked over the previous PMPL and into PMWI. They would make this rotation so much quicker, but Demuerte would mess around with them over in PMPL and in PMWI, whenever they tried to get into the circle early, they would be instantly taken down. And I think that because of that they have slowed their rotations down to a crawl now i want to see speedier rotations to see what they can do with that type of thing I, I, I feel like you're, you're spot on, really. It's one of those where they seem at times more hot and cold than Katy Perry, right? And it just feels like we need that layer of consistency and a bit of confidence to give them an upward draft to bring them back into the game. We know the talent's there. It's just about seeing it. You know, I was thinking maybe it was just the curse of WAN where they weren't able to show up back at PMRC. Potentially here, we're seeing that that is still plaguing them as a bit of an issue. you got to get Doran out there and get him really instigating a bit of confidence back in the side. We can have a look how things are developing here, though, in terms of the rotations. Close grouping back down towards the bridge. Grouping, even. That's more of a word. But I suppose you are in water, which is kind of goopy. That's right. It's uh, this viscosity could be changed here at our angle. We just don't know. We haven't swum in it ourselves. It could be a little bit jelly-like, but for some of these teams, they will be certainly feeling the jelly in the knees making this kind of crossing because it is a bit scary making the swim across to Ferry Pier. A lot of times that can be a daunting task where you get to the other side, there's a team waiting for you, and that's it. You're done. You're out of the game. But it's also one of these little dangerous crossings where, you know, yeah, you're a bit shaky. Yes, you're a bit scared, but you make it onto Ferry Pier, then you play a really good game from there onwards as long as you are undetected and right now titans it seems a lot of their interest is up towards our northeast side jackie trying to see if they can snatch away some control remember as well titans fresh off the back of the win into the previous affair we saw here on Aaron Girl just moments ago, really. And they were looking so damn talented when it came to the micromanagement. Their macro was great, but they had such a good understanding of how to deal with fights, how to deal with those rotations, and utility usage was just through the roof. The brains were on display. A lot of grey matter on Titans today on either side of the fights that they've been involving themselves in. Malloy, though, not the dream scenario. Seems like Demuerte stuck in a bit of an isolated position in terms of the split, relatively broken Broken up, but they've got vehicles. Drive on over. Diana providing at least somewhat cover to restrict this line of sight, but they're being pushed upon blank. This is going to be a bit of a scrap kicking off now. Gives it a little bit of a bump on the buggy and quickly Tenchik gets over towards that top side. Won't be able to take shots as the Muerte quickly careens away from that one. Not want to stay there for too long. Axa on the top side. He's tossing some nades down. Actually jumps out the window, goes for the shots through the tiny little portcullis on the side of this building. And now may go for a nade. Nine now that's got to be really careful. Oh. That one explodes and he's out the window and Axe is going to chase him down. 
that's incredible. The timing on it as well for the double frag grenade from both of them, using the elevated spacing for the bottom and the top to get both of those to detonate at the same time. If he would have been slightly slower on his getaway with a movement through the window, that would have been another knock and one to right home about. Instead here, he's effectively trapped himself. A position for now, sure, where he can at least heal up and try and maybe make a snaky maneuver from this. Maybe we could see a bit of info played off of it with Nexus and Octavian rotating around on the far side. But for Falcons, they're happy with what they have done. They don't want to over-egg this one and back off going for their complete rotate, leaving him as the last man standing. Yeah, not much point sitting around in this position for too long. So Falcons White will get out of there as quickly as possible. Moves down, waits for this next circle to pop, which heads up towards that north side in the fields towards the western edge of Pachinki. Chopsticks up towards that northwest side as well. Can be played with a couple of the ditches in suit. But realistically, this is not a circle that can hold very many teams. Most teams will be heading over towards that western side where you do have that plateau uh, on the edge of Quarry that you can look down on. So that's going to be a heavily contested area now. Jackie. And it's interesting as well, having a look at the rotates, if you flick on up towards school, obviously with Mad Balls, effectively forced into a far slower rotate. With their timing on this, coming in towards the back line, heading yeah. over towards Pachinki, there's actually a fine chance plank that they could really pack a punch a little bit later on. Here's one we haven't seen for a while as well. Obviously, the Gladiators themselves, huge clash throughout the course of the day. Good on points, very tight. Just one behind in second place. And look at the angles they've got here. Sitting ducks in the water for 77k. But actually, Mortissa, well, he's got the angle and knows of Tixie's location. If his head pops up, it could be a left-right good night. Oh! That is a nasty shot as well. I mean, Tixie did a huge amount of damage to the players getting out of the water, but quickly they can administer first aid kits. It looks like the couple of players up front are trying to move in, take down Tixie, but look at that. From the side, it's Matic with the M249 instantly followed up by the M4 spray. Really good stuff. And Kitsune gets behind the tank barriers here for the time being. Matic will drop down some smokes to not allow any of these players to get too close up towards and translate across. Really, really good play. And I like this move from Kitsune on the side. If it wasn't for that, but for the fact that Morteza is such a nut job with the M4. Oh, man. And that was a nutty play. The response was great. I mean, Katsune tried to play it mechanically the best he could, taking awkward fights here and there. But the rest of the squad now realizing things are getting quite far out of hand, relatively split as well. You could go for a quick maneuver, attempt to see if you can get round, get him back on his feet and potentially save his bacon on this one. Tixie still just hard committing to gain control of the front oh. beach line. Good play with the frag as well, blowing them to bits now. And Mortis's position, as much as it was a useful angle now he's just isolated trapped on an island yeah best he can go for now is to try and get some of these eliminations on board for gladiators i think they've done enough yes they can leave morteza behind he's practically in the middle of nowhere and they can quickly dip out into cover into the tree line get out of line of sight from morteza himself because they need to start picking up a position within the circle itself and you know their direct line could be up towards that northwest side towards those buildings with the silos underneath the plateau itself but titans currently hold that so they've got a hell of a fight in front of them and they've got to be ready for it. No pulled punches, it seems. Ooh, look at this as well. The back door entry. Nexus trying to make the big moves. They've got the guns for it. Getting stuck in with the spam across. Nice connection. They knock them straight off with their feet. Clean. Elim on that one. 77k now out of the way. No eliminations to their name, even with the sheer damage they did. And finding that knock on the Kitsune. Overall, it amounts to nothing. We switch over to the POV of Nexus as well. Close here by black hands now nexus they've been all over the shop with the rotation points i'm trying to home in a little bit on Dorin with this one as well as it feels like he'll be probably the first one to get contact in terms of the fight when they advance further forward he's got a vehicle behind him with a the smoke they've got good positioning and a lot of spacing on this so we'll see how things develop over the course of time as that circle is starting to come on in yeah i mean to be honest, that slow rotate that Nexus is usually going for doesn't always play into their hands. But with this type of circle that's really hard to navigate, as we're seeing this hard shift up towards that north side into Gatka and Chopsticks as well, look, 
the big thing that unfolds right now is that now Nexus holds really good control over this eastern side. There was a lot of teams down towards the south that moved off Stoznovka, potentially moved past yellows and moved towards this position itself. Uh, and now Nix Nexus basically has like the pick of the litter of where they want to go. Unfortunately, there's a lot of teams already moving in. Again, it's that slow, jelly-like rotate that comes into play. Here we go, wibbly wobbly. Let's see who's going to be standing strong when this one settles as things are kicking off. Kitsune, he was knocked very early on. He's been put back on his feet and now he's trying to prove his worth on the side for Gladiators. Utility being lobbed consistently. The Bizon still getting some love as it battles its way through, finally shutting down the Muerte and leaving them now looking lifeless. Gladiators knowing positionally as well, this is looking a little bit compromised. Good spacing if they rotate down towards the row side you could probably take the fight into the bat line here and maybe have a play to work with with this. They've got contact with the frag barely tagging on the getaway, but still, they're being tagged from a distance and don't like the look of this one. Not much cover to work with there, Blank. Yeah, it's, it's a tough spot to play in. You have a lot of sidelines to play around with yourself up towards Major Pride, down towards Titan, who've already lost Robs in the meanwhile. Nexus, though, slow rotate themselves. I honestly think getting in towards the circle now for Nexus is going to be incredibly difficult, especially with Alpha hot on their heels at the moment and clear vision just behind them. But the fact that Gladiators were able to make this rotate very quickly off the back of that engagement they had with 77k up towards this central spot takes down to Muerta, at least the remaining members of them, and then holds on to this position. Yes, they have a lot of angles to hold themselves, but if they can, it's going to be really, really good. Oh, that's nice. Another cleanup coming through onto Alpha. Oh, you can see their numbers being thinned quite quickly now. These gladiators, they are not stopping when it comes to slicing and dicing in these close quarters engagements. Alpha down to just Mandarin really effectively. He's got a bit of backup from his teammate, but all you're really trying to do is move those crosshairs off of the positions. Clear vision also falling whilst the dust is being kicked up. That's them out in 10th for now. And Dixie, is he trying to go in for an aggressive spin? Seems like he's accidentally bonneted oh. himself, been knocked out of the car and spray down as pain comes through. This is not looking good for the Gladiators. That is a real clutch moment there. I mean, Matic bumps Tixie, pushes him into the, the what, quite literally a Ferrari peak right round the corner. I, I didn't see that one coming uh, at all. Meku unfortunately does fall because the spray from Tenshik does a lot of damage towards him. Realistically, that's kind of a Matic classic right there. This is what he likes to do. Crazy little plays that don't always work out. And because of it, they lose one player on the aggressive push. I think you could have allowed maybe just Tixie to move up on his own. I don't think he needed the extra help from the bumper itself. But they still have a really strong spot. Now, they can either choose to move further up, try and take control of one of the chopsticks here, or head towards a little divot in the road, rather than try and take the fight with multiple teams coming in from the south side. Can they move like water and go with the flow on this one? As no one is looking too comfortable. A living legend in his own right, though. Old boy back on the screens again, reloading the dinner plate and looking to serve anyone that tries to push up onto him. Line of sights being removed with smokes all around. So he can play with this and looks a little bit more confident with the timing. Always on his lonesome, it feels, though. His teammates are still alive and kicking, but far more fragmented when it comes to their positioning. Here's another one with Havlik up towards the far left, backing up now. As you can see, the gladiators moving in. Major Pride not too far away as well in the distance. And old boy, he can engage from this. A lot of damage on the first wow. peak, but he wants to back off immediately. Resetting the fight, but they try and chase onto him. I mean, this is a pretty insane play coming through from Matic, but Xenon moves up into Major Pride territory and quickly gets dismayed by the fact. Now, this was a disjointed push coming through from Gladiators. We saw Kitsune and Tixi move down. Matic wanted to move further up towards the north. Was recalled towards the rest of the team. And I think this was the losing play coming through from Gladiators. I think heading up towards the divot in the road, probably a better idea and allowing these teams on the south to take shots at one another. Especially when you're playing with three Jackie, you just don't don't have all the sight lines you need to make this one happen. And old boy once again showing us what he's made of. Yeah, it was great confidence from him to instigate a fight that otherwise it felt like he had no right going for. Ooh, this is rough though. Consistent spam damage from a substantial distance is greedy for kills. Always finding the prime opportunity to get stuck into a nice third party right for it as they walk away with a few extra eliminations and really leave us down. 
down to just a handful of squads remaining at this point. Gladiators, they have one man barely alive, but old boy, he's still making decisive plays. Finally knocked after effectively being a one-man army blank. He's just been dipping from occasion to occasion here, and a lot of the teams have been facing the brunt of the force that he brings with him. Well, the rest of the Titans either need to back him up or just move away, and I mean, he's in dangerous waters right now, and I think throwing him the rope, it's not going to be the ideal situation as Havlik gets punished for it, trying to come into his aid. Havlik thought he could be half slick on that one, but it gets detected and dealt with. Thinning the herd a bit more. And for Titans now, the chance of them being able to get the bat the back, it's looking far less likely with the numbers game not supporting it whatsoever. They join Gladiators in the solo dolo club and have to work their way into it with far slower gameplay. And actually, they're going to be swung upon. I see he's hiding in the smoke. He's trying to stay alive. But he's been finished off, peppered down as Titan Gaming leave sixth. Three African teams still up with a good amount of members still on side, but Europe suffering massively. Major Pride's done fairly well from the southwest side, though still going strong, but Rook once again, they identify a strong compound off towards this western side. They hold on to it well, using one of their players in Rami as that uh, cover on the north side inside the ice cream truck there, inside ice cream shack. That is really, really smart. It doesn't allow Black Hand to get too close. Unfortunately for them, they will have to leave this compound. So instead, they're opting for the third party down towards the south side, Jackie, oh. but Griefer kills. This is massive. Oh, they're certainly living up to their namesake. They are greedy for eliminations right now. Oh, pick up after pick up. They deal damage. And that's the biggest and last standing EU squad that we had taken out fully, wiped out of the equation. Major pride will not have any pride on this one, as right now it's all about the pride of Africa. The only remaining squads that are here, deucing it out to see where it will stand at the end of this final bout, up close and uncomfortable. The DBS dealing damage from the back line, greedy for kills, setting themselves potentially on a course here to actually go on to shut this one down. They've got the utility for it, and they're causing so many issues with the splash damage. Meanwhile, staying out of dodge and trying to play the long con, Black Hand keep their distance from this one and completely reset the fight. And I mean, this is what I talked about earlier. Chopsticks, a good decision, a good place to play. And the fact that Black Hand been able to hold on to both the West and the Eastern Chopstick at the same time just gives them an unbeatable amount of cover to play this game out with. Eventually, though, they will have to start moving down. Gritty for Kill still has three players up and kicking. And realistically, the thing you wonder about the most is, is Black Hand feeling very warm into this game? Because Greedy for Kills coming out from this one looking really, really strong. But Black Hand has been sat still for a long, long time. And that warm blood has started Ooh. to cold a little bit now. Well, it seems like Storm. He's starting to get himself going again. A bit of a pump on as he engages in the firefight. And from a substantial distance, finds the light. Knocking Ruck out of the equation. Black hand, even if they're a little bit slower to the roll. Right now, you've got one additional player in the squad to work with in a head-to-head, -head, one versus one clash to try and pick up the chicken dinner here and do it for your home region. A battle of these two squads blank that could be decided by Black Hand's influential maneuvers. At the minute, they're keeping their distance again. They really want Greedy for Kills to play into them. Yeah, this is smart. They get themselves up, set into cover. There's realistically that rock in front of them that the Grief for Kills can move up to. Great use of smoke so far, though, to allow them to reposition. And this angle from Delhap might have been good, but it has been spotted out by Mazaro along the way, and he has to make the mad dash to the rest of his team. Administer the first aid kit as soon as possible, but right now, Grief for Kills just running Ooh. with two players. Make that two again as they regroup back on one another. That two man on the top side without Del Hap was devastating. Del Hap being far too haphazard Toxic. on that one. Oh no! Storm has been absolutely ridiculous, by the way. Really living up to the name and being a marvel of a player in a situation like this. Consistently aggressing, taking outrageous peaks, dealing the damage from a distance, and hey. instigating fights in a vehicle. Blank, he basically individually, has been able to claw this one into just one player standing for greedy for kills. Mate, the fact that Toxin got back here is incredible. He sends it out into the blue. That's naughty. <laughs> Closing it down on his own turn. He gets himself But that means to... Black Hand have done it. I know. That's mad. Oh.
Great chicken dinner there from Black Hen. Wonderful stuff. Really good control of the chopsticks as well, Jackie. You love to see it. And I think at the end of the day, you know, I think they deserve that game. They identified a really strong position in the map. And I think a lot of teams just opted to go for too many fights, Jackie. Heading down towards that south side was just not the play. No, it, it really wasn't. And, and I think, obviously, you know, if you were trying to highlight some of the key maneuvers we saw there from Black Hand, I was thinking coming into this with not too much of a, a microscope I've been able to put on them in the past in my own right, I was expecting a lot from Koa. In reality, though, it was Storm that was just impressing me level after level with his movement, the way that he would instigate fights blank, but also not being afraid to not be a backline player or yep. fully take control in situations where he realized, okay, I'm just going to go for the confidence ball. Really seemed like he had a great understanding of the flow of the game there, especially in that last circle. Yeah, I mean, we've got to really congratulate Crowns on the desk as well, because he was a guy who was hyping up this team on Black Cannon and say, you know what, Storms is a really strong player. You should watch out for him and look at this. He is performing extremely well, Jackie. He is indeed. Black Hand snatched the crown from ever thought they had it in that one. So let's get back to the desk and let him gloat a little bit. really wanted I, i'm gonna let crowns have this moment in a bit but i actually i had such a plan for this because after seeing three erin girls i wanted to go right back to the beginning to talk about strategies from the teams where they dropped and then that last fight happens and i'm like oh well that's not gonna work we have to talk about this crowns you know what's embarrassing is you did not predict black hands to win this chicken dinner i'm um, fair enough i'm trying not to jinx them i get that but black hand the fact that they played passively towards the end, but they still got themselves quite decent elims. 11 just blows my mind. And to be honest, this is not the storm that we saw in the spring split. We saw a more passive storm in the spring, in the spring split. And now, here in the PMRC, he's popping up. I'm loving this. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the adaptation of trying to play more aggressive than what these African teams normally do has been so so successful for Storm more specifically so loving what we've seen for Blackhand though if I did have to criticize them slightly on how they play that late game I feel like they put all of their eggs in one basket pushing on mm. that third party of Rook Esport versus Greedy for Kill if that fight goes south you lose what could have been the easiest chicken dinner of this tournament so far in PMRC. Luckily enough, it does work out. They do overwhelm the competition south with their numbers and with that aggressive push with the cars. But there, we, there is a world, Storms. I feel like... Oh, Storms. Sorry, I'm mixing up Crowns and Storm now. So, <laughs> so it, it, it's going to happen eventually. Uh, but it, there is a world where that potentially slips out of their grasp. Luckily enough, though, it does work out and they do get their first chicken dinner here. Yeah, and the world where that would have actually slipped out of their hands was if Toxin actually went for that wide flank that he did towards the end. If he went on that earlier, he could have sabotaged that entire chicken dinner for this idea of Black Hand, right? And like you said, it was quite sloppy play coming through from them. You know, I was questioning the awareness coming through from the side of Black Hand, like, oh, there's only nine people left, right? Do the math. There's four of you alive. There's only five people left. You cannot continue to play this condensed, right? Try to get the angles and push up onto the third party. I want to ask you, Max, a question around Rook Esports specifically. What did you think of them in this game? I am super happy to see them starting to be a lot more aggressive a lot earlier at pivotal points in these games. Going for that third party versus Major Pride and uh, Gladiators and also Greedy for Kill was the, the play that if it works out, they have an opportunity not only to reach the top three, but also to win the whole thing. So I'm really, really stoked with what they did. They didn't get a lot of limbs, but at least uh, the mentality is there, I would say, Crown. So I'm really stoked, but though... I gotta say, Africa brought the heat this game. That is absolute two banger performances, not only from Black Hand, but three for kill, right? Also, Crowns that just went for the best third party you could expect from them in the South. I tell you, I was so excited when I saw them get into vehicles and formed up on, um, I believe it was Toxin there who was trying to get the information yep. on that Titan gaming fight. But I feel like we've shown so much light on the on the African teams that we're almost forgetting how much work the European teams did on that Southern edge of the circle. It was a mess. <laughs> it's fair to say. You had, what, Major Pride, you had Gladiators, you had the entirety of Titan, you had Nexus. It was a messy position to fight with, so they tried to make the most out of it. But because of that, a lot of the EU teams died. And when a lot of EU teams die, Africa tends to do a lot better in this PMRC. And I mean, you mentioned Toxin, right? Crowns doing so, mm -hmm. so well, having that anchor point position to set up that third party for the team, not only being top fragger there with five, but also top damage dealer with 771 damage. That's an amazing conversion rate. 
Yeah, and also something else I'd like to point out, and I'm surprised not to even see him on the top damage here. Not Toxin, by the way. I'm talking about Del Hap, because that man actually did put a whole True. lot of work, but this head-to-head -head right here, I feel like he was needed, seeing the way Gladiators played on the south. Yeah, Matic's been just absolutely wrecking people with that Mini-14. I've been loving what he's been doing so far, but unfortunately for them, there was just a lot of teams converging in that same position, especially Major Pride actually doing something. <laughs> <laughs> for the very first time, <laughs> and actually third partying that entire engagement, which made it very hard for Matic and his team of gladiators to just weather the storm. But still, again, a few elimination and a few points here and there, which is always good to see. But I'm going to tell you, Africa has been doing a lot better than what I initially expected entering this PMRC. I don't like how the two of you have become so complementary of one another's regions. I wanted blood, I wanted war, I wanted fights, and now they're all like kumbaya in the corner there, giving each other high fives and cheering each other on. We're going to change that yeah. after the next two maps. I've decided I, I want some sass and salt, but I do want to go back to my original question that I actually wanted to ask after seeing three year angles now, because we'll be moving on and, and this will be forgotten. What did we think of the game plan of these teams coming into a wrangle crowns? I feel like um, they adapted so well to the maps, right? Starting off from the first Arangel game, even though it was a military island finish, that was a little bit rough. But going into the next um, Arangel game, we started to see the teams understand how the rest of the lobby is playing this particular map. And going into this final game of the day, we started to see more, um, you know, earlier rotation or better rotations coming through from them. I mean, we saw SPG and Black Hand take it out all there in um, in um, Yasnaya Poliana, did not fight and decided to just leave quite early. No fight started. And then even Black Hand going to Ross to try the third party that fight was just pretty much nice play that I'm seeing from them. So I'm loving the adaptation so far. We've now said goodbye to Aaron Gull. I'm sure we'll chat more about it as the event continues. But we are going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we get to talk all about what's coming next. And it is Vikendi. spotted we'll go for the challenge nomi does get knocked here dino not quite able to get that handled in time folly we'll be able to find it now with virtus pro out it is full attention towards the final gladiator يرجع لدوكس يضرب أحلام الأيكان ويوقف قوات الرادي سبورت ليؤكدها كوا 77 بالكروزر سلاح الرهيب ما زال يحافظ غازي على الأحلام ولكن دير بالك يا سلام إحنا في أي تيم كانت من غادي مناسبة باش ندين وقدرة بينا مع أي تيم يعني شاركوا في المتابقاء وما تنسوش تعمينا
welcome back. And we are getting ready to go to Bikini, which we're all very excited about. We have to prep our predictions before we come on here. And we're all saying we just don't know what to expect on Vikendi. And because we don't know what to expect, I'm obviously going to throw my analysts under the bus and go, Hey, Crowns, what do you expect from Vikendi? Why me? Why me? <laughs> <laughs> Max is the one that likes Vikendi. But um, I'm expecting randomness coming through from this map. Especially given the fact that this is not one that we really see or we can really put a finger on. We did see a little bit of Vikendi be played in like the um, in the PMPLs where they used it to get extra points. But I don't think that is pretty much enough uh, to have as much information going into the games. Yeah, I feel like it's the map that's been the less prepped potentially by these by these teams and this it's been a tough it's been a long time since we saw it actually being played but looking at the overall rankings crowns you're going to be happy to see black hand breaching into that top two position mm -hmm. so yeah really good it's a nice to see some close competition between europe and africa and sam this is why i keep saying good stuff about africa because the only way i can curse <laughs> a team is if i say good stuff about them so <sighs> that's that's why uh, my 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 golden plan has been has been shared around the world <laughs> To be honest, sure, I feel like you buddy. should. I feel like I feel like that that plan isn't really going too far, as planned it's because not. I mean, <laughs> in, in day one, if you're having the likes of 77k Falcon and Xenon out there on the bottom side of the table, it kind of keeps you on your toes going into the next couple of uh, you know yeah. the next days. It really scares me too because well because of the European. Uh, like analyst of course but it's a good thing for you crowns more specifically i am scared by how quickly these african teams are adapting to this lobby i expected it to take like maybe a day or two but the fact that we're already more than halfway done with day one and we already seen significant improvement for more than half of these african teams is scary for the european prospect as to how this pmrc might wrap up though looking at the stats gladiator still in the lead if we see more stuff like that, and especially not from Black Amber, but from Storm more specifically, uh, we're in for a wild ride here in PMRC. I think for, for me right now, what I do want to say, though, is to, to everyone watching at home in the chat, you've seen the, the scoreboard and, it, and you can get really excited about it. But remember, only day one, six games a day. So what I'd love to say to you is screenshot that scoreboard at the end of today and then compare it to, to Sunday, because I have a funny feeling, I just have a weird little feeling that it's gonna be completely different to what we're looking at now. I, I think we're gonna be in for a surprise. And I think we're gonna be in for some surprises with Vikendi. I'm hoping, Maxman, that we see some teams that maybe haven't had a chance to really shine, that are struggling to find their groove in this lobby. Maybe Vikendi is the thing that they need. Possibly. I, I was, as we said, it's very hard to predict and, and to say what we're going to be expecting going into this one. So it's an opportunity for teams that maybe had a little bit of a rougher start in these first four games to really come in swinging over on the Kenya yeah, make this map their own in some way, shape or form. So, yeah, I, I'm intrigued to see how things are going to be wrapping up. We do see, though, unfortunately, for all of these teams, some, some X factors come into play. One of those being Circles. If you have watched PUBG Mobile Esport, it, like, what, two years ago, you would remember that Vikendi was such a prevalent map in PUBG Mobile Esports competitive at pretty much any level. And at that time, and it's still the same circle settings, the circles can go center, like they can go far over to the coast. It is very, very hard to predict how circles are going to go. So because of that mm -hmm. unpredictability, uh, it makes it really hard to remain consistent on this map. So it's a little bit more of a luck factor in play, in my opinion. Yep, and also the fact that that zone could go completely into the water. That could happen to you. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't that be fun? Let's pull up our predictions now. So everything I said earlier on about expecting a team we haven't seen to pop off and make a name for themselves is thrown out of the water with mine because I just went for most <laughs> consistent. Uh, but let's let's chat a little bit. I mean, the two of you taking some some different options there, Maxman. What's up with that choice? Do you really want to know why I picked Muerte? Like the true, true reason? Do you, do you want I it? I mean, that's why I asked. That's why okay. I asked. Okay, uh, because I think I remember Muerte, which was a completely different team at the time, winning a Vikendi like a year and a half ago. <laughs> the time because you cannot predict on this one. I just don't know what to expect. So Muerte, there, there you go. That's my pick. Right? Yeah, so completely will... different. I mean, Kratzer, I just want to stop there. I just want to get this straight so I have clarity. Completely mm -hmm. different roster. But same team name, so possibly there's a chance. That was the thinking here. Yeah, I think there was like a play or two that was the same, but yeah, pretty much. So like, I did, there's no substance to my point. Uh, just take my big, point and big, roll with it. <laughs> big brain analyst right there. And Crown's obviously your decision. I'm presuming it was based off, we've seen them like look 
a little bit good as we've gone along and they had a really good game in the last one so is that why you made your prediction yes we're seeing that much of an incline coming through from the side of greedy right we're seeing them game one they did a little bit game two they're getting better you can see them just climbing up and i feel like on a map that um, is quite uh, random like vikendi where you know everything anything could happen greedy for kills might just be able to get it down this is the thing though anything can happen so i feel like we could predict till i want to say till till the cows come home but i feel like that's yeah. something my grandmother says so i don't really want to say that anymore but it's been said uh, but but we won't actually know because it is gonna the win conditions on this one are really tough max man yeah it's gonna be a tough one to see we, we know especially the vikendi compared to your mirror mask compared to your wrangles and even your sanok has got a completely different play style and i think that you might agree on this one crowns we mentioned and we talked about it a little bit behind the scenes is that we see Vikendi, it's very compound focused. It's very compound heavy in the sense that late game, you're going to be seeing crashes sent all over the place to try and control the best position at that time in the circle. Mm -hmm. So because of that, late game are going to be a little bit hectic, but I'm sure Blank is going to have a lot of time casting this game because it's back <laughs> to the, uh, what was it called? The Vikendi podcast, I think, where it's just early game, nothing happens, but late game is like a speed run, it seems. Yeah, That's exactly. That's always my, my favorite. Yeah, like I like the speed run at the end, right, Crowns? Yeah, and one thing I really want to see to piggyback off of uh, Max's point there is we will be getting a lot of crashes, right? And yep. ultimately, I'm hoping that most of the crashes will come from the African teams because I'd like to see how well the European teams do on their defense. And I'd also like to see how well the African teams can slam into yep. buildings. But we know the way our African teams play. They will most likely be the ones that will be getting crashed and it will be a test of the African defense. Yeah, I, we talked a lot about the terrain and compounds and what's going to be happening on this map. One thing that we have yet to mention, actually, Crowns, is we got the G36C, one, one of my favorite weapons in all of PUBG Mobile Esports, and we haven't it played here, so I'm really intrigued to see how teams are going to be using this weapon yep. for their own agenda. Yeah, something about the recoil on that gun just makes you feel like you know, like it makes me feel like, like I'm good because whenever I play, whenever <laughs> I play on that weekend map and I use that G36, the recoil is pretty much easier to control. So I'd like to see that one. But and um, given the DBS meta we have right now, I want to see if we can get that good old weekend of SMGs. I mean, Thank we're going to see all of this. And I know if you're watching, you're worrying, you're thinking, is this turning into the Vikendi podcast? We haven't even started the game yet. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. We're getting ready. We're loading up the, the lobby. Jackie has to do some like warm up vocals to get ready for this because he's so excited that, that he has the whole podcast at the start. Blank, of course, is, is trying to prepare him as well. That is everything that is going on. I'm just kidding. It is time to get into it. We are moving to Vikendi right now. And I actually haven't used this line yet. It's my favorite one. Jackie, Blank, where are we dropping, boys? Uh, normally down. Gravity gravity always drags us straight down. I, I no, don't no, know no, why. No, 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 no. Where are we really dropping? Uh, downwards, Blank. I know, Park. <laughs> Actually, I mean, to be fair, if it's there, if that's the option, get me to Dino Park ASAP. Get There's no to... place quite like it, Blank. A range of different dinosaurs. You've got your Stegosaurus. You've got your Platosaurus. You've got the old school classic, the Brontiosaurus. And they're all in one smooth location. Get your tickets now, www.dinopark.com. That's right. Head over there right now. We've even got the meteor that extincted the dinosaurs in Dino we do. Park. Yeah. We do. Uh, we hold it. He's it's a lot quite smaller large. These days. Yeah, it was quite large. We have modified it to be viewable. Yeah, well, you, viewing you that, size. <laughs> that's that's the thing about the atmosphere. Burned quite a lot of that meteor off, didn't it? <laughs> it did, it did. Burned quite a lot of it's that off. It's basically a tennis ball now, but we will charge for you to see it. I'd hope so. Yeah, it's our it's our real money maker. That and the yeah. Brontosaurus, as you were saying. Um Money makers in this <laughs> game though as well. <laughs> Definitely some of these African squads. They're doing real good so far. You know, Max was saying he was saying, like, look, they have surprised me. As is that so this is so that's a Vikendi circle right there. Um, if you are at all familiar with PUBG Mobile, you are a PUBG Mobile enjoyer, you will know that these are the circles we see quite frequently. We've cut off basically 80% of the map already. We hate it, but it's Wikendi. Okay, I'm sorry. A weekend at Wikendi. A weekend at Wikendi. 
and it probably will be less than a weekend. It's probably going to be a Saturday at Wakendi because this game is probably going to be over very quickly because we're heading up to Winery. This is not an ideal spot to be in, especially if they push up towards this position. The fact that no... Oh, bloody hell. That, that soda's really got me going there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you put, I'm surprised no one's headed up to Winery this early on. You know, it's a great high ground position to play in. You know... You got Rook and Major Pride. I think Major Pride's heading across there right now. It looks like it. It does seem like it. They're getting a move on, trying to get themselves ahead of the curve, a little bit ahead of time. But at least it's a nice change of scenery as well to ease you into. You get a whole different kettle of fish in this one, Blank. You see the different vehicles, the different scenic views, and that nice, crisp sound, almost ASMR-esque, when you take each step on these lovely snowy hills. Look, it's the, the wind as well that really gets me going on this map. Oh, strong wind, it. yeah. Ooh, Howling. Strong wind. Not ah. whistling, but rushing through the trees. Beautiful. Just beautiful. If you've not played Wakendi yet, get yourself a weekend at Wakendi. You Damn. will thank us. Now, the only thing that I will say is a little bit of a Debbie Downer here is the fact that, look, Winery mm -hmm. is not very snowy, <laughs> so although we come to Vikendi for the snow, we're not likely to get a lot of it. Unfortunately, Clear Vision has to catch these snowballs as Senke has just sent an absolute barrage their way. He has indeed. Senke more so imitating the weather here as he shows us what it looks like when bullets rain down like bits of snow outside. Little snowflakes falling, but they're quite painful. It's clear vision. They're really going to have a bit of a rough time of it on this one. Quick rotate as they're able to get their move on at least and try and pick up the boys as they arrive in position. Really rough on the timing for one of them though, so he's going to be waving goodbye already just as they arrive. A bit frustrating for clear vision. Vision. They've had some chances over the past few games that we've seen from them, but this feels like by far the most unlucky start they've had. Yeah, I mean, I didn't expect a lot from Clear Vision. It was nice to see Pocus in the roster as well. Uh, the guy used to be on Giants back in the day, 2022, came second place on that team. Uh, since then, a lot of that roster has been flitting from one place to the next. Pocus seems to have found himself a home here on Clear Vision, uh, and he's trying his best, trying his darndest right now. Carry Boy moves in with the DPS, takes some shots. Pocus just about gets up those stairs as quick as possible. Padding away. Oh, this is nice, though, from Carry Boy. The lineups that he's working with, you can see that he was able to do some trigonometry on this one. Definitely got a college degree when it comes to lining up some of these nades, bouncing it in through the windows and trying to make it so much more awkward for you to actually hold any of this compound. And it's effectively fully compromised already. Carry boys walking on in and clearing out the lower levels. You've got the backup outside as well by the other boy in the server. Lazy boy himself will be looking for you to come running out through the back door and be able to close the gap effectively. Just a bit of a tripwire. Doesn't really seem like there'll be much of a getaway plan here at all for Clear Vision. They have no easy way of surviving this. I mean, Lazy Boy taking the Lazy Pound right now was Pocus is running up and down those stairs, getting himself in a right workout at the moment. Titan will find one player there from Root. Pusher goes down, and we're back on board with the boys. The boys themselves. It's good, actually. Uh, imagine if they made a roster move and you had Lazy Boy, Carry Boy, and Old Boy all in one and go. Micro Boy as well from previously BTR. You'd have the boy squad. <laughs> yeah, I mean... God. At that point, they'd probably be picked up for a television show, I'd imagine. <laughs> Reality TV. Yes, please. I would love <laughs> to see that. Carry Boy moves in, just still peeking around the corner. They're a bit, a bit trepidatious about this push so far. Pocus right now with the MP5K. Does a good amount of work. Won't quite go for the shots just yet. AKM as well, still in hand, but that thing kicks hard on the mule. So does not want to use that in a pinch, whereas the submachine gun does a lot more work. Goodness me, through the windows, the shells appear. You know, it only gets fragments of glass in the eyes, but a couple of slugs too. 
The timing on this is really quite rough as well. The repeak actually goes slightly better. And now he's just spamming into it. But the problem is the utility will find its way through the threshold of the door. And that is clear vision gone in the blink of an eye. A lot of damage, but not really a position to actually stand strong on that one. They're finished off in the end with the compound. Now exchanging hands as it seems like Marshall is the new landlord. We're looking over towards Mad Bulls. We'll be looking this direction for the time being. Won't quite go for it just yet, though. As Max was just telling as well, you know, for that, for our little boy band, we could also have Power Boy as a sub. Oh, that'd Mainly be good. playing as a substitute because he's got his modeling career to focus on as well as, so probably couldn't play full time on the team. I mean, it's hard, man. If you're juggling modeling and being part of a boy band, I don't know how you're going to be able to pull it off. Surely you've got to prioritize one or the other, you know? You're not getting eight hours sleep, man. I'm telling you no, that now. No, no. Four at most. <laughs> It'll do the trick. <laughs> you must sacrifice. Exactly. Lifestyle. If you want to be in the boy band, limited sleep. But he's always got a smile on his face. Yeah, he's happy to be part of boy squad. <laughs> God, I can imagine it'll happen, honestly. I feel like somehow it's one of those. We've said it enough now that it will manifest into existence. It will come into existence. In the meantime, we're looking at Demuerte, who obviously, as Max said, you know, they won yeah. once before, uh, back in the day. And by, you know, just taking the whiteboard out and me doing a couple of calculations on the side, you know, I've actually worked out the way that he's figured that out with a couple of spider di diagrams thrown in there as well, is that Demuerte should win this game. Right now, they're on for a, a right nice little rotation as well, down on that south side, moving up towards the backside of Winery. And they have a lot of control on that side too. So, you know, Maxman might have cracked the code before I even could do all of those little bits of acrobatics and mathematics to make this one happen in the first place. Well, I've got a bit of an orb in front of me here that I'm using to peer just slightly into the future. Not cheating too much to get an idea ahead of how this show is going to go. But it screams to me that Max, well, he's been able to deliver a hell of a prediction. That's all I'll say. So let's see if Demuerte can continue to slay later on over the course of this one. Current commotion that we're watching, though, is the utility that's being bombarded down onto Black Hand. Of course, currently wearing the crown from the previous matchup we just saw at the minute it's damage that's being established being able to peer across and consistently spam into mad balls making their getaway far harder and even going far enough to get a knock off and limit their squad down to three players at this point they're looking a little bit timid to actually go for the rotation over to try and get him back on his feet as well knowing just how many angles they were taking shots from yeah, they're going to struggle now. Obviously, we are moving further down towards Winery, so my original prediction of a Winery finish is coming true here. And again, it's all uphill from here, Jackie. Very, very difficult, quite literally. So having those vehicles on board will be very, very good for yourself. You don't want to have those vehicles get their wheels shot out, and there's not a lot of compounds to send up to here. And that is one of the main fixtures of Vikendi itself, is a lot of that compound play. But we're not going to see too much of that going forward. You see teams just dueling it out alongside the countryside of Lukendi. A quiet countryside, but a map that certainly follows suit when it comes to having V in the name, as it can be incredibly vicious. Normally, quite aggressive from start to finish, and already we've seen some telltale signs of that. At the minute, switching over to the map view as well, you can just see, in terms of the spacing, how on top of each other everyone is, even quite early into this one. This is why we were teasing the idea that it would be over relatively quickly, just because the pace is ramped up tenfold compared to what we've had over the course of the day. You are forced to basically scrap your way through every other team and really try and put your foot down to control any compound. Looking at that, you can see Octavian here. Utility in the back pocket, Two frags remaining, Beautiful. launches out the first, and that's a clean connection with it. Will the second do the same job? Looks to get it over the side. Will that be good enough? Does. In fact, scrapes the sheeper, sends him away. But it'll only tickle the chin there. Won't fully go for the knockout. Octavian looks to 
bring Dorin back into the engagement. But Sashif has got a nade of his own. And it oh. does a lot of damage as Dorin heads back inside. Luckily, there is that off angle coming through from the Warlord. Kapahala along the way. Does take down Sashif and now reflect just off in the distance. This is all the way out in the blue, Jackie. Again, another slow rotate coming through from Nexus. It's crazy. This is the play style. We've seen them effectively be running round in, round out. We were saying we need to see their confidence return. You're thinking maybe Octavian with some of the pace he was able to deploy with the utility that would get them back into it. Here at least, saved by the bell as the cleanup does come through and they're able to start moving again. But you've got to get yourself out of that blue and that's going to be guarded. That's the problem that you're looking at here. Just playing on the angle and scouting for information effectively with the POV that he's got to work with. Uh, and that's just going to give Falcons a good chunk of info to work with. The full squad's alive as well. For Nexus, you can't afford to go for the quickest possible route in terms of your rotate. you got to keep space. You know you're on the back foot at this point. It's their place, oh, blank, but it just doesn't look comfortable today. It really doesn't, no. Like, it, it feels like they're wandering through caltrops, but just to see of them at this point in time. So they're struggling at the moment to make their way through. At least Kapahala's found himself a, a safe-ish rotation into the circle. The blue is closing, though, and most likely will have to move at some point. Marshall, the landlord, evicted himself from the compound. Did have to get along the way as soon as possible. Titans playing down towards that south edge of the map very much on the low ground right now but falcons are just picking apart teams here and there everywhere and they've got a lot of confidence you can see that with how they're willing to play so individualistic whilst also still coming quite nicely working together as a unit overall marshall here like you said evicted from his house and now fully removed overall tons of damage for xenon five eliminations but finishing far too early in the grand scheme of things here to contend for that chicken dinner as we wave goodbye to them and this still further doubles down our point about falcons being really good in their current position if they can keep this sort of pace up i think this shows a good form from them that could lead them into a position to maybe get that big victory on vikendi yeah, their main point of interest right now would be to perhaps move towards that western side, try and control over towards Abbey whilst the blue isn't moving in just yet. They could try and take that third party over towards Mad Balls and find themselves a nice cheeky position on the high ground, looking down towards Black Hand as well as Gladiators are currently embroiled themselves in an engagement of their own. I'll see what they can do about this in the meantime, though. Falcons were working together very well as a unit. I think that type of play at the beginning of the game gives you a lot of confidence for the rest of this one running out. Had some good reads. Not overly aggressive, but knowing when they're comfortable to take fights, it's been nice to see. And that's the sort of conversation we can mirror for Black Hand. Good decision making. Here you can see them slightly further back. And this is actually a nice angle, setting up the perspective of just how many teams are in close proximity to one another. And like you were saying, with this map of Vikendi having so much hype to it in terms of that constantly increasing level of verticality with the hills, the higher you get up, the more of an edge you have with that high ground to rain damage down and with the spacing we've got from a few of these teams it's giving gladiators a good position to chip away at mad balls and really fragment them Ooh. toluca thought he had pulled a fast one but he's been seen and spanked and again this is what we talk about a lot jackie in the sense that julica Bit of a loose cannon, got away from the rest of the team. Sometimes he pulls off some the latest and greatest plays, but this time around, he was just an old record that was scratched as Kitsune takes some nice shots towards him. And he won't be playing any beautiful tunes anytime soon. It's unfortunate. Tilek up. The guy is absolutely unchained at times. He can win and lose your games off his own back, but at this point, it feels like it might be a loss for Mad Bulls unless something can change. If they can start seeing red, if Frozen can leave the rest of them down on their last legs, has utility to work with on the turn round the corner. Nice damage, fully hard committing to this one as well. They've got the height and the close range engagement to work with. Oof, but this is rough contact from the top of the hill. Again, puts pressure on them. Fleek has to back off the play with his teammates. You've got to reset on this one. Far too low on HP. 
Yeah, that's a gorgeous play coming through from Zerich, though. We talked about this guy being the master of off angles, and certainly he was playing to his namesake there on the side, keeping the rest of his team very safe as Gladiators are about to descend upon them with the claws. Really good stuff. Molotov through the door. Should take out that player from Falcons White. Removing him from the game. But in the meantime, we get a nasty shift down towards the southwest side. The team that's down there, none other than Titans, who's been hugging this coast for a long time, making it their best friend. A circle starting to close in. Pressure mounting. Gladiators losing their positional advantage as well. Uh, and now the pressure really does turn more so on what your decision making is. It seems like Falcons as well. They've tried to come home to roost on this one. Sprinting out, realizing he's got to take the initiative. But it doesn't work out. Shut down finally as he's finished off. Gladiators trying to build back into this one as well. Denying that rotation from Blackhand. And trying to stop them from getting out like bandits. They wanted to kick off the fight, grab the vehicle, and then make their way out. Instead, they've taken a ton of damage. It slowed the rotate and left them in a bad spot. I mean, Matic's been on an absolute godly run today. Some really good players all over the place, smiting the players as they get close towards the rest of his team. Yes, he's made some interesting plays too, but overall, I think he's kept his team in check, and I think that this is very much Matic trying to get the team to have some more confidence in him, because he has tried to make these crazy plays before in the past tournaments. They've not worked out too well, but he keeps telling them, I can do this, I can do this, I need to get a little bit better. And it's time to come into play here, so you can tell that he's been practicing in the background making sure he can pull off those off angles making sure he can protect the team and gladiators right now they're super happy to have him on the side as black hand is left in the dust and it's a fantastic storyline to build from as well because you look at that whole roster now you've got the big brains of the operation with kitsune if you've got matic and meku both playing well and then tixie just being that kind of glue of the team keeping the energy high they could really go from strength to strength again here you're looking at the high ground engagement Ooh. kicks off oh, nice clean up from the angles they found waving goodbye to nexus but they might be left with a frown from the distance you can see they're now stuck into a bit of an engagement potentially bigger than they wanted to take a bite out of as we're seeing trades all over the place and Blackhand do not have a chance to keep their legacy going. But Jackie, you were pondering your furious orb earlier on that was screaming at you that didn't work today. They've got this in the bag. And look at this right now. They're in their extreme location off on the side of the map on the east as the circle shifts their way. They do have to dismount Major Pride, though. And Major Pride, they've tried to have the resurgence during this PMRC, but we're still seeing those flickers of inconsistency from this team. It needs to change, but from this sort of position, from this sort of compound, Major Pride should have the this game in the back you'd think so and it'd be a great way for them to display some of that skill ceiling that we've spoken about that we know historically these players have had it's a game where you've really got to bring your strong suit so we'll see what they can do if they've got the boots strapped on the longer this one goes on but i do like the way you set the stage like max did a long time ago with Dimuerte down towards the coast, not trying to get too aggressive, still playing that classic play style. And it's forcing Gladiators to invest quite a lot of ammunition to attempt to do some chip damage that's really coming up nothing. The biggest storyline right now, though, is 77k, greedy for kills, Rook, the world of battle. All our African teams right now on the outer edges in danger as all these European teams look for a better position in the circle. Tixie's got to be super careful as SPG sends some shots their way. Just about gets into a good position. And Matic closes the door, slams it behind them, keeping the enemies out. One door closes, another opens, though. Interesting to see that the world of battle, they're still alive and kicking at this point. It might really be one man, but they've really struggled over the course of the day. At least they're still present here on Vikendi, but not for long. Oh, God, I've cursed it blank. You Say are. goodbye. Straight to the dome as well <laughs> with that DVS. That is unfortunate. Mad Bulls, though, coming in hot with the nades. Matic, last one remaining. Will he step out? Will he take some shots? I think he's just behind, actually, this shack at the moment, which puts him...
Oh, Demuerte, they're here to play, and right now they're dealing damage. It's got to be decisive, and the problem is the pressure's being applied. All of their numbers are dropping. You're just looking at Diana in such an uncomfortable position. It's up against the old boy as well. Great timing on the mechanics. Hits the deck instantly. Forces Diana to make a decisive decision. Do I go for the revive? Do I try and get my teammates back into this, or just bail out? You've got no good angles to work with. Demuerte, they might not be left standing for very long with how this is going, and look at the spacing. Mad balls. Demuerte. You've got everyone in such a close proximity. You've got Titan with just one player in Old Boy left standing. 77k from a distance trying to get involved with the action as well as the spray comes through. Oh, it's hectic, Blank. Man, it's the worst guy to leave up from Titan as well as Old Boy. And Tamuerte can't be calm just yet until they remove this, remove this thorn in their side. A major pride with this circle. It should be a major pride win. If they lose this game, it will be one of the biggest blunders in PUBG Mobile we have seen in quite some time. Look at that though, Naomi hits some nasty shots over towards Demuerte. And that's a Demuerte that had somehow been able to recover from the awful position they were forced into. At this point, though, you can see it. The herd's been thinned. The damage is done. 77k trying to make plays wherever possible. Effectively just getting stuck in whilst focus is put onto a different team. The ideal third-party action with Mad Balls taking a lot of the attention. But they're also taking names. Wide swing on the corner. Beautiful peek from Fleek. And that's another one where he's tidied up effect right now takes down diana was crawling over towards corker luckily furia for Tamuerte is in the circle itself they're praying for an eastern shift on the circle oh. here right now though a9q is doing a huge amount of work all on his lonesome versus spg one of the players goes to the peak he gets to the tree tries to send some shots backwards towards him but he's already in the building this is disastrous for snowix he has to get outside and already a9Q is holding the windows. He drops out the backside. Will he spot him in time? No, the DBS will do the dirty. Oh, he had a good understanding of how to play that one. But the problem in, he was just swung upon and dispatched. Furia, though, in a great position. SPG, they're taken out by the blue. That's enough to finish their run off. Mad Bulls, they're down and out. Stuck in the smoke. About to be left broke. Oh, boy. Furia from a distance dealing damage. But where is old boy popped up from? Man's on a hill, miles away, but doing things that will make you feel ill. That's ridiculous. Rook's going to move forward. It's just Rami left remaining. There's not a lot of teams that can hold Major Pride at bay. Effect moves on the outside. They've been effectively given a free game here. But again, old boy still up. To Muerte out. Third place, though. Oh, sorry. Fourth place. Still good result for them, Max. I think you've willed them to a strong finish here. Old boy, he spotted. They know. They see the little ticks in the markers. A major prior with the amount of utility they've been able to hold on to from being in this building for so long. This should just be a free game. And I said that Africa wasn't doing very well, but it looks like Rami has made his way to a second place. A nice second that you'll be happy with. Finishes this one off nice and hot. Warms up that chicken dinner for major prides that have finally been able to lock it down. So no Demuerte victory. We've changed universes. We've broken into a different timeline. And it's one that focuses on the pride themselves, Blank. Again, though, we have to respect Major Pride because they were the, one of the first teams to identify that this is one of the best positions in the map to move over towards, headed towards the east, and they just took that spot. It was really, really well done, holding on that south side. Uh, beautiful stuff from Major Pride. They deserved the win. They needed that win. They did, they did. That's like the critical thing to take away, right? Is you had to get some point somewhere. In terms of sort of overall predictions, you're expecting them to at least do a lot better. You know, in Europe, one of the top contenders at times. At the minute, it felt like they didn't really have that pizzazz they normally show up with today, Blank. So, I mean, it's a little bit late in the day, but hey, it's a victory. You can't take that away from them. You absolutely cannot. But in the meantime, one victory that we absolutely have to take away is Max. Sorry, you didn't get your prediction right, but you were very, very close. But we'll send it back over to the desk now and they'll cover that game. We all know predictions don't matter until you get them right or close to right. So Max's prediction got, got pretty close, but I think everyone forgot that my prediction got the closest. Just putting it out there. Rook Esports finishing in second. Just saying. It's not about me, but right now it is very much about me. Who? Uh, 
Oh, Max, Asked. don't be cheeky. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I was a bit mean. I apologize. But hey, wow. they, they, did, wow. they did make it pretty far. Okay, I'm trying to be nice now. They did make it pretty far. Uh, they try and go himself a few points, though. If I had to go on a, a more serious topic this time around, uh, Crowns, looking at Titan, they had such a good split, Sal. And they had to go for a gamble pretty early on in this game, right? They had two compounds mm -hmm. on the control. They're like, do we go to the compound to the west? Do we go to the compound to the east? And they went to the west, and unfortunately, the circle went east. And because of the scouting initially done by Major Pride, they were able to scout that compound and pretty much send it instantly in that game-winning mm -hmm. position. Yep, and that was something I was actually skeptical about my, uh, Major Pride, seeing the way they started the game. I saw that they were on the, on the shorelines before, holding such good position. Then they left to go get a little bit more Elims, and then that split that they did hold did get them more information on that compound, and they were able to hold it, which ultimately played out for them in the end. It was a good one for them and obviously Major Pride taking the win. But I do think that there was a couple of teams that we need to pay attention to because they have been consistently placing relatively high up. Which obviously, this is a long-term competition. Those placement points are going to matter down the line. And I think by now, Crowns, we can start saying, right, these are the few teams that, especially today at least, are, are teams that you need to be watching because they seem to be hungry to finish at the top of that leaderboard. Yeah, exactly. And one of those teams will be decided of rookie sports. They've been so consistent today in terms of placement that I'm actually very, very impressed with the way they've been playing so far. I was going to say the same about Claire Vision, but it did go out quite early here in Vikendi, which was uh, quite sad to see. But thankfully, Rookie Sports still holding it up, and uh, yeah. Vikendi, maybe not just the map for Africa. And it's even scarier. We mentioned it even before this game, that Rookie Sport are starting to be a little bit more aggressive, starting to tune things up to the next level, turning it up to 11. And they, they're currently on the path to success, which is going to be hard to slow down if they just keep being relentless day after day after day. Though, Unfortunately, one-off angle was a little bit tough for them to deal with, especially Morteza of 77k esports. That did slow down their approach, but they did make the most out of a bad situation with the West being in a tough position to maneuver your way through. And no fight's actually over here, 77k again taking a fight, and A9Q, it was able to just keep the hope alive for his team versus SPG for so damn long, but it didn't go the full distance, unfortunately. Yeah, and that is something that we wanted to see just going into the into the Vikendi game. The fact that we already said we wanted to see teams crashing against each other. And seeing that, uh, you know, the side of 77k were able to hold that defense or that attack against the side of SPG was just nice to see. So now, of course, on your, your screens right now is how that game played out. Mm. Another team that I think we need to keep our eyes on, Max, is definitely Titan Gaming because they're being pretty consistent as well throughout the day. Yeah, very flamboyant when they get themselves these big finishing matches. And here's seven points on the board. Definitely not a bad game. Not an amazing game, but not a bad game. And if you can have seven-point games be your worst performances in the day, then you're having an amazing day, I think it's fair to say, Sam. But they, they actually had a nice rotation south. Unfortunately, as we said, they weren't lucky and didn't pick the best compound that could have been a game-winning compound if they did remain on where Rob's was at the time. But them sending it, I don't know if you would agree, actually, Crowns, on this, but them sending mm -hmm. it towards De Muerte, it wasn't successful, unfortunately, but I feel like that was the best way to be in a position to potentially contest a chicken dinner away from um, Major Pride if you do win it. But as we saw, it didn't quite happen. Yeah, the defense coming through from the side of Dimwati was absolutely wonderful. I mean, see how the uh, see how uh, I believe it was Diana was holding down against Old Boy there on the south, and that was very wonderful to see from him. Like holding that beautiful position, trying to keep that defense strong is something that I enjoyed from the side of Dimwati. And in as much as Titan gaming were fragging out and playing well, it just wasn't strong enough for that Dimwati defense. So we've spoken a lot about the squads, and, and this is, we've, we've seen all the individual analysis come up after each test, but I haven't actually spoken to you about this, so I think I'm going to jump right in right now. Crowns, who has been the standout player for you so far? He's going to say Storm. Uh, no, I'm not going to say Storm, oh. and uh, I wouldn't count out Storm's, um, Storm's uh, contribution or participation today just because of this last game, but from the Africa side, thing it's kind of hard to place my hard on, hand on it i really want to say rami from the side of rookie sports because i really enjoyed the way he's played so far being the last man up most of the time for the team actually did also um has been lifting that team to good um you know placement points up on the board so i think i would point out rami for the time being how about you max uh if i had to pick an eu player because apparently you can only pick players from our region uh crowds but <laughs> I, i'm gonna go with matic <laughs> 
Uh, I think he's been just such a, a pivotal player for his team, especially playing that long-range DMR kind of weaponry, especially the Mini-14. has been really successful so far, so I I'm happy with what Gladiators have done on the first day, which is insane. On the first day, they're doing good. This doesn't happen very often, so keep it up, lads. Hello PUBG Mobile fans, this is Alan Walker. The airdrop kernel is now in full swing and I hope you're ready to dive into the most incredible event yet. Make sure to grab your own airdrop crate and don't forget to unlock the epic Land of the Heroes theme song and the Walker series in-game. I can't wait to see you all at the PUBG Mobile airdrop carnival. Tixie picks it up. There is Nox sent back their way, but only automatic.
Welcome back to the PUBG Mobile Regional Clash, Europe versus Africa. We have four days of competition and day one is almost done, but not until all of our squads head on over to Miramar. And I'm quite excited about this one. I think it's going to be really interesting to really wrap up the day and see how everyone performs. Crowns, what are your feelings about Miramar? I like the fact that we're closing out on Miramar. Started on Sandhawk, which was quite chaotic, and now we're going to be closing things off on Miramar. I think it gives the teams a little bit of a break from all that has just happened out there in Vikendi. Let's talk about the know. regional battle, though, Crowns. I mean, who do you think this benefits the most? Is it Europe or Africa that's going to benefit from this particular map? Um, from this particular map, definitely, definitely. I was going to say definitely Europe, but nope. Definitely Africa. I mean, Titan Gaming, G4K, Black Hand. These, I said Titan, sorry. Ah, uh, Falcon White, wow. Black Hand, and Greedy for Kills. These are three teams that I'm very confident on when it comes yeah. to the map of Miramar. I, I agree, especially with the, the White Falcons uh, team. They, they're going to be doing really, really good usually. I mean, we saw what this team could do back in PMRC more specifically. Uh, though, looking at the leaderboard, Europe is still ahead, Crowns, and that's all that matters to me. Though, that it's not by a significant margin, like the gap could be closed right after this Miramar. And actually, Sam, mm -hmm. one thing I wanted to bring up that's really important is that normally Miramar is on the similar level to Orangle, a map that is played countless, countless times in every single event. And it is really rare when you see Miramar being taken a little, uh, kind of a step back compared to Orangle. The Orangle is played three times and only one Miramar it's mm -hmm. really odd, so we're not going to be able to see teams make those big iterations on Miramar as we usually do. You've got one shot at glory on this map per day, so you better make it count. I kind of like that, though, that we've shaken things up a little bit, because I think to, to see a true regional champion, you've got to you've got to shake it up, because ultimately, Max, and that's going to allow them a, a chance to, to flex their muscles on every map and show that they're strong in PUBG Mobile across the board. Exactly. It's really important, especially when we're in, like, it feels this transition period in PUBG Mobile Esports where we are bringing more maps into the pool. Mainly, we are looking this time at Vikendi. Are we going to be having Vikendi make a big comeback in, in your PMPLs on a daily basis? And we're going to have that potentially bleed into championships and, and PMGC potentially later on in the year. So, no, Vikendi is really important, but Miramar, is that one going to have less impact? If so, I know a lot of teams are going to be a little bit saddened by that because they were so, so good on the map, but it might occupy a smaller uh a spot let's say in the format in the future we're going to pull up our predictions and while we do that i have a follow-up question to what you just said which teams gladiators can't go wrong with that one why and because <laughs> if, I had, if i had to go really a little bit deep on it uh we know that this is a team that usually is really really strong when it comes to playing miramar they love their 2-2 split up north and they'd like to make those strong plays with strong basis based strong basis based with with a lot of information <laughs> gathered early on so you can do the best play imaginable at the time so gladiators yeah. they're looking good on this map so they, they seem like a, a no-brainer to predict it yeah but go. then i'm gonna i was i was about to just before i put in my prediction i was gonna tell max that his prediction right now right and i like the fact that he pointed out from the north because we see gladiators land on the north but guess who else lands on the north black hand and rookie sports so i feel like those two will probably give gladiators a run for their money and who are you predicting though crowns who do you think will take this map i'm going for falcon white it just has to be there there's something about them and miramar that just clicks and also given the fact that we can already start to see um falcon white get into or tap into that falcon white little by little we started to see axer put in a yep. little bit of damage and a little bit of work from that weekend game so i feel like this miramar being one of their most comfortable maps they will be able to bring up a good performance and I'm going to repeat my point. Do not give them an MG3. If, if they get a hold of that weapon and they give it the six, I'm going to have flashbacks of PMRC. So uh, just you've got to be careful. If they loot up the right stuff and get in a strong position, Sam, we can see a massive Falcons white chicken dinner. My prediction is Titan Gaming, just because I think they've been quite consistent. And I feel like I keep saying this about them. They're knocking at that door. They're waiting. Uh, but we'll have to we'll have to wait and see as well. Overall, though, so far, gents. I mean, Max, we'll start with you. Very quickly, being happy with the level of PUBG Mobile we've been seeing? I've been loving it. It's been great to see this Clash of Regions. I, this entire format is something that we didn't see in the past, and the Clash of Regions and Metas is always so interesting to see unfold, and we've seen big changes game to game, so I'm having a blast on this first day. For the last time on our first day, let's head into game. We are going to Miramar with Blank and Jackie.
Oh, here we are, strapped in one final time. I hope everyone out there watching the broadcast has a seat belt for their chair, because you're going to need to lock in for this one, Blank. Did you do a lock-in sound effect? Because I, I think did, yeah. we need to do that again. Hang on. There that we go. Like, we're in. Oh, we're that in. like a little. That was nice. Yeah, that's one of those like double security locks as well. Because you seriously need to be strapped in here because the terrain is messy. The terrain is rough, and if you are not strapped in that buggy, you're likely to fall out, get popped out, get shot out. All the things could happen to you here. So you got to be careful on your rotates. That is the name of the game here. It's a big map, and big rotations will be required for these teams to succeed. Right now, we're neck and neck between Africa as well as the European region in terms of those regional points my dude okay at the end of the day that's what it's all about it's the clash between europe as well as africa and also a little bit about who wins it at the end of the day but just a little bit mainly the clash the clash <laughs> not the crunch not the crunch they know the nothing clash. of the crunch it's all about the clash but look that's the, that's the thing we're going to tell you all about the clash we're not going to keep any secrets from you we're going to let you know exactly what's going down. And look, a little recap of today. So far, we've had some African mm. teams absolutely popping off at the start of things. Then we had the big Gladiators win into the Titan win. And then we brought it back just a little bit, right? Uh, went back to over Black Hand taking the win again. Yeah. So it feels like Rook and Black Hand, Titan, Gladiators. These are big boys in the matchup. But we just came off Vikendi with major pride. they will take themselves a win, albeit on Vikendi, if you've got that compound, you get the win. Right now, though, it's Titan versus Alpha. Mm, a clash of two big names, large in stature, a Goliath and an even bigger Goliath, making them both look equal sized, it seems, at a point like this in terms of the weaponry and position that they have available to play with. We'll see how this one develops, because I know a single man on Titan by the name of Old Boy, he's basically just been taking all the 1v4 scraps he can the whole damn day, Blank. It's, it's really felt like Old Boy has basically been taking this tournament as a chance to show, here's what you're missing, not having me in the region. Yeah, he's got the wisdom of an old boy, but he's got the physicality of a young man. This guy strikes where it matters most at the end of the day. And even in that last game where Demuerto would take down the majority of Titan, they forgot about old boy. And he mm -hmm. came in from that side swipe, got a really long shot over towards that shot because they would take down Fury. And there, it was just curtains for the team. They could not uh, re-stabilize from that position. So at the end of the day, you always got to watch out for him right now. He's on his belly, he's lying down, but it's in wait, because this guy is a predator. He is waiting to strike, count, aggress, if you will. I'm sure there's some other descriptive words that would give us a rough inkling of what he's going to get up to when he gets contact. For the meantime, though, a bit of an early warning system, just keep himself out of trouble. And his whole roster can really deliver some incredible blows. You know, you're looking at Rob's as well. A man for me that stole my heart quite some time ago with some of his clutching capabilities, always being able to show up even in horrendous situations where he's outnumbered, outgunned, you name it, he's been through it. But this has really been quite an effective stalemate. You look at the high ground, at least, for Alpha. They've created a bit of space for themselves and given themselves a few better angles to play with. But when it comes to actually instigating this one, it depends if Reflex can find a position where he can actually actually get enough chip damage out for them to half commit to the engagement. And that's if he even realizes positionally how fragmented Titan are playing this one. Yeah, just a pistol and a shotgun right now for old boy, though. So that's he's going to have to needs. wait until the close range. That is all you need sometimes. It really is. Look, the thing is, though, you know, the man that captivated your hearts, Robs. Do you yeah. know what's nice about it right now? It's nice to see Robs not be the best player on the team. Because this guy <laughs> was working his butt off over on uh, SBG and Game Lord to really take that team to greater heights. And the fact that now he's overshadowed by some of these other players on the team, I think that's a good thing. He has a lot to learn, and this is a great space for him to do it. No, yeah, I... Oh. I mean, he might not even be standing. I mean, like, we're making some good points about Robs, but I feel like he's being robbed at this point. Although, this has caused a bit of an opening for Icy to re-aggress on that one. So Reflex couldn't bounce those bullets back and live up to his name, could he? Taking a bit of damage there. But I like where you were going with that. You know, we've got a bit of time here. The initial fight's calmed down. 
I feel like you're right. You know, Robs is now in a roster where even if he's not the big dog, he's not the one that's having to pull out those ridiculous clutches. That bodes well. If he's falling a little bit further down, the longer he has to mold and gel with the rest of these players, I think that's the longevity of this team that you're looking at. You know, this isn't the team you've slapped together and you're expecting to have a few early performances. This is a roster that could go far long term. Good optics on it. Yeah, you're right. This is no unicorns of love at the end of the day. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is some shade, actually. That I'm is sorry. quite a bit of shade. I'm yeah, sorry, the sun's I'm sorry, gone. I'm sorry. I love that team uh, to death, but anyway, and you're not wrong. Moving yeah. on, <laughs> Man, you're not wrong. <laughs> you're uh, not wrong. Mad Bulls uh, down towards Los Leones and Gladiators down in that region as well. We do get the circle head up towards that northern side. We're going to take quick stock of the map now. It's still on your screen, guys. Obviously, Black Hand in a decent position, actually holding a lot of area right now. They've got Mazzaro down towards that south side, just holding down on San Martin around SBG themselves with Narvalo. Scouting quite far out, so Mazzaro might not be able to pop up, hit some tasty little shots, but Havlik does go down to Zashipa with the DBS. So there we go. Another engagement found. And with Havlik. Him a smoke. That's nice. Yeah, that was quite polite of him, actually. Dash a little smoke across, give him a position to play around. Thing is, there's not really much room of a hard commit onto this one as well. Like you were saying earlier, old boys Arsenal is just not really in a position to do enough damage. You know, you've got the pistol, you've got the shotgun, but even then, what's that going to be? A few tags before they clock onto your position, then realize, okay, let's just take the fight to him. So you're so isolated and they're just using Havlik as a bit of a bait, right? He's kind of like the worm on the end of the hook and you're hoping that you can reel in the rest of the Titans, but they didn't seem to be biting. It's got to be my least favorite backpack in the game, man. It's like strapping a disco ball to your back. It, it's, it's reflecting all the light. And Miramar is a sunny place too, so I'm sorry for everyone at home that has to experience that orb in his backpack, which is causing some light shows. So See, what you don't know, right. though, Blank, that oh, is God. actually the divine orb that Max keeps in his uh, his back pocket hidden away. That's how he's so good at the predictions. That, that orb really? right there. Yeah, that's how he does it. It's magic. Go does he go in after the aftermath and just scavenge it for divine orbs? Yeah, he does. He collects them, he puts them together, it just keeps getting bigger and more mythical and mystical. Uh, probably other M's as well. Yeah, just looking for that mythical Zoan orb. That's what he wants at the end of the day. Titan, though, old boy, still just hanging on. He knows he can't do much of anything. You've already touched upon it as well, Jackie. So we will catch back in with these guys later on. In the meantime, let's take a quick check over towards Dimuerte moving in from the western side. Seems to be actually having pretty good performance so far. So, yes, they did remove a couple of players from their side. You know, Fleeke obviously went from this team earlier on over towards Maples and been found success there. One of their better players but they've reformed the roster, restructured it. Uh, and I think this is actually a decent team to play around with. I don't think there's any major weak spots on their side. I wouldn't say there's any major strong spots either. Um, but this is the kind of playground at PMRC where you can find that star power. You really can rise to the top if you so want to. At the moment, 77k moving through one of these dangerous positions on the map, which can be a little bit isolated. If you get caught off by the players in the warehouses, you've got to be careful about that. Robs moves in, looks to pick up Icy. As the rest of... Alpha will have to move soon, Jackie, as we do see that circle head up towards the northwest side. Dude, this is a circle and a half as well. So much high ground to play around with here. Yeah, this is actually boding to be uh, potentially a very interesting battlefield that we have ahead of us. When you look at the map geometry we have available and just the sheer spacing of how many teams have already pushed into that inner circle. A lot of them there quite quickly. Obviously down towards the bottom as well, you can see there is a bit of a scrap that could potentially occur down towards the blue with Falcons that have been no stranger to taking a bit of a slower approach to those later rotates. They'll want to try and take their time a little bit later on. As you mentioned as well, Rob's went on that recovery mission. Uh, this has been such a stalemate since the opening moment of the game here with no one really wanting to give up that initial chess piece give up that opening knock and allowing things to tumble out of control between titan and alpha so that will continue in the background you can see some of the rotates coming through here as well we have 77k a squad that's been good for damage and the odd elim here and there blank but don't feel like they've been able to actually contend for the overall chicken dinner it's just not quite been in their wheelhouse 
Yeah, I think that they lose players a little bit too easily here and there. Morteza really is being that carry of the team at the moment. As soon as they lose him, things start to fall apart quite quickly. So he's the one covering a lot of the bases, and I think the rest of the team needs to get up towards his level. I do feel like there is a problem for Titan as well as Alpha, though, when Slowpoke Nexus catches up to you. You know you've been there for a little bit too long when that happens. So hopefully they'll get out of there as soon as possible with Rob's picking up that vehicle. I think he takes Icy away. Maybe he got uh, Old Boy into the vehicle as well, but that remains to be seen. In the meantime, Dumwete, you were talking about those fast rotations, Jack, and I'm glad you pointed out earlier because, yeah, Dumwete instantly sent to some nice high ground over on the western side, just underneath Crater Fields, and that should set themselves up for a very, very strong holdout on that southwest edge where a lot of teams have to come oh. through, particularly Major Pride, Falcons, as well as Gladiators. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is, uh, it's rough to watch. It was quite literally car crash TV that was going on in the background there. Uh, Blackhand were going from strength to strength over the course of the day, it felt. But at this point, it is just the one big key player for them. Storm that's had a hell of a day. Unfortunately for him, though, he just doesn't have a squad left with him. That was really uncomfortable for them. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a buggy give someone the heel of the boot, <laughs> uh, but we certainly saw it there. That is something you don't see every day, folks, but it's nice to see it in the game for one time. Gladiators Matic seems to be just rolling into that position so he can get out as quickly as possible. If they blow up the vehicle, then Matic goes down. Um, it's as if I'm talking 0.1 seconds behind the future. I'm trying my best. Yeah, we're, we're rolling with the punches, much like it seems Demuerte are wanting to build back their favor with Maxman as they want to continue on attempting to impress him over the course of the day. Nice bit of damage done from Corker. We've had the odd highlight from Corker here and there. Always feels like Fury is the one you tend to focus on when the scrap really kicks off. Great right hook on him. Good understanding of adapting his play style to play with the tempo. Actually, let's have a look at this for a second. The one man that got away from Blackhand in Storm. They're trying to sniff him out, Blank. And you're all on your lonesome, about to be fed a fistful of rags, it seems. Out the back window. Now, Storm is a pretty damn good player, but at that amount of HP, can he deal with this? No, no. is the answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's, he's gone. He's been beat. That is unfortunate. So, out of the lobby he goes, and that will be the last... Match of the day there for Black Can. I think we do have to give him a round of applause. 48 points in a lobby that we thought was very, very tough considering the competition coming through from Europe. Uh, and I think they've surprised a lot of people coming into this. So, you know, if you're a fan of that region, you, you really got to tip your hat to Black Can. They've done a fantastic job this time around. So, Muerte made a real mad dash. They've been very quick on the rotate so far. This time around, though, it doesn't work in their favor. As again, it's Morteza leading the way there. 477k does find the shots over their way. And now, De Muerte have to play a little bit of a slower play style. Major Pry, on the other hand, they identified there was a mass amount of players on that west side. So, slow things down, Jackie. They have, they have indeed. And they've got a good read on the grip of the game. And that's something that I feel like towards the start of the day we were questioning a little bit. It didn't really feel like the grey matter, the grey gears, if you will, were turning correctly for Major Pride with a few of their decision making. Uh, as the day's gone on, though, it's looked an awful lot better. Obviously, fresh off yep. the back of the win on Vikendi, bit of a different flavour when we're talking maps when it comes to Miramar. But still, at least that should be a bit of a confidence booster. And you're only a few points outside of the top five at the minute. Interesting one there as well, Blank. That's the top five as it stands currently that has majority majority teams from the African region in it, which is a really cool tidbit to have. Like we've been saying the whole day, they've been delivering. Yeah, massively so. Now, for Major Pride, because I do want to touch on what you're talking mm. about, and like you said, you know, those those grey gears, as you were saying, are starting to turn a little bit faster, move everything in the machinery just a little bit quicker. And I think you're completely right, because the way I describe them right now is really definitive, because they're picking their spots in these circles really, really well, calculating how they want to rotate in. And what we saw before in PMPL, when things started to go bad, is they were playing a little bit wishy-washy. This yeah. time around, they're slow things down a lot and I really like to see it because it felt like they were just a bit out of control over in PMPL and here they look so much cleaner which is nice to see and it's a good adjustment to make on the first day of play because that could lead to something very big by the end of the tournament.
Oh, massively, especially attempting to counter that slower style of meta that we do tend to see from a lot of the teams from the African region as well. It could be the perfect storm for them, but we'll keep our eye on that. That's a slow burner that we can touch on, obviously, over the course of the next few days. We have hit, which is the great thing about this tournament spanning over that four-day period, like we've been saying, really gives us a good set of optics to look at. Again, though, engagements kicking off here. As you can see, the consistent chip of damage coming across, trying to make it very awkward for the teams that are later rotating in being effectively backhanded by some of the squads that set up slightly earlier and have better positions to play with with these compounds using that geometry for their advantage for nexus though it's all about the peaks from the top of the hill it seems you've got the backup from the bat line switching between both of the angles with another man up close and personal seems to be kapahala who's now also finding the odd knock here and there recovering from the spot that they were in obviously we've been saying the whole day nexus needs to give it a bit of give and go and we haven't really had that maybe this is the change of pace yeah they just have to unleash the beast within and i think that you know back in the day when these guys were eastern stars they were the kings of miramar they always did extremely well on this map and it was funny because a lot of their qualification periods to some of the super weekends if you guys remember that back in the day um, they came through from those miramars at the end of the day they would get a huge amount of points of those uh, and although they looked a little bit slow those miramars would bump up their points massively so for nexus perhaps this could be a game to get a lot of points on board maybe break into the top eight um, because uh, currently in 13th place, it's not where you want to be, especially after being downtrodden over in the PMRC Europe versus MEA. You want to bring things back up to speed a bit, look, get that confidence back on board. Now, Hacienda, El Patron, this is a bit of a grim place to be finishing over towards the western side of it. Um, there's this entire urban area that you're going to have to control. And a lot of these teams on the outer edges are going to be scared by it. I think SBG has particularly picked a very nice spot, um, which gives you that eventuality. If this circle heads down towards the southwest, goodness me, it's going to be a firing range for them down towards this urban finish. Oh, yeah. Clean line of sights. As long as they got the ammunition for it, you'll certainly see no punches being pulled. Nice little establishing shot here as well, giving you an overview of the battlefield we've effectively got laid out ahead of us here. Nexus just coming up towards the ridge, Mad Balls controlling the majority of the compounds, and then all the way in the back line, Robs on his lonesome, just trying to keep himself in a position to potentially pop up longer into this one. If he finds an opportunity to potentially third party, if the numbers are thinned, he finds someone walking wounded. This is where we've got clear vision as well. Relatively close to the world of battle world of battle over the day it's it's just not been there for them it's a shame to see you know the odd elimination has basically been the uh, the big boon for them at this point you've got a high ground compound with a bit of support from the offside there but you're looking at dealing with clear vision and 77k 77k have been no strangers to being able to really get stuck into these fights so if things kick off here it depends which one of these three squads will fin themselves it feels like you've got a bit of a fight between some of the lower echelons at the minute in terms of their positioning it's a bit of a crazy spot to head towards though jackie this early in the game and i think the reason behind it is there's just not much else area to play at this point in time i do think that rook has picked upon that though because look at the space that they're holding over on this north side they've even got uh default over towards the northwest like they've identified a really clean position on the map that no one's utilizing they're all hell bent on sending towards that urban area now major pride i think that they have been playing this quite calm quite slow they understand that uh, they understood at least that if this headed over towards that western side perhaps the buildings that SBG were holding would have been the play to head over towards now they're thinking more about heading towards that northern side so I love the patience right now no, it's smart to see. Ooh, here we go as well. We get a bit of an opportunity to see what the world of battle can bring to the table. Clean peeks through the window from Mohammed to lay down the law a little bit. Good tags, nice knock, and establishes the early damage, trying to make it awkward for the rotation. Clear vision, they wanted to bail out of the position they had, get themselves into a better spot. You've kind of uncovered the ant's nest, though. Now you're trapped with the high ground being controlled by SBG and knowing that you've got other teams nearby. And that's, of course, still 70 7k that have just been waiting for an opportunity to play from the distance spamming out a few bullets oh clean tag though and that will keep them stunned for now it's just the one really that's trying to take any of the fights so he can't fully commit to this has to back up and give the spacing away 
Yeah, you're just trying to get as far forward as possible. And for the world of battle being on the outside of the blue, they, these guys are the first to suffer to this shift on the circle. Hazem goes down. Now just one player left remaining to make the run. Arthur might want to try and go for it as well. But look at this. It is just horrible. Koa steps up. We'll look to try and get some of those elimination points. Gets one on board. Four limbs right now. 477k. I think he'll take that. He was practically going to go down no matter what he did. So picking up the elimination point. Smart move. That was nice. Uh, mechanically as well. Quick highlight here for Korka. The way that he's playing this. You know, he's locked on. Brainwaves engaged, thinking about a fight going on in the distance. Instantly gets contact again from the other team that's close by in clear vision. The aim was on point for the tag through the window, but not overly aggressive. He's got a good read on this and playing off the back of his teammates' comms as well. Just chip damage where available, where you've got the edge for those little peaks here and there. Never really hard committing to any fights that leave De Muerte in a rough position. Long term, major pride again. Not only constantly keeping us guessing with the rotations, but finding themselves a knock not the best position though as long as they can get the heel back in and try and find something more from this you could build off the back of it as effect he's just trying to really toy with them yeah, push it backwards and forwards here. I think the struggle right now is the fact that SPG is also taking shots down towards Major Pride. The initial knock is really big, though. Look mm. at the way it's pulled a lot of the root players over towards this high ground. Now they have to fully focus towards this position. Eugene most likely will have to move across at this point as well. And being behind that little dip on the hill means that placing nades for Major Pride, if they get close after this next circle shift when SBG has to move, that's going to be really big. This is the time to pull the trigger, though, Jackie. With this circle shift, that hillside becomes really, really strong. Yeah, you, you've got to do something off the back of this. Really, you're thinking, you know, Rook and Major Pride at this point, if they can have a squad wipe on this one and do so cleanly enough where you're not completely destroyed off the back of it, that puts you in game-winning territory, really. That's going to set you up to be thinking about the idea of the chicken dinner. It's the sort of maneuver that they want to make. Switching back over to a quick highlight here as well. You can see the oh. peek out from Frozen, and that wow. is a hell of a highlight. Great understanding of the drop there. Perfect play with the DMR. Yeah, that was... Lovely, in fact. I'd like to see that one again. Uh, really, really well done over there to Frozen. But again, at this point in time, a lot of teams have to move forward. Now, Mad Balls are currently in one of the strongest spots. They decided to sit on the outer edges of this urban environment. And that's one of the boons you get from playing this position so early on and picking it out, is if you can get to the furthest edges of this urban area, it gives you the highest chance of escaping and gives you the highest chance of winning out versus a lot of these teams that eventually will have to leave. So they'll be have to push over towards Mad Balls, but at the same time, There'll be a lot of infighting, so Mad Balls might be able to pick up a couple of eliminations here and there, find some knocks, but at the end of the day, anything they do is more of a success their way, uh, to their story. Not the dream on the peak there. Falcons White hoping that the last man left standing could potentially be a bit of a tripwire on the close quarters engagement. They peek him together, they play with the teamwork, and that will make the dream work. Removing them, the Falcons taken down for the last time here on our final matchup of the day. A sixth game. Ooh, De Muerte though, pressure being applied. Look at the peak from Malloy. He is going to get slapped straight in the face on that one. Can't commit to the fast peak that he wanted to work with. Ooh, Ooh hello. Look at the HGs on this. Frag's coming over. Nice damage back onto Nexus. Yeah, I think this is really smart from Mad Bulls because he thought Nexus try and eke their way on the side. Cheeky move, but easily countered here by the Mad Bulls who swing up the four rounds and just let the punch roll off. Really, really well done. And I think they identified that, you know what, they needed to stop taking shots over towards the teams inside the urban environment. They'll take care of themselves in the city. They need to focus on this team that's trying to get ahead of them. Oh, this is such a bad spot to be in for Furia, but we call him so consistent in these sort of situations. Very adaptive, smart player, good decision making when it comes down to it. Here he's going to be pushed, quick timing on a bandage, wide swing around the corner though. Too little, too late to be prepared to fight back on that one. Titan gaming down and out. Tried to pull out the weapon, but yeah, a little too... little. Too late for him with the first aid kit. Desha on the outside. They haven't even pushed him. I wonder if they even know where he is. He finds the first one. Will get knocked himself. But Carry Boy 
taken out by Root's position on this hillside. We talked about how strong it was. We talked about the amount of control they had from this hillside. The identification of this spot and then just complete bewilderment. The fact there was no one else here. They've done excellently to hold on to this position for so long. Crowns was talking about on the desk saying they are ultra consistent and they keep showing us it time and time again today. They really have. It, it felt like you could see, you know, the cogs really turning between both Rook and Major Pride when it came to controlling this position, just how pivotal it would be the longer the game went on. MP, they tried their best to establish a bit of a play, give them an inkling, give them an in. It didn't work. Rook, even with a knock, they were able to get their players back on their feet and consistently find the advantage in any given situation. Now you've got the dream set up in terms of the circle, a perfect position to play around. You know there's a scrap going on as well with a hard commit from SBG as they'll run on in, fight against Major Pride and stop it then and there. They're gone with just five eliminations to walk away with. SBG at least still going to have a duo to work with, but you're just getting pelted with nades. Rook's position will make this so uncomfortable. Yeah, it was really smart actually earlier on when Rook requested three of their players over towards that hillside because they understood that the major sticking point, the major pain point on that map was allowing any players up that hillside to get into that close quarters with them. So they push them back and then everything else takes care of itself because SPG have to push through major pride. They're effectively sandwiched. And both those teams just crashed against each other like waves and dissipated their forwards. So really, really well done. In the meantime, though, Mad Bulls still looking to clean up in the city. Oh, frozen. A diamond that's surrounded by gems in this roster. He's trying to set himself apart from the rest of the pack with his individual plays. SBG running in, but more so just a distraction than an actual maneuver that could have worked well for them. And you can see the Mad Bulls on parade now. Clean cleave around the corner as Toluca will get the last word in, taking down Nexus yes. and getting his teammate get back on his feet at just the last second to get him into the blue and still keep him in it. Goodness me, saving Private Rose and Frozen there. Really, really well done. And they'll get back up into a four-man squad. But Eugene's already on the case, taking shots down their way. Where will the circle go next? Will it favor them? If it pushes down towards the south, Rook really needs to take this time to get a little bit more advantage on the circle. You can see them already starting to push up because if it pushes them over the top of this lip, it's game over. But no, goodness me, Mad Balls have it out for them now. Their work is so much more difficult difficult they have to push up towards this lip side playing uphill with barely any cover in front of them is gonna be hell there's nothing good about the position maples have been left in you think about just the sheer line of sight the benefits that Rook have, a, a position that at this point must feel like their home turf. They've been able to defend this hill for such an extended period and constantly have the ball in their court how do they play this one? A lot of time to work with. You want to wait for the contact to come to you. Barrels of utility as well, Blank. Uh, just on this man alone, you can see the amount of utility he's got and a good throwing arm on him to make it uncomfortable for the Bulls. Eugene, though, from the sidelines, picks up an initial knock. Will he get picked back up again? Zerich currently just outside the circle. Realistically, he has to hit one hell of a shot with this MG3 to bring things back in their favor. And he starts it off strong, does go quite low. There is an off angle on the side. He's got a first aid kit to play around with and Pusher will have to move up that way. But with that res going on in the background, Mad Bulls can't quite take advantage of this fact just yet. Oh, it's a rough affair between both sides. The cheeky peaks coming in though to try and creep the dream alive. Oof, clean tag. Readjusting. Wow. Bullets bouting down as he still keeps establishing damage. Peak Zerich. after peak. There's the confidence on it. But look at the readjustment blank. This is a nail biter. There's two. There's two down. Mad Bull's currently 4v2 right now versus Roof. Zerich zigzagging his way up to this lip. Actually might keep this from going. Fleet K goes down, but. Oh, and they're trying to keep this one going. Look at the contact, Eugene, from the sideline. A game of push and pull that's resulting in them popping off. Frozen, he's got to be ice cold. There needs to be ice in his veins to keep himself composed in a spot like this. Nice maneuvement. He's chicaning his way back up as he gets closer in.
and Pusher might have found him, but the smoke just blooms at the wrong time, and that's all down to Zerich, all on his lonesome. He's played such a mad game so far, finds the initial, we'll look for the MG3 next. Oh, Zerich, the spray transferred clean, got utility as well that could be obscene, needs to dash this nade out and blow them away. Wide lob on that one. Same oh could be said for Pusher, but he lands it, and that's the way they finish it. Mad balls. That's an unbelievable way to close things down. We keep talking about Zerich. We keep saying, can he feed the hot hands? Well, my God, Blank, he was a raging inferno. There it is. Mad balls with a chicken dinner at the end of today's game. Finally picking that one up on the sixth outing. And that was incredible. I mean, that final circle alone, the, fight, the fights that we saw there, I can just imagine how much we're going to have an exciting time in terms of the death breaking this one down. Max and Crowns are going to have a field day with that because the micromanagement, the plays from top to bottom, through the roof, and the individuals alone, so so explosive let's get it back over one final time sam enjoy this one what a banger thank you so much we are back and i've had to tell the boys on the desk to shut up because they were just going berserk right now uh. talking away and i was like we have to get on the broadcast it is absolutely mental what happened there i honestly thought that that was done we knew what was going to happen but then mad bulls pulled something out of the hat so i think the first thing we have to do for anyone watching at home because this is what they're going to want to do i don't normally like breaking down final fights but in this case we have to maxman what was it that mad bulls was able to do to ultimately steal that chicken away they did so, so much. Not only do they, of course, steal the chicken dinner away, but initially, before even doing that, they clear most of the teams inside San Martin are able to then successful, successfully leave the city with multiple angles secured by Rocky Sport, eliminate default, and I think that we agree there, Crowns, the default had mm -hmm. the pivotal off angle to secure that game. The moment he gets knocked, it just enables such a great opportunity for Mad Bulls to initiate a push, get into the circle. A few players don't quite make it that far because as we know, it's a rough transition, but then Zerich in the 1v2 clutch scenario, best finish of not only the day, but mm -hmm. I would say this is one of the best finishes I've seen this year so far. That's how good it was. And one thing the Mad Bulls did that actually just blew my mind, the confidence coming out of that team. The instance they did not have that zone anymore, they had to push out. Everyone is out and relying strictly on gun scale and the return fire. And it was excellent coming through from them. It was such a nice play. Rookie spots were holding the off angles, but it becomes yeah. bad when you try to have two players on an off angle. It didn't work out. I Look, this game was so hype, Sam. I just want to go and pass over the highlight. Okay. <laughs> I just have an inherent need to cast over it. I mean, it's one reason why Zerich is the MVP of Europe, and it's because he can just pull off clutch moments just like this, out of bloody nowhere, it seems like it. But yeah, early game was, no, just it was an early game, not as interesting, mm -hmm. because we know that San Martin was in play a lot of teams sent it there relatively early. But once more, the fact that Mad Bulls not only are able to survive the entirety of that fight in San Martin. Not only are you able to get nine eliminations before exiting the city, so they eliminate more than two full teams, is that they did it as a four-man squad. They had every single player still alive after that huge, massive city finish, and they mm -hmm. just are able to exit, and we mentioned it, Crowns. When default falls down, then the floodgates open, and that's the full send moment that you need to see for Mad Balls. Yeah, and, and coming through from the side of Rookie Sport, this was something we pointed out from them in like game three, right? Or oh, sorry, in the third round game that they actually they have this little they have this little bit of indecisiveness that kind of affects their play, right? Because at that point, default did get knocked, but I didn't understand the need for the attempt to revive default, which made them lose the second player, leaving just Eugene and Rami just up the hill. And, and it's pretty much just that play, just that yeah. attempt to try to get that revive. And I believe it's because they did not expect, and that's that's their attempts there like they did not expect mad bulls to push out of that cover in that manner hence why they tried and like I, I said the confidence is just wonderful i don't feel rook even tried to go for the res there i think rami was just trying to secure another off angles but mm. mad bulls were so relentless on their sprays that if they gave that off angle away they knew there was no way in hell they were going to win that game so they just threw everything and a kitchen sink at mad bulls uh, sorry at that position held down by Rookie Sport, and it worked out, and it went down to two players, and then Zerich, the EU PMPL Spring 2023 MVP, comes in clutch with that nade. I'm sorry, Sam, that was an absolute TED Talk, but there's so <laughs> much to break down in that match. I loved it. 
I mean, it doesn't matter if I talk or not. It's the same day, right? So let's now take a look here. You can see the results on, on the screen. Incredible performance from the Maples. They're going to claim all of those points. But Rook's going to be happy as well. And this is the thing about them. I know that they lost it at the end there. But I, I have to say, building into their crowns, I was really impressed with like Rook's strategic play, the way they choose to rotate, where they choose to position themselves. And I don't think it's luck because we've been seeing them do it throughout the day. They are playing extremely well. Yeah, and for a game that uh, pretty much is really based off of momentum, I think rookie sports were able to ride off of the momentum. And I say this because early on in the game, they see on the elimination field, GG is out. The gladiators are out early. They Rook Esports were able to take out the side of Black Hand. And as I pointed before the, before the beginning of the game, there are two, three teams up on that north that everyone should be to be scared of. Gladiators, Black Hand, and Rook Esports. And Rook Esports, seeing that two out of those teams are gone, they're pretty much so confident in that northern hemisphere of the circle that they played so yeah. wonderfully well. Look, I'm going to give you a really good compliment to your region crowns. As much as I don't want to say it, and I hate to say it right now, <sighs> Rookie Sport are pretty damn good team. Okay, They're, they they've improved so so much from the start of the day to the end of the day. They've been popping off. They've been looking to be a lot more aggressive and controlling. Of course, it didn't work out, but. They're the most consistent team of the day, by, by far. And if they can keep that uh, momentum in the next three days of show, uh, I feel like PMRC might be looking like a potential win for the team, though, looking at the stats. Zerich is up there with six, and Snowx from SPG, mm -hmm. Lob of Life from the French team coming to fruition with five eliminations to his own. We're obviously looking at the last match damage as well now on your screen, but this is what, what, what I wanted to touch on is where you said they're consistent. Five out of six games today that they've placed in the top four, the only team to claim two chicken dinners. And of course, you can now see a host of their players on the screen as well, getting in the damage. This will be fantastic for Africa Crowns if they can keep this up. Yes, if they can actually. I like the fact that they're waving that flag for us and we're proud of them, to be honest. I'm liking the way I'm seeing them play. I know them to be a team that knows how to start off a, a tournament. We did see that type of play coming through from them in the spring split of the PNPL Africa. They played that well, started off the tournament okay. And I, I'm very confident given the fact that it's, uh, you know, four days of play. I think they will be able to keep up with this um, momentum that they have. I'm so sorry as well. I said two chicken dinners. They didn't win the last one. I told you guys I did this. I was so convinced <laughs> that they were going to win it. So that was a little split. Of course, Mabel stole it from them right at the end. I, I'm still struggling to believe that because I just don't, I don't know how that happened. But we'll, we'll forgive me because it's only day one. Um, but good results all around for all of our teams that, that you're seeing on your screen right now. Of course, they're all taking home those chicken dinners. Maxman, overall though, impressed with what we've seen so far? Yeah, I, really the European teams, a lot of them played to the level I was initially expecting. Uh, Major Pride were a little bit slow to kick mm -hmm. off their scent towards the top, but they did get there towards the end, especially on that one Vikendi map. Uh, but really, Africa, I was scared entering this tournament crowns. I was like, are they going to be able to bring in that aggressiveness that we expect from a team from Africa if they want to be able to compete versus Europe? And that was a scaring for me, uh, scary a little bit for me at the start of this event. But what we saw from G4K, Blackhand, and now Rook bringing 35 mm -hmm. eliminations on the day, Crowns, on the day. I'm telling you that these teams have made the right changes at the right time. And we're just on day one. So now if they can just, like, ride that wave in the next three days, Africa could win the whole thing. Yeah, and I and I think it just boils down to the mentality you bring into a game or into the tournament, right? So given that the fact that they're coming into the tournament with that mentality of, okay, I'm going to be flexible with this tournament and I'm going to ride with the flow. I'm not going to sit back and be scared of these bigger names that we're having in the lobby. That is something that I feel like is really helping these teams that are up because as we're seeing it, I'm, I'm seeing greedy for kills. I'm still pointing them out. This is not what we saw from them coming through in the PMPL Africa and seeing them put up such good performance right now it's very very impressive yeah. coming through from that team you're going to be expecting some pretty massive changes from spring to fall of course because there's been such a mm -hmm. massive gap of time between spring and fall and you had events like pmwi that maybe some of these players some of these teams have been looking from the sidelines and are like okay this is working really good vampire esport are a pretty gifted team how about we do what vampire esports done which is go for <laughs> central positions and be giga aggressive and teams have started to do that bring it to their home region and it's been relatively successful for a few of them but right now while well, we're looking at the point rankings of europe versus africa europe are in the lead by a significant amount so sure rookie sport black hand greedy for kill are looking really strong 
but we need to mm -hmm. see the other African teams do well if they want to, at the end, allow Africa to win as a region. Yeah, and I'm going to point that out given the fact that I'm expecting the teams that we were expecting, and especially from Africa, to assist us in putting points up on the board are currently not even in the top 10. And I'm talking about Xenon, Falcons, right? Even the side of 77k. These are teams that we expected them to actually be putting up the points up for, yeah. uh, for Africa. But they're not oh. really doing that right now, and it's kind of surprising me. One thing that's really weird right now, I'm looking at Xenon and Falcons, great in terms of elimination you know these are these are actually decent elimination points four mm -hmm. placement points for xenon falcon zero placement points we need to get into that late game mm -hmm. we need to extend that survival time this is not going to cut it if you want to go further in pmrc Max, would you argue though, because I mean, when you start looking at the numbers like that, the argument would be, we, we said that a lot of the, the African teams are a bit passive in their play, but when you're putting in elimination numbers like that, maybe a little bit of aggression from them, maybe they're trying to be more aggressive, but ultimately that's costing them the placement points because when you are aggressive, you risk getting taken out early. That's definitely possible. I, I feel like some teams are have been renowned back in their home region of Africa as teams that are good when it comes to macro. and. Starting to be more aggressive is not a fitting playstyle, so that transition is really rough. It's just day one, they can make some extra adaptations, mm -hmm. but it's been a little bit of a tough time. Though, not a tough yeah. time for Tixie or Havlik, because those two guys have been shredding it on this first day, topping the tables in terms of a limbs. Yeah, and I tell you, Havlik and Tixie have just had a field day here on this uh, on this PRMRC. And I've, I've been enjoying the way I saw them play. We did see a little bit of a decline coming through from the side of Gladiators in that final game. And this was something I was trying to point out at the beginning of the show that, you know, it starts to boil down to how much you're able to hold on. That fatigue does come through in terms of like yeah. mental fatigue when these players are playing so i would say they tried holding it up for five games out of six but tomorrow and for the rest of the days they're going to be on top of they need to be on their a game Crowns. to maintain that top one position oh wow rami's there you called him he's the mvp mm -hmm. of the day like he just has to be rami? like he just had to be like he put up so much number i was gonna say like how is he not up there on the top um elimination board but it looks like he missed it by just Alien, but still, these are actually pretty sick numbers coming through from Rami. 2,233 uh, damage coming through for that player. I'm very impressed at the way Rookie Sport has played today. Rookie Sports played really well. Rami is our MVP of the day. And you know what the best part about this is? It is only day one, gents. We have three more days, six games a day. I'm not going to try to do the maths because it's late and I'll probably get it wrong. There we go. Max is the, the genius. So many games. To so many games for us to see and so many games for you to watch and enjoy as well. So Max man, Crowns, thank you so much for sharing all your big brain analysis with us. Of course, Blank and Jackie as well on the mics, keeping us company in game and everyone behind the scenes. To all of you watching, make sure you're back tomorrow, same time, same place, because we're entering day number two. Good night.